Hungry for SVRA action? Well, the best way to enjoy classic auto racing is with a delicious classic from Mission Foods. Green flag your race-watching snacks with Mission's mouth-watering race day recipes. Try some of our tasty tacos, piled high nachos, fresh chips with guac, and more. So gear up your ride and fuel up those stomachs with delicious Mission Foods. Now that's too fast, too tasty. Hawk Performance packs 100 years of friction dynamics into every product. Backed by Carlisle Brick and Friction, the world's premier innovator of industrial brake and friction components, Hawk leverages R&D tools and motorsports experience to deliver uncompromising performance on the street. There's no reason to settle for less. Choose pads that are race proven and street legal. Find the Hawk Performance Brake Dealer near you at hawkperformance.com. Hello and welcome to NOLA Motorsports Park right in the heart of New Orleans itself. For the 2024 NOLA Speed Tour, my name is DJ Clark. Delighted to be joined up in the commentary booth alongside Ben Sissel. And Ben, we're here in the Big Easy for some big old racing action. Yeah, I love coming to the NOLA Speed Tour. Such a cool facility. Lots of fun. It was crazy. We got here Wednesday and um, a lot of our staff couldn't leave the hotel because of flooding. But uh, now it's just cleared up, and if we could order this type of weather at every event, I would love it. But one thing to watch out for in these live streams this weekend as we welcome our viewers, there are lakes surrounding this track. And I, I don't mean like, you know, it, uh, through the tree lines. Like if you go off too far in some of these places, you're going to be stuck in a foot or two of water, and then uh, there might be snapping turtles or alligators being, you know, that were in a swamp. <laughs> yeah, we haven't heard of any gator sightings quite yet this weekend, but we'll let you know if we see any. It's not unheard of for them to kind of make their way out onto the track, as this is definitely down in the bayou, as they say. But we're ready here for a little SVRA action for groups 5, 7, 9, 11, and F4 for feature race number one. Open wheelers, DPIs, classic prototypes. This is exactly the kind of thing that you love to see here on an SVRIA weekend. It's absolutely cool, and it's a lot of downforce around a very technical track. Yeah, and uh, we're testing out some new F4 cars with Liget. So you're going to see some Liget cars out there in their carbon fiber uh, without much of a, what we'd call a livery as we're seeing them split but the, you're seeing high above here on the drones, a full paddock there for the NOLA Speed Tour. If you're anywhere in the area, go to speedtour.net to buy some tickets. This is a really fun, family-friendly outing. We've got Trans Am coming up next. We've got full fields of SVRA. We've got uh, J Liget JSF4, and we've got Formula Regional Americas. So let me go through the grid here real quick. And in uh, number two, starting first, is Steven Lamana in a 2004 Mazda Pro Mazda. Then we've got Barrett Wolf in the number 55 in an F4 US car. That's who is on screen right now. The brand new delivered Liget F4. What's different about this is a little bit different arrow, a little bit different what I call side intake, and then the halo. We're seeing that halo that we have seen. You know, I know that a little. Motorsports fans were skeptical the last decade about the halo, and then you see what happened with Romain Grosjean, and he's still walking. I think the halo is probably the best thing to happen to motorsports in the last 50 years. So the uh, new F4 cars have that halo, which we love. Right behind them, that car right there is Yasik Muka, one of my favorite drivers. Group 11 GTP2 and a Cadillac DPI Delara. Then Lincoln Day is in another F4 US car and a Liget F422. Rafael Wallos, we're going to say, is in a 2016 Liget JSF4. Paul, that's the old F4. Paul Reed is in a Revolution 500 SC. And then John Roger Smith, one of my favorite cars in this group, in a Group 5 car, definitely outlegged in a 1700 Kent Bobsy. That's the 1967 Bobsy SR4 that our camera crew have really zoned in on. So quite an eclectic group of cars that Bobsy's a 67 and then we have a 2024 out there yeah I mean it's pretty great and, and only in SBRA are you going to be able to see that kind of action I gotta say though I love that livery on that 334 Bobsy it's very much got the the sort of hallmarks of an original Lotus when the the sponsorship liveries first came on board that sort of two-tone with the red and the white always easy to pick out in yeah. the paddock 
Yeah, and, and uh, he was telling me, I spoke to him just a couple of minutes ago, that if you Google the Bob CSR4, that's the car that's going to show up in that livery. It was raced in SCCA. It actually, it's a 67, but wasn't put on the track until 1972. So there's some cool history we're going to get to, but they're coming down here. I'm hearing that lights are out, that uh, Pro Formula Mazda uh, out front, but then you've got these two brand new F4 cars. Yasek Muka seems to kind of have to start a little bit slow in that Cadillac DPI to let the tires come to him. And then we've got that revolution from our PSSA series out there. So we've got an eclectic mix. Leave a comment here before we go green. Who are you cheering for? If we get something wrong in the booth, let us know. This is your chance, but uh, I'm going to give it over to you, DJ, as they go to green. Yeah, they're coming out at turn 16 right now. Mission Foods turn 16 as all eyes turn towards the beautiful flag stand here at this point. Getting ready to go as the green flag flies, and we are underway for the NOLA Speed Tour. It's a good getaway there for Lamana. Looks like he's going to be able to hold on to everything in that pro Mazda. Pushing his way ahead, as you said there, Yasek Muka maybe being a little tight early on, very early on to the braking zone, and that's going to allow Barrett Wolf to be able to sweep around the outside of Cube 3, Turn 1. And Yasek Muka in that uh, DPI car there that's on screen, he races these cars. He races Formula Atlantics, Indy Lights, Pro Mazdas, so he knows what his competitors can and can't do early on. You can see there he goes a little bit deep into the uh, brake zone, but also those cars don't rotate like these open-wheel cars ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, they're, it's just a matter of them being heavier. There's more of that car, so they're not going to be nearly as nimble through the corners, and he's going to have to use a little bit more force, I think, to get it to go, particularly through that very, very technical Sector 1 with Cube 3 Turn 1 and through that. But now as they come through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's, this is going to be an area where I think that DPI may start to stretch its legs. Nice little battle going on here behind. That's that revolution, and uh, I believe... That's uh, uh, Rafael Walls there trying to be able to close in on him. So a little bit closer, but that Revolution getting some good speed as they enter into turn eight. Yeah, the Revolution, that's kind of a new car. The uh, guy that designed Radical and that whole Radical series then left Radical, started Revolution, and that's basically the basis of our PSSA, Prototype Sprint Series Association. This is Paul Reed here in this number 5-4. And to me, this car looks like 20 years in the future. Yeah, it really does. It's got that sort of angular look to it and the, the livery that Reed has on it there with that kind of teal and, and uh, silver. Very, very good. But this doesn't have a livery on that 07 there by Yasek Muka, but it doesn't need one. That is one of the most distinctive looking cars. You can very, very much tell that it is of that era of DPI. We take a look at the number two, Stephen Lamana, able to set the fastest time on the first lap in that pro Mazda really looks like he's wringing the neck of it there through sector one yeah you'll see nola you know was just i would consider to be kind of a newly built racetrack just in the last uh, few years and you know like we said we're in new orleans and it's built on a swamp and so at sebring we have to respect the bumps this track is just as kind of bumpy but i would say it's wavy not bumpy like the bumps at sebring is from different pieces of uh of the tarmac, you know, and different, the big concrete blocks. Here, the, the land has settled in different ways, so you see them coming into one, it gets really wavy, and now he's about to hit a bump here right in the apex between uh, eight and nine that can really throw the cars, but it looks like he's got He's got the car under really good control. Yeah, he really does. And there you can see it flowing through that Bennett Bridge Hall S is a very tricky section. A lot of commitment that you have to take through there, especially in these high downforce cars. There's going to be no lifting through that section. And there, as you see him coming through about turn 10, another one of those wavy bumps that you talked about. You can see the rear end kind of stepping away. Again, there into the braking zone for turn 13. Just Having to be very, very, I think, adaptive with the brake pedal is probably the best way to be able to handle this track. And it's unbelievable to see what the track has done here at NOLA Motorsports Park. David Pace and his team, uh, they've been working overtime. Like I said, Wednesday, a monsoon basically came in here, and there was standing water of about four inches basically everywhere we're seeing right now. And uh, it's all now drained into the canals. It's beautiful weather. And I got to give it up for his team and all the hard work they've really put into this as we see Yasek Muka now coming up behind the number 55 of Barrett Wolf. Yeah, the straight line speed there of that Cadillac DPI really starting to show out there is Wolf 
Taking a little bit of a surreptitious glance in his rearview mirror, I think he knows the attack's coming from behind from Muka, but it's going to be, I think, a little bit of, well, let's use the term that's used in, in DPI racing quite often, balancer performance. That DPI looks like it's faster on the straightaways, but that new Ligier looks like it's able to stretch its legs through the twisty bits. Yeah. Yeah, and these new Ligiers, i got to give it up, and, and Scott Goodyear, I'm looking at him right now, he's in race control with us. And, yeah, it is the Scott Goodyear that you're thinking is the race director of our FRF4 and Liget JSF4. Well, these uh, Ligiers are just now coming out, and these are some of the early chassis. So he's given these drivers and teams chances to test them out here with us in SVRA. And then they hope to have a full field of these new cars with us in their next round, I believe, at Road America. And then Yasek Muka in this car that's about a 600 horsepower, uh, I think it's a 5.5 liter you know, versus this uh, new V4 in these Ligiers. So the Ligiers are a lot more nimble and uh, a lot lighter through these areas. But now after he comes through the Mission Foods carousel turn, he's going to really be able to turn on the power. But that's Lincoln Day right behind him in the first liveried new F4 car that we have. Yeah, and if you're wondering what the difference is between those old F4 cars and the new one, well, as you said earlier, Ben, it's easy to spot the halo right there, and, and I have to fully agree with you. His day's starting to take some looks here on the back of Muka, but that is one of the greatest inventions that we have seen, not just in uh, uh, worldwide open-wheel racing. You mentioned Ramon Grosjean. There have been a couple of incidents, I think, of Joe Guanju last yeah. year, as well as uh, a couple of scary incidents over stateside. I think of Iowa two, three years ago, and cars coming up and over. That halo, the aero screen, it saves lives. There's a big move going on behind. That's Paul Reed able to get by Lincoln Day in that revolution. What a cool display, though, of horsepower versus handling, because now watch Lincoln Day is going to suck up right behind this revolution, because now the track comes to them. Like, this is their section. This is a really technical section of a left to right to left to right and that you don't really get to use your horsepower or your speed. It's who gets on the brakes later and who gets on the power sooner. So we're going to see Lincoln get right behind him, especially coming through the rhythm section, that Bennett bridge hole section of the S's. But now he's got a little bit of time here to power through. And, uh, you know, Lincoln still trying to get used to these cars, the downforce that they have, the difference between the F4 and the FR. The FR has a little bit more downforce, uh, a little bit more wings involved. But, uh, you know, one thing that Lincoln and, and a lot of these F4 drivers don't have experience is getting up in the wash of these different cars. Usually they're only racing against F4 cars that put up the same kind of aero wash, but that DPI car is going to do something totally different than that Revolution. Well, yeah, I mean, just look at them on track. The Revolution, the DPI, it's a larger displacement of that air. And, and when we talk about that dirty air, the best way to kind of think about it is, is literally traveling in a boat wake. Uh, air is a liquid, uh, and so it gets pushed out of the way. And when you're traveling in behind, if you get out of that wake a little bit you really start to feel the turbulence and then if you're directly behind you get that sucking in effect that draft effect that we talk about and that's what uh, he's going to get a little bit of here down the straightaway but i've got to agree with you that i think that uh, that revolution is going to be able to hold it out just by sheer horsepower alone yeah yeah, it's got some power. But you can see Yasek Muka is not giving up there on Barrett Wolf in that uh, F4 US, the 2024 Liget F422. And I really like the nose of this car. It just looks like a modern formula car. This is the latter series into F1, so it is reminiscent of an F1 silhouette there as you see it come across. And getting a little bit rough there on the tires going a little bit late but you know they're they're really testing this out all the teams are here to just see what these cars can do i've heard rumors of certain tracks that some of the teams are getting about four seconds a lap faster and that uh, you know as, as a fan of the series to be honest that kind of scares me yeah, I mean, that is a little bit scary. But the, the other thing is, is in addition to the, the new aerodynamic profile, as you mentioned, the sort of modern formula look with the, the letterbox uh, side pods there and all of that, the other thing that has increased is safety. In addition to that halo, you have better crumple structures. You have a better uh, a carbon tub. To that was the first the priority. Drivers. Talking to the designers, their first priority was the safety. And then it just so happened they designed such a cool-looking aerodynamic car that it's it was faster, but that wasn't their goal, really, initially. It was the safety and to try to make a more modern version. But, yeah, you're right. It's the safety and the pods, everything. It's it's a such a well-engineered car, and uh, it's got that, you know, all the crumple zones and then the, the drivers in their own little cocoon there. Yeah, 
And, and so all of that together, yeah, that four seconds is pretty scary, but at the same time, with that added safety, it's going to certainly help them out. As we take a look here, then continuing to go along, Lincoln Day going to get tucked right up behind as we've got our first little bit of lap traffic coming in. That's that bow speed that they're having to deal with there, uh, John Roger Smith. Just getting his way around and doing the right thing here at this point. When we talk about those blue flags, we talk about that uh, 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 getting lapped by a faster car, it's be predictable. That's exactly what Roger Smith is doing. He's sticking to the racing line. And hold your own line. It is up in vintage racing, and I hope Lincoln Day is aware of that because he did a great job of letting him have that corner. So I appreciate that, Lincoln. But um, it is your job as the faster car to make the safe pass. It's the driver's job that's being overtaken to hold his line and, like you said, be predictable. And so Lincoln doing a great job there. Lincoln actually is from Jackson, Wyoming, which is unbelievable. A name like Lincoln Day from Jackson, Wyoming, he should be in, like, some Western movies. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll take him out to L.A. We'll see if we can get yeah. him uh, hooked up in a, in a Coen Brothers movie or two. Maybe that's the, the spot for him. That's just got uh, classic Americana written all over it. it. Looks like he's getting really fast. Some great images here we're getting from Greenlight as they come through that Bennett Bridge Hall section. And the cars, they do look really good, look really planted. The thing I'm worried about, I'll just kind of put this out there, and I haven't, I have no evidence to say either way, but I love the F4 series because it is such good wheel-to-wheel -wheel close racing. And because they've changed the body design, it is a little bit longer and a little bit wider, and they, it's a totally different arrow wash now. I'm hoping that they can still race as close, that there isn't like that zone of it's once you get behind somebody, you lose all downforce. As we look now, this is an old F4 car, and it's so weird to say an old F4 car because these cars just came about being. Yeah, I mean, they certainly did, but that is the speed and the, the tenacity of motorsport. You've got to keep evolving. And as we look at that, you can just kind of tell those differences. You see the side pods a little bit lower on that car, taking the full air into the radiators. But the new approach to it is, is raising those side pods up a little bit more. Obviously, the biggest example, no halo on that number 27. And then you look at the nose, it's a little bit more sculpted than the new uh, uh, chassis is. It, it comes to a little little bit more of a point yeah. and that's helped a little bit by the livery on there with the red kind of tapering off but those little changes and that's just all of those things that go through and once again wider nose a little bit more crumple room on the front of the car so safety another thing to be able to heavily influence yeah yeah and this is such the f4 series that now is these cars are now in the jsf4 that uh, we want people right out of go-karts uh, boys and girls right out of go-karts to come into this at 14 years old and race in the JSF4 series. From a driver development standpoint, I've sat in a lot of Scott Goodyear's driver's meetings, and it's unbelievable the driver development that he puts in. So if you're looking at this, and you're looking for your son and daughter to go take that next step out of karting and be in a first fully suspended actual car, this is the place to go, and I stand by everything I've said about Scott Goodyear. You know, if my son or daughter were interested in racing, it'd be the first place I look. Yeah, I have to fully agree with you there about that. I actually had a conversation with my uh, my to be fiance about nice. that the other day about saying, "Are you going to be okay if our kid wants to go in the zoom zooms?" <laughs> so I may have you having a, Scott, uh, a conversation with Scott a little bit down the line. There we take a look at John Rogers Smith, though. Doctor John Doctor Rogers Smith. Doctor John Rogers yeah. Smith. Excuse me. He is a, um, a professor at LSU and also um, a petroleum scientist, a chemical engineer, I believe. You know, and he's from Lafayette, Louisiana, in that Bobsy. But the coolest thing about the Bobsy is it's funny. He was telling me that, that I think it was this car. There were two cars just like this, and they would come to all the SCCA runoffs. And so everybody started calling them the Bobsy twins. And, th and so then when he started making more cars, that's um, Jerry Mong was the person that designed these cars he they started just calling them bobsies because he made vanguards he worked for vanguard machine shop that was the formula v version for jerry mong but uh, yeah a 67 for some reason first on track in 72 but these two cars toured all over the scca east coast and that's how they got the bobsy twins well, and then he go. named the car company that <laughs> I kind of love that. It's a little bit of kismet there for him at that point. He brings that car onto the main straightaway right now, out of the Mission Foods, turn 16, bringing everything But I got to say, like, I got to give Jerry or some, some credit there, John Roger Smith. He brought a plastic spork to a gunfight. That's a Kent 1700 <laughs> CC engine, you know, so he's out there just having a blast, and, uh, you know, he's pushing that car to its limit, but here we are to the leader. 
Stephen Lamana coming to take the checkered flag. Yep, coming around right now as the checkered flag is in the air. He comes out of Mission Foods, turns 16, eyes towards the flag stand, and crosses over. Stephen Lamana will take victory here in the first race of the weekend for the NOLA Speed Tour. Looks like coming around behind him, we've got to wait a minute here for Barrett Wolf to bring his way on through in that uh, next Ligier. As there we see him come out of the final corner right now. Wolf doing a great job. And a look at this, a little bit of a battle between Muka, Reed, and Day. They're going to come to the line 3 4 5 just as quick as you please. But Yasek Muka going to be able to hold on in that Cadillac DPI, but Reed and Day gave him a run for his money. Yeah, yeah, so cool to see those cars. I hope that. Um I know that we're opening up and looking at this PSSA, but I hope that we add cars like Yasek Mukas into our PSSA because obviously here at least they're pretty equally yoked. Yeah, I mean, there. that is a testament to, to what you can see here in SVRA is those three cars running that closely together. And talk about three wildly different design philosophies, wildly different approaches to race car design. I mean, you have a, a traditional uh, prototype there, a, a kind of a, a road or a, a, a track day prototype in the Revolution, and then obviously a formula car in that one as well uh, in that uh, third uh, Ligier in line. So really great to see all of them them being able to finish right together and once again a testament to what we see here yeah and we were talking about the jsf4 series and that is coming up next uh i believe you're in here with john fippen for jsf4 john fippen will be in here for jsf4 so make sure you watch that and see because uh, this will be our first lige jsf4 race as we look there at steven lamana as they come around to the uh, mission foods complex I got to brag on NOLA Motorsports Park. You can see right there in the top left the uh, skyline. That's how close we are to New Orleans or the Big Easy or the Crescent City or it's, I think it's the most nicknamed city <laughs> in America. It's that or Nashville. I can yeah. tell you that. It's so one of the two. It's, it's pretty funny, uh, but it, great, unbelievable facility, great go-kart track over there that I've run many, many times. And uh, so here's our results. Go through our results, DJ. Yeah, Stephen Lamana able to take victory there in that Pro's Mazda, followed by Barrett Wolf in that uh, Ligier F422. Yasek Mukja, Yasek Muka holding on to P3 in that Cadillac DPI with Paul Reed and Lincoln Day behind them, a very, very close running. Rafael Wolves there in P6, and then Dr. John Roger Smith bringing up the best, the rest of the field in that Bobsy. A great run through all of the SVRA action, and again, we will be with you all day long stick around with us though because we do have that uh, uh, fantastic JSF4 action getting ready to take to the track here in just a few moments an important decision is afoot this man is about to buy tires on TireRack.com TireRack is the leading online retailer of tires in North America and a repository of advice and expert reviews and it's done. All that's left is to arrange for safe, easy installation at one of our independent recommended installers. Well, I guess he did that too. TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. Hungry for SVRA action? Well, the best way to enjoy classic auto racing is with a delicious classic from Mission Foods. Green flag your race-watching snacks with Mission's mouth-watering race day recipes. Try some of our tasty tacos, piled high nachos, fresh chips with guac, and more. So gear up your ride and fuel up those stomachs with delicious Mission Foods. Now that's too fast, too tasty.
Welcome to the inaugural running of the Liget JSF4 Series. My name's John Fippen. Ben Sissel seated alongside of me. We've got a guest announcer coming and uh, running just a little bit late is Hayden Bowlesby, but we hope to have him in the booth with us. Uh, but this will be the first race of ever. <laughs> history. <laughs> yeah, history is made. Absolutely. Now, of course, it's the first race with this series, but these cars are not new. Uh, this is the the same Ligier JS F416 that we've been racing for the past eight years. This is the ninth season of competition for this car. But uh, with the debut at our next race meeting at Road America of the brand new uh, Ligier JS F422, which will take over the F4 US Championship, uh, our major domo here at PMH uh, 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 Motorsports Holdings was uh, Tony Perella and came up with the idea, well, let's find a use for these cars that have uh, that have sort of aged out of the uh, of the prime class. So this is an opportunity for drivers even younger than those who, who meet the minimum age of 15 years of age to race in the F4 championship, to race in this uh, Ligier JSF4 series using the original chassis. You're getting a good view of some of the drivers as uh, our grid walk going on. There's the 24 car of Daniel Quimby all the way from Australia for the Atlantic Racing Team here this weekend. But we've got a, a big field of 14 of these cars getting ready to head out for their 30 minute or 35 minute race, actually. Uh, we, we understand uh, we're going to try to do 30 minutes of racing, and we've got a 40-minute window to get that in. So there's a possibility that we could go a little long if we have any off-course excursions, but we're going to keep our fingers and toes crossed just to make sure that doesn't happen. The new Janetta Pace car heads out, and there goes the field behind it. Let me introduce these 14 starters to you. I'll start from the back, and we'll work up toward the pole center. Because he had a spin in, uh, in the uh, qualifying session and brought out a red flag, he'll have to start at the back on the outside of row seven. That's the number 72 of Jacob Lauder, a 20-year-old from Edmond, Oklahoma. He drives for the local team, the IGY6 Motorsports team. Next to him will be another debutante, the number one of Jake Pollock. Uh, Jake out of San Antonio, Texas, a 17-year-old driving for the Jensen team. Moving up into row number six on the outside, one of the recipients of the PMH Powering Diversity Scholarship, the number 49 of Harbor Doss out of Solon, Ohio, up near Cleveland. He's for the new Berg DMG racing team. Uh, Alan Berg and uh, Francois Doran, Doran sort of combined forces, and this is a new team, and we're glad to have him here. Now, that's Alan Berg, Formula F1 starter, right? Precisely, and his son Alex, of course, who raced with us a year ago uh, and uh, was a, a Team USA scholarship winner, raced over in the uh, Formula Ford Festival in Great Britain. Wow. Moving forward is another single car team, the 28 of Drew Such. The Drew in the Such racing entry. He's out of St. Charles, Illinois. He's a student at Purdue University, Indianapolis. Moving forward now, inner row number five on the outside, the 83 of Christopher Parrish. He's another PMH Powering Diversity Scholarship. He also drives for the local IGY 16 from just down the road in Folsom, Louisiana. Next to him on that fifth row is car number five, Dimitri Nolan, making his debut with the series. Dimitri's out of Fairview, Texas, and he drives for the powerhouse Crosslink Kiwi Motorsports team. In row number four on the outside, another debutante. Car number uh, two is Parker Wallen. Parker out of Medina, Minnesota, driving for Jensen. He uh, comes to us directly from go-karting. He raced in his native Minnesota, but also in Texas and California. Hayden Bowlesby has joined me in the right seat here. Hayden, welcome. Welcome. Great, to, great to have you with us. Let's run the rest of the grid, then you and I can talk just a little bit more. Inside of row four is car number 95, the Australian Brad Boschman. Again, a karting phenom in his home uh, country of Australia, and looking forward to great things for him. The gal who uh, uh, led both of the practice sessions uh, earlier this weekend and thought it might be a... Uh, qualifying just outside of row three. That's the Uruguayan Maite Caceres. She's also a uh, recipient of the PMH Powering Diversity Scholarship. And uh, Maite drives for the International Motorsports team. Moving forward into row number three on the inside is another Australian, the number 24 of Daniel Quimby from Sydney, Australia, for the Atlantic Racing Squad. In row two on the outside, car number 44, Pablo Benitez Jr. from Port Orange, Florida for Scuderia Buell. 
Pablo Jr. Uh, makes his home, actually, in Rosario, Argentina, but lives in Port Orange and when he's here in this country. He's the son of the team principal for Scuderia Buell, Pablo Benitez Sr. Starting alongside him, the number 45 of Bacon Zelenka. Bacon, a returning driver. He raced in the F4 championship with us a year ago, and he's uh, stepped up into the Ligier JSF4 series for his second season. He's with Crosslink Kiwi Motorsports. Bacon makes his home in Lyons, Illinois. Inside of row two, car number, uh, excuse me, outside of row one, car number 29, Keikai Hawaneo, uh, half Hawaiian. Keikai races for Crosslink Kiwi as well, but uh, Keikai currently living just outside of uh, 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 Tampa, uh, up in Plant City, Florida, and your pole sitter making his first start with us and he's the youngest driver in the field the number 25 of teddy musella 14 years of age from orlando florida for scuderia buell it looks like the field is full the lights are out and we are away and a good jump for our pole sitter teddy musella in that red number 25 with the 29 of keikai hawaneo Right behind him in that green car, you can see to the inside, just behind the pole sitter, is Bacon Zelenka as they make their way down into turn number one, the Cube 3 architecture turn one. And we keep our fingers crossed for these youngsters that everybody makes it through that first turn okay. And that's exactly what has happened. So our pole sitter getting it done with Teddy Musella at the front, right behind in his wheel tracks is Keikai Hawaneo. As Hawaneo trying to make a move, Bacon Zelenka going side by side with another car. I think that was Daniel Quimby at the 24 that Zelenka was battling with her. You get a good shot of Quimby's machine. And then one of the Jensen machines, that's the number one, or the two, excuse me, of Parker Wallen, as they work their way up toward turn number four now, as this 30-minute race well and truly underway. Now they're into the backside of the racetrack, the sweeping five, six, which has caught a couple drivers out here, and then turn seven. As we've got nose to tail racing, just what we like to see in these Ligier JSF4 chassis. They don't generate quite the downforce of the Formula Regional Americas cars, so these guys are able to run a lot closer together and stay right under one another. Hayden, you and your team have got two drivers in the field with Jacob Lauder and uh, Christopher Parrish. Yeah, uh, Chris seems to be doing pretty good. He uh, took advantage of that mess up by uh, Bacon battling in uh, turn three, it seems, so he's doing pretty well. And uh, Jacob had some struggles in qualifying and seems like he's doing well as well so that's good yeah yeah we'll keep our fingers crossed that all that works out uh christopher finished 26th in the championship a year ago he had a best finish of eighth uh, at vir as the first lap is coming to a conclusion as you can see from the great uh, drone shots these long long front straightaway where these cars can really get up to terminal velocity before they head into turn number one but right now, the pole sitter, uh, Teddy Musella, leading the way. Oh, we got a little bit of a, sh a struggle there from Daniel Quimby as he gets a little sideways. Excuse me, that was the 83 of Christopher Parrish. Sorry, I misidentified him. Christopher got just a little sideways, and that's going to cost him a position as it looks like Maite Casaras is challenging. That's uh, the 44 car just behind them of Pablo Benitez, who's making a run up in the Scuderia Buell number 44. Maite has a red car as well, and I misidentified her machine, but you can see the leaders spinning stretch out, but the good battle is the one for fourth and fifth right now, and that is Parker Wallen. There you can see the number two car of Wallen, and then right behind is the number 49 of Harbor Doss. Harbor Doss back into 13th position. He qualified a little better than that uh, up in 12th, so he's dropped back one spot as we've got good battles all up and down the racetrack here. There's the six of Maite Casaras right behind her, Parker Wallen. Wallen has the fastest lap of the race so far. We've only completed two, but Wallen showing some good pace. Moving up, he qualified back in eighth position. And there's Maite Casaras, the only female in the field. Maite uh, raced last season with the Formula One Academy, which races a uh, F4 style car. So the learnings for that have certainly, uh, she's been able to put to good use as the field now begins to spread out. Teddy Busella, your leader. Keikai Hawaneo in second. Daniel Quimby third. Maite Casaras up to fourth. 
And then a little deeper in the pack, you can see the 83 of Christopher Parrish going side by side with the five of Dimitri Nolan. But Christopher holds him off. And then here comes the 44 of Pablo Benitez Jr. And he's going to take advantage of Nolan as well. So Pablo Jr. moving up a spot. That'll put him up into ninth position. Right behind him is the number five of Dimitri Nolan on debut here this weekend for Crosslink Kiwi Motorsports. The 28 car of Drew Such right at the tail end of this gaggle of cars. Drew running in 13th position last time across the stripe. And then you get a good shot of the 44 of Pablo Benitez Jr. with Dimitri Nolan just behind him. It's pressure now coming from the 95 of Brad Majman, the other Australian in the field. Majman, a, a legendary carter in his home of Australia, we understand. And uh, making the run over here into the Ligier JS F4 Championship. Good battle there between the 95 of Brad Majman and just behind him, the 49 of Harbor Doss. Doss, another of the PMH scholarship winners. He's a student at uh, Georgia Tech and likes to work on his cars as well as race them. He built his first go-kart uh, from scratch when he was in uh, eighth grade. So he's obviously mechanically inclined and he's pretty good, pretty good behind the wheel as well. Bacon Zelenka having a good battle with Parker Wallen. Bacon able to hold him off right at the moment as the rest of the field streaming through that first turn. Hayden, you've had a chance to drive this track both in the F4 car and, of course, in the Formula Regional car, which we'll see a little later on. I know this is your home track since you're from just up the road in Folsom. It's not been good to you in the past, however. You haven't had great luck here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been all right. Last year I got off on the wrong foot. We were really, really quick in practice, uh, but unfortunately I had a little bit of a wreck in the last one. Uh, it sort of set the, the weekend out of control. But, uh -huh. uh, we're not too far off pace for this race weekend, and we'll see what happens with the race. Uh, we have a different different kind of tire this this year, so we'll see how that works out for all the other drivers as well. You know, strategy is going to be completely different as far as you know tire wear. So, you know, you may start to see some cars start to fall off a lot in time. So, we we don't know yet. Sure. Well, that's uh, that's one of the reasons we run the races. We'll see with Hankook making that new uh, compound available for both of these classes this year. Good shot of the number six of Maite Casaras as she is pulled away just a bit from the battle behind her. And we've got a safety car coming up as the Janetta Pace car picking up our leader. As we've got the spinner here, we'll see if we can get the identity of that car. I believe it's the number five of Dimitri Nolan who has looped it. That's right at turn number 10, but he's able to get it turned around and he's going to head back. He collected a couple cones and dragged them off into the racetrack. So uh, we don't know if James in the in the safety car is going to stop and pick up those two cones. But uh, yeah, here it's got a course vehicle on the way to the scene of that incident. So that's good to good to see. Let's catch our breath and we'll do. Let's do a, let's take a take a break to uh, thank one of our sponsors and then we'll come back and do a quick rundown before we get the green flag. You're here at NOLA Motorsports Park on the inaugural running of the Ligier JSF4 series race number 1 on the weekend. Okay, so pretend this is your race car. It's on the trailer and you have an accident. Ouch. At least your truck's insurance will pay for another one. Yeah, not so fast. Standard insurance won't replace your race car, whether it's in the trailer, in the paddock, in the garage, or the repair shop. But at Haggerty, we can protect it for what it's really worth any time it's off the track. No matter what or where you race, offer less than a set of race tires. Haggerty, let's drive together. Listen. 
Sonoma Speed Tour returns to Sonoma Raceway April 19th through the 21st. Featuring the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli Western Championship. The Sports Car Vintage Racing Association. Historic Trans Am. The Toyo Tire 2.5 Challenge. PSSA. International GT. And Saturday, you can take part in the Haggerty Cars and Caffeine Car Show. You do not want to miss the Sonoma Speed Tour April 19th through the 21st. For tickets, simply go to speedtour.net. Welcome back to New Orleans, Louisiana Motorsports Park as we have our first full course yellow of this race as we had a spin from the number five of Dimitri Nolan, but he's been able to continue. So the field stacked up behind the new pace car. The lights are out on the pace car. That Janetta made available to us from the folks at Janetta. We thank them for providing the pace car for all of our racing series here at Speed Tour. James Rogerson is our pace car driver, has been for many years. As you can see the field now, heading into turn 14, the safety car will peel off into the pit entrance. You can see that just there off to driver's left. And now the field enters the Mission Foods turn 16, the final turn on the racetrack. This will be a single file restart. And the green flag is in the hand of the starter. And we are green as the field accelerates away. Teddy Busella from the pole taking the lead. And he's got a challenge as KK Hawaneo is right beside him as they make the run down toward turn number one. Right there behind to pick up the pieces is Daniel Quimby. He jukes to the inside. There's Maite Casaras in the six. The 44 going side by side. Pablo Benitez going side by side with Bacon Zelenka. But your leader, still the pole sitter, Teddy Busella, the 14-year-old in his first race with us, has got the job done out in front on the restart. Still plenty of time left. Oh, problems again for the five. As Dimitri Nolan, once again, he has made contact with the barrier and has uh, deranged the rear end of that car. We can see that was right at the exit of turn one. We've got a replay coming up, and we'll get a chance to see what happened. But a couple cars came together. We'll get this. We can see that that'll be a little deeper in the pack. And here they come into turn number one. Everybody gets through safely at the leading part. And there's the spin right there. As that was the two of Parker Wallen who went around and then other drivers had to take evasive action, and unfortunately, getting caught out in that was the number five of Dimitri Nolan. So Nolan bringing out the uh, the first red, uh, safety car period. The double yellow flags came out because of that, and then uh, got caught up in someone else's incident, obviously, as after that spin by the number two of Parker Wallen, Dimitri taking evasive action, got together with another car, and we're going to have the safety car come into action one more time. There are a couple other cars involved, but uh, safety crews are on the scene, and we'll sort out everybody who's uh, involved as they come by the start-finish line. Hayden, I was watching uh, qualifying for the Formula Regional Americas Championship, which you'll be racing in uh, a little later this afternoon. And uh, uh, you obviously had some issues at the first part of the qualifying. Then after the red flag, you came out and, bam, went right up to uh, sixth place, I believe. Oh, it was completely intentional. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. Saving tires? Yep, okay. exactly. Good we, move. Uh, wanted to come in. I figured I only need about five laps to you know, get some pace. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to qualify up in one two or three sure. so i just wanted to make sure that i would get in a spot where i could be good for the race uh so i didn't want to go out there and burn my tires so i came in scrubbed my tires for a little bit came sat and then went out and of course right when i went out there was a red <laughs> figures but um that got cleared up pretty quick and i went out there and got i think like four laps or so awesome so all right great job my tires pretty fresh and Good deal. Starting in a decent spot. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. That uh, should bode well for you as the uh, the afternoon wears on. We were talking about doing a rundown. Now that we've got uh, everybody past the start finish, you can see the recovery work going on there at turn one. In fact, uh, the safety car took the uh, the shortcut between turns one and four uh, to uh, 
allow the safety crews to do their job. The pole sitter, Teddy Musella, the 14-year-old, has uh, led from the drop of the green flag, but he was coming under some serious pressure on the restart. Keikai Hawaneo, the returning driver in the number 29, raced with us in the F4 series a year ago, is running second. Daniel Quimby, the Australian, also uh, a graduate, not a graduate, but he raced with the F4 series a year ago. In, in the 24 car, Maite Casaras, she raced with us back in 2022, but then, as we mentioned, has been racing with the Formula One Academy uh, this past season. So she's back with us and in the JSF 4 car, currently running fourth. Bacon Zelenka, another returning driver in the 45 car. Then Christopher Parrish, uh, Hayden's teammate on the IGY6 team. Brad Majman, the other Australian in the 95, currently running seventh. Jake Pollock in the number one. For our Jensen in the eighth spot, ninth is the 28 of Drew Such. Pablo Benitez in the number 44 for Scuderia Buell. Jacob Lauter in the 72 who brought out the first uh, yellow flag during the qualifying session. D Jacob uh, got off into the gravel trap, but uh, he's worked his way up from starting at the back of the pack. Parker Wallen in the two, and then the two cars involved in the incident our Harbor Doss, unfortunately, in the 49, and the five of Dimitri Nolan. So those two got together uh, after the spin by the two of Parker Wallen. But Parker was able to recover and stay on the lead lap. Uh, Doss and Nolan both apparently have damage to the cars, so they will not continue in this race. They'll finish 13th and 14th. This Ligier JSF4 championship, again, uh, giving some new life to these uh, original F4 chassis that have been uh, ours to to work with for the past several years. And it looks like our race director is going to bring the cars into the pit lane under these red flag conditions. The clock will stop, which is the reason that we're going to do that. So we're going to allow these uh, safety workers to finish their work because it'll take just a little bit longer to get the, those two damaged cars out of harm's way. So our pace car driver bringing the Janetta pace car down into the pit lane where the, the uh, field will stop. These cars are under Park for May conditions uh, after qualifying, so they're not permitted to do any work on the car during these red flag conditions. They can do what's called driver comfort, so they can uh, provide water for the driver, uh, an umbrella to shade him from the, uh, the New Orleans sun, but uh, no uh, work could be done. They can't even take tire pressures on these cars uh, during these red flag stoppages on the pit lane. So once again, the clock has stopped uh, with about 15 minutes remaining, so we're just about at half distance. Ben Sissel, who uh, is, is our co-announcer on some of these races, uh, uh, asked a question. He's a, he's a northerner like I am. Uh, I'm from Ohio, of course, and I, uh, Ben and, you know, is, uh, travels all over uh, around the country. But we were, we were talking about all of the, the nicknames that New Orleans has, you know, the Big Easy and uh, 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 that. And I wondered, you being a native to the area, are there any uh, pet names for uh, the New Orleans area that you guys have? Not that I can think of. <laughs> I know a nickname for New Orleans. They call it sometimes a fishbowl because it's like a bowl. Right, exactly. That's why you have the levees because anytime you get like a massive storm, it's just going to flood. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what I've heard it called sometimes, fishbowl. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. Let's talk a little bit about your charity, Safe 22. Uh, I know it's near and dear to your heart. Your dad is a veteran, of course. And uh, uh, Safe 22 is named for the fact that we lose 22 veterans to suicide. A day, yeah. Uh, a day, and that's just hard to believe you yeah. know i'm a veteran myself and i certainly appreciate uh, the work that you do but tell us a little bit about save 22 uh yeah they're a nonprofit. uh they're based out of Carrollton, ohio and um, they basically just aside uh give assistance to some veterans that are in need um like our program will bring some veterans out to the track try and get them away from home away from their stress and anxiety maybe trying to ease some of the ptsd um and it's shown to work a couple times, um, a lot of the times, actually. Uh, my lead mechanic on my FR car, he was part of that program, and he's been with us for three years now, I think. Awesome. So, um, and he's doing great, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah. We saw your paddock set up down there uh, uh, right near the uh, the tech shed. Uh, beautiful, big tent. You guys are really uh, really showing your stuff here. That's great, so great to see. Yeah, we... Um, we have these tents rented out, and we just show up with all our cars. It's really easy. So it doesn't doesn't break the bank to get them set up, so it's great for the team. You know, 
you're our most experienced driver in both championships, competing three years in uh, in, in F4, of course, and uh, this your third season in the FR championship. Uh, what have you learned? What what, what is what is uh, different about Hayden Bowlesby now than he was six years ago? That's a hard one. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to go over on that one. Um, I mean, I'd say in F4, uh, you know, maybe like the first two years of driving, I, I didn't really understand – uh, the dynamics of the car and how it needs to, you know, you got to pitch the car around the corner. I didn't quite understand that yet. Uh, it eventually dawned upon me, and then I got a hang of it. And uh, going in FR, it's a completely different sort of vehicle, you know. Um, it's much faster. Uh, I like to say that going from an F4 car to an FR car is like turning on the warp drive on yeah. a spaceship. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine. First time you get in an FR car from an F4, it's like you hit the gas, you get slammed in the back of your seat, and it's just stars going past you. <laughs> um, not that way anymore. I'm desensitized to it now. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. Everything slows down when yeah. you get more experience. So, you know, um, that car, it's sort of similar driving style. I mean, you have to deal with the turbo now sure. a little bit, so you just got to make sure you get some a little bit of throttle application in, you know, like pre-apex to get it spooled up so yep. you have power out. Exactly right. And in the uh, late stages of last season, you had a pretty nasty crash at uh, at uh, New Jersey Motorsports Park. Uh, hopefully no lasting effects from that, but you, you got upside down on the tire barrier there. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was an unfortunate uh, crash because we were doing really, really well. Uh, in fact, I had the fastest time on track. So, uh, you know, we were set to be able to go up to P1, you know, if everything had worked out uh, correctly, but it didn't. So. Yeah. But uh, I think I had, like, a little minor concussion after it, but it didn't last too long. And it was – it's in the past now, but, you know, it's good. You wear a lot of hats at these race meetings. Not only are you the driver, obviously, of the number 22 car in the form of the Regional Americas Championship, but you're a mechanic as well. So, I mean, when you're not driving, you're uh, you're wrenching on these cars. Uh, I like to not do it at the race weekends. Um, so I have a mechanics work on the car, obviously. But uh, back at the shop, yeah, I'm, I'm the one servicing these cars. I did all the uh, preseason uh, prep on these cars, so... In fact, uh, Jacob's Lauder car was just built from the ground up right before this race, maybe about a month ago. Wow, so, great. Um, and we'll have another FR car probably at Road America that's also going to be freshly rebuilt. A four-car team. That's great. You guys are uh, chasing after Crosslink Kiwi, man. I think they've got 13 here. <laughs> it's a lofty goal. Yeah, exactly right. How's your dad? Everything doing good? Yeah, we're all doing good. Um, you know... There's a little bit of stress from starting up a, a, a new team. You know, the first couple of years are always going to be really, really hard. So, But it's going to start to smooth out, I think, you know, once we have all our cars going and we get some results and drivers are wanting to drive, you know. It'll it'll come eventually. I think so. All right. Well, I can remember when you first started out, it was just uh, – you uh, you and your dad, you know, uh, in a single-car trailer coming to the racetrack, and now you've grown to a, a four-car team. That's great to see, my friend, as we're going to get another chance to uh, to have a look at the incident now that all the cars have recovered here. The last of the safety vehicles making their way toward the paddock with the damaged cars, but here we can see what happens. This will be great from the drone shot as we'll see the cars come down into turn number one. You can see the side-by-side -side battling between Kekai and Teddy for the lead. And then watch just behind that threesome. You can see Bacon go just a little bit wide and then there's two cars spinning and then coming up unsighted unfortunately was Harbor Doss and Dimitri Nolan as they got together coming through the turn. Here comes the uh, the 49 car of Doss uh, into the paddock. We'll get another view of it from a track angle, a lower angle from the track. But those two cars just back. In fact, you can see the 49 of Doss as he bends it in just behind the 95 of Brad Modgeman. And then there's the spin. Those two cars, I think, just touched as the 44 Pablo Benitez and the two of Parker Wallen got together. And unfortunately, uh, Dimitri Nolan, who was recovering from the from the back, just had nowhere to go, and uh, he got collected as well. But it looks like the cleanup has just about concluded. The last of the safety vehicles getting restaged here into the pit lane, and so we should be able to get back to racing momentarily. Again, the clock stopped with 15 and a half minutes remaining. 
Scott Goodyear, our race director, keeping uh, tabs on all the action. There's a good shot of Bacon Zelenka in that green number 45. Bacon, uh, you know, talked a little bit about the fact that he's really gone all in on this uh, on this racing thing. I mean, they've been a self-financed uh, team. He was a single-car team, uh, Bacon Racing, a year ago. But uh, he's been able to hook up now with the, the, big, uh, the big dogs, uh, Crosslink Kiwi Motorsports. And uh, Bacon is... Uh, you know, obviously looking for funding, as any driver does, but uh, he's mentioned uh, that, you know, he's pretty much all in and looking to uh, keep his career going just as long as he can and uh, looking for some good results here. And he's uh, getting the weekend off to a pretty good start, uh, currently lying fifth right now. As you can hear, the engine's coming to life down on the pit straightaway. Our new uh, engine partner, Mount Tune, doing the tuning on these uh, now MK20s uh, is... James Rogerson takes the Janetta safety car out of the pit lane, and the field will be following. As we'll take him around behind the safety car. The countdown clock has resumed, and it'll be another single file restart here as we get ready for the second restart of this race. You can see the drivers weaving back and forth, getting uh, the debris off the tires, getting the temperature off of the tires. Hayden, you've been in this situation before where you have a stoppage and you spend some time on the pit lane and then you have to, you know, crank yourself up and get it, get it done all over again. Is Psychologically, is it tough to get back into race mode? Uh, it just depends on where you're at uh, as far as your mental state uh, or before, per se, a red flag. You know, if you're in flow state, right before the red, you know, and you break that. It, for me, sometimes it's sort of difficult to get back in. It's sort of like you're, yeah, I don't know, cloudy. But, uh, yeah. you know, maybe take a lap and a half, adrenaline kick in, and you're, you're sort of back in. Um, but, I mean, if you're waiting, when you're waiting on the pit lane for a long time, you, be, you can be sitting there and it's boring and hot and start wanting to fall start wanting to fall asleep <laughs> take a little nap while the red flag goes on well that's good that means you're relaxed and you're not all uh, all uh, amped up so that's a that's a good thing a relaxed uh, uh, car driver a race car driver is a fast race car driver for sure as you can see the field this beautiful facility here in that uh, section right at the top end of the racetrack five six and seven those are those are are they flat for you in the FR car? No, you really got a lift? At five, it's like a little brush to the brake. Six, it's like a little, just a little small brush to kind of get it to set. And uh, six, um, yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that's really flat uh, here is that little bend on the back stretch and uh, the last two parts of the S's. Yeah. But you're flying, you're going like 150 through the S's. Yeah, exactly. Cause, you know, the first part of the S's are much, much sharper, basically. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, you got, got to, uh, you know, feather the throttle through those areas, obviously. But when you get into the, the tail end of it here, leading right up to turn 13, which is a great passing opportunity, uh, the safety car lights are out. So we're going to try to get this done again. The countdown clock goes to about 13 minutes here. So we'll have a little less than that when the green flag flies. This is a learning experience for a lot of these drivers as again, uh, nine of the 14 are making their first start with us. And so that makes a, a big difference in the experience and the racecraft. But Teddy Musella, one of those uh, who's making his first start with us and 14 years old, I can't remember being 14 years old, much <laughs> much less imagining what it's like to uh, drive a potent race car like this Ligier JSF4. You can see the green flag already waving. Oh, and wow. Somebody's got a broken rear wing. That's the 29 of Keikai Hawaneo, I believe. That uh, rear wing. That's an air brake. Yeah, no kidding. It's an air brake. So problems for Keikai's car. I hope I hope he's aware of it. Certainly, if he looks in his mirror, he'll see it. Oh, that's someone's front wing lodged up in it. You're right. That's the wing of uh, of another car that he's picked up. In fact, yeah, that's the car right in front of him that has lost a front wing. Of course, obviously, he's losing time because of that big air brake. There's Maite Casaras going around him. 
I'd be concerned about that coming on Lodge and yeah. smashing someone in the head. Yeah, no kidding. So that's uh, definitely he's. We're going to see a replay of uh, when that uh, when that car hoovered up that wing, and you can see them coming around, and it looks like. Here's the 28 of Drew Such. So far, haven't seen the contact that must have caused that. Here, there it oh, is. Oh, wow. As the 24 climbed right up on the back of the car in front, Daniel Quimby, and that's what happened. Quimby, yep, great job on uh, the Greenlight TV crew giving us that replay. But uh, Daniel Quimby, who started right behind Kai. Misjudged his uh, timing and got right up on the back of it. Cake is going to try to stay out there, but uh, again, I'm sure that they're going to ask him uh, to bring that car in because that could be a, a safety issue as the field continues. But look at Quimby in the 24 doing his best to run without a front wing. Have you ever been in that situation, Hayden, where you've got a broken front wing? It's bound to change the handling of the car pretty substantially. Uh, believe it or not, the, the wings don't do a whole lot in this car. Uh, I was testing at Thunder Hill Raceway uh, a while back, back when I was with Jay Howard, and uh, we didn't have a replacement wing there. If you go off track, you kind of knock the wing off because uh, it's so elevation, so much elevation. Uh, so we ended up just taking all the wings off to balance out the car and go test. And uh, believe it or not, it really doesn't drive that much different. I'm, I'm sure that it would be a different story in the FR car because the wings oh, yeah. are definitely bigger uh, on that. But, yeah, look at this. Quimby is going side-by-side side with Megan Zelenka, and he's got no front wing on that car. That is a great job for Daniel Quimby from the Atlantic Racing Team out of Sydney, Australia. A little side-by-side -side action just behind them. as Christopher Parrish putting his nose in there. Looks like Christopher's been able to move up to get right behind Bacon now. So I have to give Daniel Quimby credit. He's doing a nice job in that uh, damaged race car, doing just what he needs to do. There's the 44 just behind him of Pablo Benitez Jr. Pablo went a little bit wide. You can see had kind of a rough ride, and that's going to open the door for Jake Pollock to try to challenge him. Drivers working their way through the S's. There's the 95 of Brad Majman as the two Australians now running nose to tail. Bacon Zelenka up into third spot now as Quimby, despite his best efforts, dropping back just a bit. He'll be able to salvage his best possible finish, but he and Majman with the 44 Benitez right behind him as they make their way through Mission Foods turn 16 and on to the front straightaway. Bacon Zelenka off to the inside, trying to break the draft. That's Christopher Parrish. Chris doing a great job, Hayden. Yeah, he's doing great. I'm happy to see it. Yeah, no kidding. He's Zelenka, or Zelenka's in third, and it seems to me that he's starting to catch up to him. So, you know, if we get a podium this race if everything goes correctly. Yeah, yeah. On the last lap, uh, uh, Zelenka was at a... At a a 45.9 and Christopher Parrish at a 46.1. We understand the side pod on Christopher's car might have a little uh, damage to it, and that could be slowing him down just a bit. And here comes Pablo Benitez Jr. taking advantage once again of the problems for Daniel Quimby. The two Jensen drivers running nose to tail, Jake Pollock. That's a great recovery for uh, the number two of Parker Wallen. After that spin early on, Parker's uh, moving his way back forward. He has some sci-fi damage right there. Yeah, you could see that on the camera shot. So Teddy Musella still leading. Maite Kosseros up to second now. Only a second and a half back. There's a shot of the 44, Pablo Benitez from Scuderia Buell. You can see that side pod definitely acting as a bit of an air break for him. Brad Majman just in front of him as we're getting down to about seven minutes remaining in this one. Leaders across the line. Teddy Musella pretty comfortable out in front. Maite Casaras giving chase. She has come to race here as her last lap was a 44 flat. Teddy Musella a 43-7. 
So she's about uh, 1.3 seconds behind our leader. But Daniel Quimby continues to soldier on with that missing front wing. Currently lying in the seventh spot. There's a good shot of the number two of Parker Wallen. Parker making his first start with us, the Minnesota native. And then there's Quimby with that damaged nose of the car. You can see the, the uh, some of the, the wiring of that front wing dragging on the ground. But again, a great job for Daniel Quimby to continue to uh, do his good day. He was, you know, running as high as third prior to that damage on the second restart. And it was self-inflicted. I mean, he's uh, he, he, he climbed up the back of the car in front of him, and that's what created the problem. Keikai Hawaneo uh, has not been able to rejoin as he is now two laps down to the lead of the race. So we've got 11 cars still running. Jacob Lauder, the last car on the lead lap. There's Christopher Parrish being chased by Brad Modgeman, the Australian. And right behind Brad, Pablo Benitez in the Scuderia Buell, number 44, with that characteristic red livery. Pablo, just like yourself, races for his dad's team. So, side oh, and they, yeah, that side pod finally blew off. His radiator's loose as well. Yeah, so he's got enough damage that the radiator, uh, you can, uh, you, Eagle I hate in Bowlesby here as the mechanic on his car as well as the driver knows the inside of these cars just as well as any of the other uh, mechanics but boy that's a great battle look at christopher parish coming under pressure now as brad modgeman tries to go to the outside christopher doing a good job of staying right in the middle of the racetrack he didn't block him but he you know made it possible for brad to have to make a choice to go around the outside as opposed to diving down to the inside we'll see how that shakes out here in the final four and a half minutes but this may be the best uh, battle on the racetrack. That's for fourth, fifth, and sixth. Took a wide turn. He's got the inside on this one now. Yep. Christopher's holding off the challenge. The problem for Brad Moshman, he went a little bit wide there at turn three, and that's opened the door for Pablo Benitez to get in front of him. So a change for fifth and sixth. Benitez now up into the fifth spot. And again, a loose radiator. Again, he's going to have to watch for overheating in that situation because with that side pod missing, the cooling efficiency of that radiator is not going to be nearly as good as it is with the side pod there. Oh, for sure. The, the duct is not aligned with the radiator anymore. So, you know, air is going to take the leaf past the resistance. It's going to flow right, right, by, right by it. So he'll keep an eye on the temperature gauge. There's no telemetry on these cars. I mean, the, the folks in the pits can't monitor the engine. So it's up to the driver to keep an eye on it. And if it gets into that danger zone, he'll have to retire the car. As it's uh, a warmish day, it's not really baking hot quite yet, but it is April after all. If this were if we're racing in August, it would be a different story. Yeah, it only gets hotter here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Someone off in the gravel. There's a lot of smoke back there. Yeah, it looks still, it looks like somebody dropped a wheel off that at the exit of turn six. We'll see if we can sort that out. Daniel Quimby now battling with the two of Parker Wallen. That's for seventh position. Quimby minus the front wing. Parker Wallen in a position to pick up yet another spot. Parker started in eighth position, and he's currently running in eighth right where he started, but that's about to be seventh, I think, as he's going to find a way around Daniel Quimby. I'm guessing the, the lack of the downforce on the on the front of the car is probably hurting the front tires on Quimby's car. It doesn't make that much difference, but uh, he's probably scrubbing scrubbing those tires a little more than he would if the wing was on it. Yeah, uh, I mean, in this car, the low speed and mid speed is unchanged. The only really spot that that wing makes a difference here is in the S's because it's you're going at peak speed of this car through there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas in the FR, you know, you, a winglet falls off. Uh, you know. Low speed's not terrible, but your min and up just are not sufficient enough to turn the car. We'll stay right with this battle between Quim Quimby and Wallen. Wallen looking for any advantage he can find as he takes a little wider entry there into turn 13. Quickly back to 14 and then into the sweeping 15-16 complex, the Mission Foods 
final turn on the racetrack. We will see the white flag next time by, I'm guessing, as we've got about a minute and 42 seconds remaining as the leaders are already by. But Christopher Parrish just one step away from the podium here, although he's uh, dropped back about uh, four seconds behind Bacon. But so we'll keep an eye on this battle between Majman and Quimby, or excuse me, the uh, Quimby and Wallen. Majman's uh, disappeared in the distance up in front. Quimby doing his best to salvage that seventh place spot. Parker Wallen would like nothing more than to take it away from him if he can. As we're on the penultimate lap, we should see the white flag next time by, by my reckoning. Parker's going every which way he can, can find to see if he can find the advantage around the outside. As they head down toward turn number five. Quimby doing a good job of driving defensively to, to keep that car behind him. He's not doing anything untoward. I mean, it's not uh, he's not blocking per se, but he's making the car as wide as he can to try to keep Parker Wallen behind him. As they're entering the S's. White flag is in the starter's hand and being shown to the leaders as they're approaching the finish line here. And there goes Teddy Musella, well out in front now. Maite Casaras in second, three seconds behind, then another two seconds back to Bacon Zelenka. And then here comes the battle between Christopher Parrish and Pablo Benitez. Christopher holding him off at the time for the time being, but we'll follow the leader here, Teddy Musella from the pole has never been headed in this race. Keep an eye on this battle between Daniel Quimby and Parker Wallen as they continue to duke it out. Parker's teammate, Jake Pollock, right behind him. Heading down toward turn number three is this battle. Parker's oh, has to lock it up as they go into turn four. Heading the other direction, or out of turn three, she was a heading for turn four. Now Parker's got the inside line. I think he's going to close the deal here. Yeah, he played that very well. That combination of three and four, you can be on the outside of one, and then you'll be on the inside on the next one. But here comes Quimby repaying the favor. Great racing here between these two. They're giving each other racing room. Quimby back ahead. As they exit turn seven, a little cloud of dust being kicked up as another car dropped a wheel off. But meanwhile, at the front of the field, Teddy Musella in the final sequence of turns here as he makes it into the Mission Foods turn 16 and makes the sprint toward the checkered flag. The first win of the season for the youngest driver in the field, Teddy Musella from the pole, imperious in this one. And he's gonna win this one going away. You can see him pumping his fist taking that win and Maite Casaras the Uruguayan is going to take second place honors her first podium finish and the same for Bacon Zelenka his best finish in an F4 car Christopher Parrish finishes fourth that will be his best finish ever and right behind them the 44 Pablo Benitez Jr. and now here comes the Quimby battle with Parker Wallen and Daniel Quimby holds him off Parker Wallen comes home in eighth Jake Pollock Caught up with the two of them, but couldn't get by on the final lap. He'll take ninth at the last points paying position. Will grow to Drew Such in the number 28. Jacob Lauter, the last car on the lead lap, comes to the line. He'll finish in 11th position. Hayden, man, fantastic race so far. A couple red flags, which we never like to see, but uh, great racing. And uh, Christopher did a good job. Give him my congratulations if I don't see him before you do. I'm sure you'll see him before I do. I sure will. <laughs> He did a good job, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. He got some solid points for the team and for himself. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, uh, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed that uh, Jacob can have a little better run on uh, uh, the other uh, two races here this weekend. But uh, tip of the hat to uh, Teddy Musella, who showed he's going to be a factor to be reckoned with, and uh, Maite Casaras, who led both the practice sessions, uh, didn't have the qualifying performance that she had hoped for. But uh, she came up from a sixth place start to finish in second within, within touch of the leader. 
Hayden, I'm going to have to uh, to head down to the podium to interview the top three run, uh, runners. Uh, ben Sissel is going to join us. He's going to take your seat and join us here in the booth to uh, carry the uh, the post race. So thank you so much for being with us, Hayden. Great job. Thanks for Good having me. Good luck this afternoon. Thank you. All right, we'll talk to you later. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, to my friend Ben. He'll do the rundown for you. There's Teddy Musella, Maite Casaras, Bacon Zelenka, your top three, as I make my way to the podium. Thanks a lot, John. We just witnessed history, ladies and gentlemen. The Lige JSF4 Series started this year just to keep those F4 cars running, and uh, what a great race that was. Thank you so much, John Fippen. We will see him go down to the podium and uh, give a great podium celebration. So uh, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break here at the NOLA Speed Tour, but come back for the winner's circle. Hungry for SVRA action? Well, the best way to enjoy classic auto racing is with a delicious classic from Mission Foods. Green flag your race-watching snacks with Mission's mouth-watering race day recipes. Try some of our tasty tacos, piled high nachos, fresh chips with guac, and more. So gear up your ride and fuel up those stomachs with delicious Mission Foods. Now that's too fast, too tasty.
you've got a business to run, big and heavy products to ship, and customers who need them now. When you've got the right driver and the right equipment, you can bet on a spectacular result. Bennett understands complex logistics and puts the best team, the most time, and the latest technology into every customer relationship so you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the race. Let us handle the rest. We can move anything. New Orleans, the capital of jazz, Crescent City. This is a place that has many nicknames, but what it most certainly has is a fantastic racetrack. And that's where we are today at NOLA Motorsport Park. DJ Clark alongside Josh Hurley for the call here for Trans Am presented by Pirelli. And Josh, this is a deceptively tricky track. A lot of bumps, a lot of technicality, and a lot of difficulty. It really is. It's actually become one of my favorite tracks because it's very bumpy, very tricky, and it has a little bit of everything. You have low speed corners that really work the tires. Tire wear is going to be a big story for those low speeds. You have high speed corners with big commitments. And then in all of those corners, throw a couple of big bumps that upset the car and really make shocks part of the story. So you're going to have to see a little bit of everything today, which should produce some great racing. It's going to be great racing, and another thing to keep an eye on, tire wear is going to play a pretty big part. Yeah, especially these low-speed corners with the bumps, because the bumps even wear the tires out more. You get wheel spin on top of the bumps, and it just rips the rubber right off the tread, and that makes the tire degrade more and more, and it's especially big in those TA cars with all that horsepower. All of that horsepower, they're going to have to deal with it here at this point. It's not going to be easy, but we'll be ready to come back and come back to racing action with Ben Sissel's Gridwalk, which will be coming up here in just a few minutes. How good is this? Look at this view from Lostowski. It brings all my fans. It brings the audience into the car with me. Speed turn, 140 mile an hour entry speeds. The quickest and most efficient way for me to get information to my drivers is from using the VBOX HT2 system. Well, welcome to the NOLA Speed Tour Fan Walk. I am here with Richard Forsyth from Texas, not too far away. And you've had great races at Sebring and Road Atlanta. But then you come here and your crew is working hard to change the engine. You go out and you found some glitter in your oil, huh? Yeah, I'm afraid so. It, it keyed us in when the crank uh, sensor went out and the motor died. And it was getting uh, trashed by the glitter oil. And that's what woke us up that we had a problem. So, uh, yeah, and so we're going to have some uh, issues doing any kind of a real race today. So we're going to go out and get some points, you know, which is what you got to do sometimes. Yeah, and a lot of people that are running for points, and I know that you are in the SGT class, some people would go home at that point. But you got to take that green flag to get the Trans Am points. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. The uh, points are very important to us because we've got uh, the points lead right now, and we're doing consistently quite well, and we're going to keep going uh, with strong, we hope, in the future coming up all season long. And, you know, that's the plan, but we want to get the points necessary. The engine's safe enough to go around, which it did. We did several practice laps. As long as the crank sensor doesn't turn us off, we'll be fine. And well, Richard Forsyth, but uh, I'd like to thank the uh, G-Speed built Corvette, and uh, these guys are amazing normally and, and everything, so I want to give a big shout-out to them. Nice. I love it. I love it. Well, then we've got the classic battle coming over here to Milton Grant, who was with us um, 
on the podium at Road Atlanta just a couple weeks ago, another SGT driver. And these Porsches, you know, you can't do too much on this drag race down to one, but then basically from one to the rest of the race, it goes to you. Yeah, I got to go back to it, don't I? So, yeah, and Richard uh, was first at Atlanta, and I was second. Look where we are. So it shows you the twists and turns of this series. So it's, uh, it's exciting to be here and have a lot of people in the field. So. Yeah, beautiful weather. Nice. I love it. Well, good luck out there. And we're going to talk to a lot of these GT drivers. Don McMillan, you know, you've been in the series for so long, but it seems like lately you kind of pick one or two to come to. But I'm so glad you're here in this beautiful Corvette. Yeah, I got my priorities back in the line and made it to another one. So, nice. now NOLA, the big drag race, and then into the twisty bits with the Corvette. You're kind of equally yoked for both. What's your strategy? I just try to stay on top of it. I'm. Uh, I didn't get a lot of practice, so I'm. I've been. I've been here about six years ago, so I'm. I'm about a little behind. I got to get caught up. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us here. Then we've got the two Maseratis here of Chris Coffee, Colin Cohen for Norwood Auto Italia out of Dallas. Josh Carlson, Josh, you got to explain to everybody what this is. You're running an SGT. You've been with us this whole season, but everybody's asking me what kind of car is this? Yeah, so this is a uh, 2012 uh, Trans Am TA2 car. Uh, it's too old to compete in a TA2, but uh, it's still competitive enough to compete in SGT. I love it. Well, good luck out there in SGT, Josh Carlson. Now, I want to talk about this. We've got Kaylee Bryson over here. The third row, you got to check this out. It's an all Corvette, all female third row. So, Kaylee, you've been doing really well. I've been watching you out there, and it just seems like you're you're really fast. And then just something happens. But this is the race. This is the race you're going to be on podium, isn't it? I'm going to try my best. But yeah, this is our first time qualifying first, and we're having a lot of fun. We have a really fast car underneath us, and you know we're going to do our best to go out here and try and get a win. I love it. And then we go to Amy Ruman, who won here. I know we just talked about it. Was it 16 or 17? But she got second place and then first place the two years that she was a champion. So Nola's got to feel pretty good for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we qualified, got cut a little short yesterday, so we didn't really get a good lap together. But um, I think the race is going to come to us today. It's hot, and I think the tires are going to be definitely an issue. Um, I think um, – I think we'll be conservative, but stay in front, hopefully. Amy Ruman doing really well in the points. She knows how to win a championship, ladies and gentlemen. She's done it twice. Then we come through here. We're going to try to move up to the front here. Tommy Dreesy, Adam Andretti, and the beautiful Camaro. And then up front, we've got Paul Menard with Master Force Tools. And then Chris Dyson up here. But this is a special race, and I'm going to interrupt him because – Basically, my mentor in Trans Am, the whole time I was in Trans Am, somebody that's helped me out so much, John Claggett, this is the second to last race he's going to be at with us, the president of the Trans Am series. I get a little bit sad, John, because you've mentored me through this and you've put up with all of my craziness all these years. It's going to be so sad to see you go. Can't wait for Coda to see you again. But this has got to feel kind of bittersweet. Uh, you know what? It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's good to see great race car drivers on the on the grid and a beautiful day. I can't think of New Orleans with better weather than this. So it's all good. Nice. I love it. Well, thank you so much for all your service and really building Trans Am to what it is today. Absolutely unbelievable. So we've got Paul Menard was just around here somewhere. Oh, he's talking to Dyson. So we've got Paul Menard over here talking to Dyson. It's always funny because Dyson will come up and try to talk to Paul of what he's got. Paul Menard doesn't really offer too much, but, man, nice job with uh, Nola. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, this is this fun track, man. It's uh, very technical, um, really slow up front, really fast in the middle, and slow again at the back. So it's got a little bit of everything. Um, guys did a hell of a job. GT3 guys did a, a great job all weekend. Uh, just want to get through turn one clean and uh, just go set a good pace and see what happens. Level Paul Menard, Master Force Tools, and then we're going to give it over to Bill Knox here. Bill Knox is going to uh, please take off your hats and lead us in an invocation. So, Bill, take it away. Thank you. If you'll join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise for this gorgeous day that you provided for us. Father, we ask that you wrap your almighty hands around the drivers, the officials, the crews, the spectators. Father, that you keep them all safe. 
Father, we ask that you also hold our first responders and our military in those same hands. Bring them home to their families. In your son's most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a special treat. 11-year-old Ava Johnson, fresh off of her tour on Broadway. Ava, what were you doing on tour? Um, I played young Anna Mae on the um, Tina Turner National Broadway tour. Oh, my gosh. And Tina Turner, one of the best ever. Well, you are here to sing the national anthem. I have heard so much great things about your voice, so let's hear you sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled bear yeah, wave or the Ava Johnson, fantastic. Thank you so much. DJ, I'm going to throw it back up to you in the booth. Thank you so much, Ben Sissel. Absolutely incredible down on the grid there at that point. And uh, we are very, very excited to get going here at this point. Welcome, everyone, to NOLA Motorsports Park. DJ Clark up here in the booth alongside Josh Hurley. And it is good to be ready and good to be racing as we take a live look on board Tommy Dreese's machine starting out in third place. And, of course, the big story here, the fight for pole position between Paul Menard and Chris Dyson. We'll talk a little bit more about what that could be here at this point, but it is going to be a fast and frenetic race here at this point. We're going to have to watch out for it as they go. And welcome to everyone joining us here on MAV TV. DJ Clark alongside Josh Hurley from NOLA Motorsports Park. We have got an absolutely spectacular 37 laps of racing action in store, Josh, around one of the most deceptively difficult circuits in the country. Yeah, this track doesn't get enough credit for being as difficult as it is. It has some sections with some really high commitment where you have to use all the downforce these cars can make through the S's. Then you have some really slow speed technical corners. It's really hard to put the power down, really works the tires and wears the tires out. And then add on top of it, you have as much bumps as Sebring. And there are different types of bumps, so your Sebring setup doesn't transfer here. You have to come with a whole different package. It's a really exciting track and I can't wait to see these TA cars rip around here. Well, and as we've witnessed over the course of this weekend, for those that weren't aware, we kind of had a little bit of a, well, dare I say, monsoon on Wednesday, and it is uh, variable weather, so it's not like you're able to carry in the same setup even day after day. Weather down here in New Orleans changes so much, that's got to make it even more difficult. Yeah, and on top of that, it's actually a pretty warm day, and these Pirelli tires, as it gets hotter, they're going to wear faster. And on top of that, the rubber that gets laid on the track gets slippery as the heat gets hot. 
So as the track gets warmer and warmer and more rubber gets laid down, the cars are going to slide around more, even if they're taking care of their tires. So you might see some guys hunting around different lines, looking for different spots to try to actually find some grip. You might see that especially like turns three, turns four. You're going to see guys playing with that a lot, especially in the TA class where they have to put down that 850 horsepower. Yeah, a lot of horsepower being generated by these cars. We'll keep an eye out for that. I hadn't thought about that coming through three and four, looking for those variable lines. We'll kind of call those out when we see them. But we've also got to talk about the rest of this field, not just the TA category, SGT and XGT, absolutely fantastic. But we'll get talking about them in just a few moments' time because we are ready for the most famous words in motorsports. Well, thank you, DJ. I am here with some of the members of Son of a Saint, which is an unbelievable mentorship program. We've got Rodney here. Gotro and Aiden Bailey here. So the mentor, Menti, tell us a little bit about Son of a Saint. Absolutely. Thank you. So Son of a Saint was founded 13 years ago by Sonny Lee, whose father untimely passed. Um, his father also played for New Orleans Saints. You might know him. He was Vivian Lee. So the mission of Son of a Saint is to foster independence and basically mentor fatherless boys across New Orleans. So us, the mentors, we get mentees and basically we spend quality time with them and just help them become the men that we know that they can become. Nice. That is awesome. And Aiden, I'm sure you're having a great time with that. Well, gentlemen, get loud, get proud. Please deliver the most famous words in motorsports. Take it away. Gentlemen and first place winners, if you think you're going to get first place, start your, your engines. Nice job. Always incredible to hear those engines fire up and to hear those commands given out by the grid. This is what it's all about here at this point. We were ready to go racing. I think so. And before we go racing, though, we got to do some pace laps. Pace laps are actually really interesting. You should really watch some stuff on the pace lap. Because this race is long and it's so warm out and the tires are going to dig, they're all going to be starting on really low air pressure. So you have to get that air pressure up because if the air pressure is low, you can't use the curbs. The car doesn't handle right. So you have to use these pace laps and really build heat. But you can't really build too much heat in the rear tires. So you're going to see them working the brake and weaving to try to build that temperature. The pace laps are really, really critical to those first four or five laps of the race. All right. Well, we've got to ask the question because I hear this every time on a broadcast. Is it weaving or is it acceleration and braking? What's the best way to get the heat in the tires? So they're a little different. The acceleration and braking builds the best heat in the tire. The weaving is to clean them off. Because we've had other cars out here, there's rubber debris all around the track. And if you drive over it when the tires warm at all, it picks it right up. So the weaving cleans that off. And the acceleration and braking really heats the tire. The other reason you might want to weave is if you're starting on sticker tires, which you shouldn't be because you have to start on the tires you qualified <laughs> on unless you had an unfortunate incident, then the weaving also cleans that shiny mold release. You ever seen a new tire? It's all shiny and that shiny layer is really slippery. So the weaving cleans that off, but that gas and brake is what builds the heat. All right, there you go. One of the age old questions in motorsports finally answered by Josh up here in the booth. Cars firing off, ready to get going and ready to be able to head on out is there we see. We were talking a little bit earlier about that SGT and XGT category. The big thing we've got to be talking about Kaylee Bryson. She had a couple of struggles this year, not the best run out in Sebring. It looked like she was on the back foot. Some car issues there. But we, before we get to that, they just don't want us to talk about SGT today. We've got to go to the circuit by forced by you. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Hurley, and I'm going to take you around NOLA Motorsports Park. Really fantastic track. A lot of fun to drive. Coming down the fast front straightaway, we have our main passing zone in turn one, which is actually quite fast and bumpy, really tricky corner. And you have to be really careful on the exit because it really sets you up for turn two. You don't want to wash too wide. Then we go down to turn three, four, and five, which are our hairpins. You can see right now, Room and Tarek are battling out of the hairpin. Really hard to put the power down here. Then we go through turn six, seven, eight, all very fast and into the S's, my favorite section of this track. This is to make sure you watch this area because a lot of drivers make mistakes because it requires a lot of a commitment and you get some aero turbulence behind other cars and it sets you up for the second best passing zone, turn 14. We see Justin Marks passing Dreesy right here and clearing him into turn 15. 
really slow. It sets you up coming on to the main straightaway through 16 and 17. Really important to use all the road here, get the power down, and that is a lap of NOLA Motorsports Park. Back to live cameras here at this point. Tommy Dreesey bringing his machine around. Dreesey's not had the best start to the season here at this point, but uh, he will be looking to be able to get his way forward and push his way ahead. But let's go ahead here and go ahead and talk about this starting grid because it's pretty fascinating. Up at the top, Paul Menard and Tommy Dreesey going to be starting in first and second. Now, those are the first two in the championship as well. We've also got to be talking, excuse me, Chris Dyson, not Tommy Dreesey. Yeah. That was a Freudian slip there a little bit. As uh, Adam Andretti, Tommy Dreesey, they're in fourth place. And then Amy Room going to be rounding out that podium. We talked a little bit about Kaylee Bryson. She is leading the way in SGT, but it's going to be a fierce fight on back. Chris Kofi in that Maserati doing what he's done over the course of the season and dominating the GT class. Yep, and then right behind him we have we have Carson, and then Chris Coffey's teammate Colin Cohen, who's learning a lot from Chris and really running those Maseratis nicely. Then we move to Dan McKillen in his Chevy, I believe that's a Corvette, right in SGT. And then followed by Milton Grant and Richard Forsyth in that G-Speed Corvette. Yeah, going to be interesting to see what they're able to do. Milton Grant not able to set a time due to penalty. And then obviously Forsyth had a, uh, no time set down. But let's talk here a minute about these top two as we ride on board with Chris Dyson. Now, it is Paul Menard on pole here at this point. But let's give a little bit of a caveat to this because... Dyson is good here. He won in 2023 in the last two races at Road Atlanta and at Sebring. We saw Dyson put down an absolutely blistering lap with about a minute left to go in qualifying. He didn't get a chance to do that because we had a red flag during qualifying yesterday. And you can never count out the Dyson racing group. I mean, how long has Dyson been racing everything in motorsports? That's racing royalty. They always have tricks up their sleeve. Chris is always really hard to race against. I'm not afraid to admit it. I finished second to him in a Trans Am race before. He's always really hard to beat. That group really has their car together, so it's going to be a challenge. But we can't discount Paul Menard because he showed be up front in NASCAR Cup. He's up front in everything he's run in. So a lot of that NASCAR skill transfers over to these tube frame cars, though these do handle a little better around the corners than those cup cars do. Yeah, they certainly do. As there you see, he has been able to get a first place podium. That was down in uh, uh, Road Atlanta, had a problem, uh, went off track, fought his way back up to second. Adam Andretti taking that victory. Then there's Tommy Dreesey in fifth place in the championship right now with 169 points. There are so few points separating the top five in this class. It is absolutely remarkable, and it is really and truly, I think, going to lead to a fantastic battle throughout the entire season. Yeah, I'm really excited, especially to see what Adam Andretti can do. They got a little bit of momentum coming off that win. I believe that's the first win for that Burton chassis. A lot of development went into that thing, so it's also going to be interesting to see if he can stand up and make it last. I think you're going to see really who can make these tires last. We may see a totally different race at the beginning than we see at the end. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be about preservation of those tires. It's going to be about keeping everything together, and it's going to be about seeing who is going to be able to capitalize here. Really only, I would say, two great overtaking opportunities. You can get a little bit creative down into the infield section, but... Yeah. yeah, there's really two great ones and one that's discounted. Turn three, you can overtake more than you think, but since we're going side by side, looks like we're getting ready for the start. We are indeed. Paul Menard leading the field around as the Janetta Pace car is pulled down into pit lane, coming down through Mission Foods. Turn 16, we take a ride board on Chris Dyson as they come on to the main straightaway here at this point. All eyes go towards the flag stand as we get ready for Trans Am presented by Pirelli. Green flag is in the air. Let's Go racing from New Orleans. It is a mega jump from Chris Dyson. He is immediately going to be able to get a little bit of a run here on Paul Menard, but Menard's going to have that preferred line going down into cube three, turn one. Later on the binders goes Menard. He's able to make it play, and they fan out into single file order through turn two. 
All right, we're having Paul stretching away just a little bit. He was able to get through there despite being on the bumpy side. Passing in the turn one, it's even harder because there's bigger bumps on the inside. Though a little wide for Paul Menard. That was an interesting line. Not sure if he's wide or trying to do something to take care of the tire. Yeah, we'll have to see. Again, that's that area that you talked about that you do have to kind of keep an eye on the tire. Interesting there, Amy Ruman all over the back of Tommy Dreesey as well. So that looks like it's a pretty close battle. We ride on board with Chris Dyson, though, as they thunder back down through the the Bennett Bridge Hall S is here at the moment. Kind of a dab of the brakes going through turn seven before they enter fully into this section. Interestingly, I already see something on Dyson's car. You can see the nose is coming up a good bit higher than Paul Menard's. That means they're set up softer. So that should take care of the tires better. You should see that evolve maybe to Chris's favor later. Now, other than obviously taking care of the tires, what is that advantage going to play out between having a softer versus a harder setup? So softer generally makes more mechanical grip, but it's a little worse aerodynamically. So you'll probably see them struggle a little bit in those S's and on heavy fuel. But as the fuel comes off, if the car will actually start to pitch the other way because it won't lift the nose so much because these fuel tanks have to be behind the rear axle in Trans Am. It's a really difficult trade-off to play with. So you'll see that. And Chris may struggle in the high speed, but he'll be really good in those low speed corners, especially as the tires go off. All right, something to keep an eye out for as cars thunder across the start finish line for the first time. Tommy Dreesey, we ride on board with right now under some pretty heavy pressure from Amy Ruman. As there, though, it looks like coming down through Mission Foods turn 16, he was able to get a massive jump. And Josh, there are those bumps you were talking about coming into one. Yeah, they are unbelievable. It actually adds a lot of character to the track. It's kind of like Sebring. The track wouldn't be as amazing without the bumps it really adds some technical element to it you really have to be on your toes driving the car there's a few bumps i can't reveal any of my secrets because i'm racing <laughs> tomorrow but there's a few bumps you can use to help turn the car and some things you can do with them that's really really creative all right, we'll come back to you after your race tomorrow. Maybe you can give us a little uh, uh, post thing to be able to get us that there. But we watch Amy Ruman right now. Looks like she's lost a little bit of ground here at the moment up to Tommy Dreesey. Is Dreesey's going to power ahead and keep his eyes focused on the road on last time's winner, Adam Andretti, in that new Claudio Burton designed machine. Absolutely fantastic performance down at Road Atlanta. Yeah, it was really fun to watch. One of the best guys in the paddock. Works really hard. I love seeing Adam get his win. And it's nice to see Claudio get a win with that car, too. It's been a long time coming. He's had a few other good drivers in there. It's nice to see Adam be the one to get it over the line for him. Yeah, and it, it, just an altogether well-measured drive there for Adam Andretti as he really, really put a, a very, very solid weekend together and didn't make mistakes, crucially, where other drivers were making those errors. Dreesey right now, though, looks like he's starting to settle into that rhythm. We always talk about rhythm. We always talk about flow. How hard or easy it is it to find that rhythm here at NOLA? I'm a little strange. I actually like when there's no rhythm or flow because that's kind of my advantage on those starts and restarts. A lot of people really, really need to find that rhythm, but I find it advantageous to be good off the start and it looks like we have Amy Ruman with a problem pulling off at the end of pit lane here. Oh my goodness yes Amy Ruman down off to the side of pit lane you saw her there on the corner of your screen kind of peek out of camera we'll have to sort of diagnose exactly what that is may bring out a yellow flag period as she is not exactly in a safe area on the track but we look back a little farther in the field that's the number 36 machine of Joshua Carlson We're right on board with Tommy Teresi right now he is going to be released from that battle with Amy Ruman so he's going to be able to hold on here at this point and keep his eyes focused ahead. But we'll have to see. There is room and down to the inside as they try to take a look at exactly what's going on there in that machine. Ruman probably doing a control alt delete here at this point as they are going to just try to reset the car as they try to get everything set and ready to go. We'll take a quick break, though. And we are back here on Speed TV as we watch Amy Ruman down to the inside. Chris Dyson continuing to go as caution flag flies here. Caution flag flies, Josh. And that's not altogether surprising. That car is in a pretty perilous position. Yeah, it's in a pretty rough spot, though. It should be a quick one. They'll probably just pull her back up pit lane and get her out. But this is probably not what Chris Dyson wants to see. If I'm set up for the long run, I don't want yellows. I want Paul Menard to deck those tires. So probably not exactly what Dyson wanted to see, but we'll find out. All right, as Dyson brings the car back down into slowing speed here at this point. And it uh, sounds like we've got uh, Ben Sissel down in pit lane.
And we come back to live pictures here at this point. As you said earlier, Josh, Chris Dyson, not the situation that he wanted to see here at this point. But uh, if you're Paul Menard, you're probably a little bit happy that this happened. You're able to save those tires a little bit as they're going to try to get their things back together. The other thing to keep in mind here, a little bit of a windy day at the moment. We are hearing, by the way, that it was clutch issues for Amy Room and clutch issues. And that's what sent her out here at this point. So that's probably not going to be repairable there for her, but we will have to wait and see exactly what that is as they come on in here at this point. Welcome back, Mav TV viewers. If you are just joining us here, Amy Ruman out of this race with apparent clutch issues causing the first caution of the day. And it sounds like we've got an in depth interview here with Ben Sissel down on pit lane. Yeah, thanks, DJ, and sorry about those problems. That was absolutely my fault, but I'm here with Dave Skinner here, crew chief for Amy Room and two-time champion. You see him pushing him back, uh, counter race into here. What, what happened to Amy? Well, um, something, something broke on the car uh, at the start of the second lap, and it was probably the clutch or the gearbox. She said the cockpit started filling with smoke. I don't think it's the motor. The, she said the motor's running fine, but probably the clutch has, uh, has had a problem. Um, I don't know, maybe the gearbox, but rather than continue on and destroy things, we're just going to have her pushed back in here and, and bring her in. So She's doing so well in the points, that's really unfortunate, but we'll let you go because you can go talk to your driver. Gentlemen, back up to you in the booth. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you, Ben. And a heartbreak here for Amy Room, and she really looked like she was able to challenge there on Tommy Dreesey maybe before things were said and done, but getting pushed back into pit lane, and as you said earlier, Josh, probably a quick caution, so maybe not that much of a strategy play out. Yeah, not too much. Hopefully we should get back to green, hopefully at the end of this lap, because they already got her pulled back. I'm not quite sure. For those of you race fans who don't know, we also don't use the clutch except to move, so it's nothing Amy did or caused. That's just unfortunate parts failure. You're asking the clutch to do a lot. These cars have a lot of power, so sometimes you have those unfortunate failures. Well, okay, we're resetting here for Dyson. We know he's probably got that long run car set up at this point. For Paul Menard, is the team recognizing the same things you are? Are they relaying that back to him, or are they just kind of staying out of his way? It's usually staying out of your way because it's hard for them to see. Sometimes the broadcast, they have other stuff going on. They're usually keeping track of times, or they're spotting for them. So it's hard for them to see the broadcast, and they can't really see a lot from pit lane. So they're probably just letting Paul do his thing. This yellow really help him. And our restart rules, the leader can really get a pretty decent jump here, especially with our turn one here. So in a way, the restart may help him. Should save his tires, get a nice little bit of jump on Chris, and try to drive away. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what he's going to want to do here at this point, try to extend that points lead up at the front of the field. Is it does look like here we continue to cycle around under that Janetta safety car. Adam Andretti, we talked about a little bit earlier, a great run for him. Tommy Dreesey, you know, he came into this season, a uh, new operation, kind of thinking this was going to be his year, and it just hasn't come to fruition quite yet. It's just so hard to beat him. I mean, you have a NASCAR front runner and you have Chris Dyson, who've both been around forever. Not that Tommy has it, but it's so hard to beat those guys. They have so much experience in everything. I mean, Chris has run Le Mans and run all that. And then you have Paul who's run NASCAR Cup with Penske. It's really hard to beat those guys. They're going to keep working on it, though, and keep closing that gap. Yeah, they're going to keep trying here at this point, and there is no quit in Tommy Tracy. Rest assured, he is going to keep on going and keep on going. Driving around behind the safety car still here at this point, and it does look like those lights may be out so we are coming back to green flag coming back to green flag this time by and as you said big advantage here for paul bernard he's going to be able to get a good jump on this field exactly with the restart zone as long as he doesn't spin the tires which an ex nascar driver's done so many restarts in big horsepower cars i expect paul to really nail this all right well they come down now out of turn 14 and 15 down into mission foods turn 16 and looks like there chris dyson doesn't want to get let him get 
get that jump, but Menard's going to do everything he can do to get it as there they come out of Mission Foods turn 16. A little bit of a checkup, waiting for the green here to fly. Still waiting as they, you can hear those engines purr. There goes the green. We are back into it here at this point, and I've got to say, that's a good jump there for Dyson. He's immediately going to take a little bit of a look to the inside, and Andretti's going to do the same thing. Dyson moves inside, moves outside, trying to find that advantage. He's not going to get it. Everybody's staying in pretty much single file order, but look at that farther back in the field. That is Chris Coffey making some moves. Always hard on these restarts when you're running a mixed class company because the speeds and the way they corner are so different. So those GT and XGT and G SGT cars all together, really difficult situation for everybody because the cars have such different capabilities. But let's see what line Dyson takes through here. Notice he's much, much tighter. He's probably going to stay tighter on exit two. Use the wrap, which can work the tires a little bit differently than the wider line that Paul's using. I don't want to say which one's better, because again, I am racing tomorrow. <laughs> he can't reveal all his trade secrets quite yet, folks. But I love that insight of just the different ways to be able to come through that. And that's one of the things here in NOLA, is there are so many of those corners that offer multiple opportunities for lines that really changes things up. But Menard, you can tell he's pushing, kicking up a little bit of dirt. Exactly. Got to use every inch of the road, though there is one spot you really don't want to. At the end of the S's, there's a little bit of inch on the road that if you use, there's a big hole and it's really, really rough on your car. You can definitely break a front suspension piece that's coming up. Oh, if we sit on Dreezy one more second longer, I'd show you where it was. <laughs> there it is. Well, I'm sure we'll get it at another point. Adam Andretti, though, working in third place right now. About three-tenths of a second off of Dyson up in front of him. And there you can see that pitch and yaw of the car. A lot of lateral and vertical load being put through. Yeah, and he even saw, unfortunately, saw him come out of the two corners and go lay a little bit of a black stripe. Don't want to be doing that this early. You want to keep that rubber on the tire still. Yeah, don't want to let any of that go. Another little bit of a poke to the inside there for Chris Dyson trying to find that opportunity. Meanwhile, back down in the SGT category, Kaylee Bryson pulling away here. This is absolutely incredible. As we said, Kaylee had heartbreak in Sebring, not really able to get anything to go. But we've got to look a little farther back in the field as we've got a battle on our hands right now. That is Porsche versus Chevrolet. Grant and McMillan. McMillan down to the inside, tries to outbreak the Porsche of them. And it's still going to be side by side coming through the corners. Really respectful, leaving themselves room through two. Let's see who gets the run. It looks like McMillan has him covered, which is pretty good recovering from his qualifying issue. Yeah, able to work his way back up. That car always looks very, very mean. I love the black and red and silver. It's just got that very iconic design, but definitely putting good pressure to him. And as you said there earlier, great respect between Grant and McMillan, not trying to pinch each other, giving each other enough racing room. And it's really hard to do in that turn one and two because they're busy because they're both fast and bumpy. Exactly, and those bumps throw the car off a little bit, so clearly respect given on both sides. McMillan now moving his way up into eighth place at the moment, so he is going to be holding on to eighth overall, and that will be a podium position in the SGT category, so that is absolutely crucial. Checking back in on the battle for the lead of the race, it doesn't look like Dyson is letting Menard run away with it nearly as much as he did in that first green flag period. Yeah, he probably was able to get the tire pressures up. He probably had some really low air pressure, and that yellow, the pressures don't drop as much because they're still rolling, and he's have some heat soak from the green flag run. So probably a little closer to the window that he's looking for, and that fuel burn coming off, making everything a little bit better, and those tires wearing just a little bit. It's probably better balanced for Chris than on brand new tires. Well, as you saw on your screen, your Unco lap leaders, it's leader in the form of Paul Menard. He has led all seven laps of this race here at this point. And doesn't look like he has any intention of letting that go. But Chris Dyson pitching the car forward as they go, moving his way through the corners, just trying to apply pressure. And outside of letting that setup come to you, what else can you do if you're in the position here of Chris Dyson? You really just need to be close enough to put pressure on Menard and make his tires go away. You just want him to have to look in the mirror and think about you. You want him to have to drive hard enough to try to pull that gap and just be there. Your goal is to just keep being there until you wear them out, especially if you think the tire's going to come to you. And when we were on board with Chris, I saw very little steering wheel correction. So I think he's saving those tires. 
very, very little correction. That's going to be very, very good for him to be able to keep that together. Meanwhile, we are seeing a little bit more movement, I think, out of Tommy Dreese as he's fighting a little bit as he tries to go through the corners. But again, the bumps here on this uh, NOLA Motorsports track, very, very crucial to be able to get around and not the easiest thing to be able to drive. As we continue to watch here at this point, they're going to keep on going right now. It continues to be Paul Menard leading over Chris Dyson, Adam Andretti, and Tommy Dreese, your top four in the TA category, and indeed your only remaining four, as Amy Ruman had an unfortunate retirement due to clutch issues earlier in the race. As we take a look down this long main straightaway, you see in visual forms the gap between the TA and SGT and GT classes. I got a sneaking suspicion if we don't get a yellow here, we may see some lap traffic come into play. Yeah, usually pretty common with those TA cars. There's so much power over not just the other cars on track here, but over about anything else in American road racing. So they almost will always catch pack if the lap stays green. Well, and if they do, it's going to be one of those situations. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the SVR race, SVRA racing on the day. You want to hold your line if you are that lapped car. You do not want to be unpredictable you really do and it's especially with the ta cars because they're so fast in a straight line if you're in another class car i've been in a gt car you look in his mirror your mirror you won't see a ta car by the time you get to the corner it's there so it also throws a little bit of a curveball for our ta drivers because it traffic is really difficult to deal with and it may make you take a different line and use up a little bit of tire well and once again that is the big storyline here of today is keeping that tire underneath you for as long as possible the pirelli rubber will start to wear away at some point and that is what we think the long game is here for chris dyson as he tries to hold on as much as possible keeping pressure to the back of paul menard but it looks like menard starting to streak away at this point that gap growing to 1.5 seconds and it looks like Menard is starting to be able to just feel comfortable here at this moment. Welcome back, viewers of MAV TV. It's still Paul Menard who leads the way over Chris Dyson. And as we were just saying here, you were saying a little bit earlier, Josh, that he wanted to try to keep pressure, did Dyson, on the back of Paul Menard. But it looks like Paul Menard is flying in the face of that. Yeah, he's doing a really good job gapping away from him. And while I'm not seeing Chris have him do much correction, Paul may just be a little bit faster. If he gets that gap out to about two, three seconds, that gives you enough room to start laying back and taking your tear of your tires a little extra. So you might see Paul try to put a few flyers away to make that gap just a little bit bigger, take the pressure off of himself, and then start protecting tires of his own, just in case we get a yellow. Well, at this point, Paul Menard, on the last time of asking, put down a 34-7, and Dyson was only able to do a 37-6, uh, or excuse me, a 37-4, uh, as Paul Menard, your MCO lap leader, continues to lead with nine laps in the books. Let me try that again. A 137.4 for Paul Menard, a 137.6 for Chris Dyson. So two tenths there may not sound like a lot, but you add those up in all of those nine laps that he's led, that's going to start to stack up to big. Yeah, it's really a game of inches. It's, and if you, he gets away just a little bit, you take the pressure off him. That means he can start saving his tires too. So you might start seeing some of that. If I were Paul, I'd be pushing for a lap or two to see if I could stretch that gap out to that two, three second mark. That also gives you a safe margin for if you catch that lap traffic. Exactly, and you want to build that buffer when you come to it. And, and one thing here for Adam Andretti is he rides around in third place right now. I've got to think if you're in this position, you're five seconds off of P2 here at this point. If you're Adam, are you just thinking, okay, ride this home to podium? Exactly, but on top of that, this car is still going through its development, so you're also making notes to the crew. What can we do better when we come back here? What do we need to challenge those Dysons and those Palmanars? So that's what he's thinking about, is how to make this car better for the next race that they go to so he can go challenge those guys once again like they did from Atlanta. Yeah, and that's a very good point. A new race car here, Claudio Burton designed race car, adding a whole bunch into everything here at this point. And uh, uh, he was able to finally taste uh, victory last time out in road Atlanta once to be able to do that again. 
Tommy Dreesy here. We mentioned a little bit earlier building a new program this year to, to hopefully be able to challenge Chris Dyson. He has been three times the bridesmaid to Dyson's championship. So desperate to be able to get his way forward and finally be able to break that duck in terms of championships. Yeah, he's been around this forever. He knows how to drive a Trans Am car. It's just so hard to put all the pieces together. It's a team sport. People may only see the driver in the car out there, but it takes the whole package. And anytime you have a new team, you're going to go through some growing pains, figuring everything out, how to work with each other, how to work with the car. So he might be going through a little bit of that right now, too. Yeah, he very well could be. And we'll have to see as this season continues to go along how things are going to play themselves out and how everything is going to change for these teams. I think it is not out of the realm of possibility that we can see Dreesy, that we can see Andretti again climbing up to the top step of the podium before everything is said and done. But this is another team that was recently put together this year for Kaylee Bryson, and she is finally bearing the fruits of that, leading by a considerable margin, five seconds seconds over Carlson here at this point in SGT. And I don't think finally is fair to her because her background is actually very different than road course racing. She comes from a dirt oval and some paved oval background. So she's not only having to learn a new car, a new team, but a different form of motorsport. While some of the skills transfer, it is very different. So she's doing a really good job getting the experience and starting to put it to use and starting to go faster and faster pulling away in this race. Yeah, absolutely putting it together. And I know you've got some dirt experience. So talk to me a little bit about those who don't understand, how hard is it to come from a dirt background into road course racing? Funny enough, I think it's harder the other way, because what's so neat about dirt, as I learned, I came to dirt late in life, is you have to adopt your driving style all the time, because the track and everything changes so rapidly. So it actually helps you on this stuff, because as you're having to look for different lines or dealing with different corners, she's used to seeing different corner every lap never laps the same under it's always different so she's should be fairly adaptable the hard part for the road racing is not only how long the events are but the precision and you have to keep the car way more in line you can't let them get as sideways the, everything has to be a little bit tighter a little bit tidier than the dirt stuff the dirt you can really throw the car and muscle it around and while we do muscle these Trans Am cars around, it's nothing like the dirt as far as how sideways you can go. Tire management also is probably a little bit difficult for her too because dirt tires, while they do wear, you can abuse them a lot easier. You can abuse them a lot more than we can our road racing tires. That pavement just shreds rubber. Yeah, and it may look cool to be going sideways through a corner, but it's not necessarily the fastest way to go through the corner. As we take a look, there is second place in that SGT category at this point. That is the number 36 entry of Joshua Carlson. He is uh, bringing his way on through in that Ford Mustang, doing a really admirable job here at this point, just keeping the gap as close as possible to Kaylee Bryson and waiting to take an opportunity if there is a disadvantage to come. Exactly. That's all you can do is keep pressure on her and, and keep developing her car so you can come back and challenge her the next race. So I'm sure he's relaying that info to his crew, just like Adam Andretti is. Just like Adam Andretti. And then we talk about somebody who has been, uh, well, the class of their field here at this point. That is Chris Coffey in that uh, number 38 Maserati in the GT category. He has been a dominant, dominant force. I did ask him, by the way, at one point if his Maserati goes 185, and he told me it was a little bit slower than that, which I was slightly disappointed pointed by but nevertheless a beautiful car a beautiful livery and he has driven it beautifully this year to absolute perfection as he works his way around leading that gt class Coffee, as we said, leading in the GT category, and as has been the case by a couple of times this year, has a couple of cars in between himself, and that as a driver just gives you such a huge bit of breathing room and a bit of, uh, uh, well, uh, ability to, to go out and push a little harder if you want to. And exactly. No, he may not know it because oh, that throws some wheels off yep. there, getting a little bit of dirt on the tires. We jinxed he, him. <laughs> he may not know it other than looking in the mirror because Chris Coffey is the hardest working man in motorsports. He is pretty much his, most of his crew. He works on the car. He drives the truck. He works on his teammate's car. He does everything on that car. So I don't know if his crew's informing him of what's out behind him too much because 
The crew is driving the car. <laughs> the crew is driving the car. I like that. I quite like that. Yeah, Chris, a very good guy. And as you said, one of those uh, uh, sort of throwback to the old styles, the, the Dan Gurneys out there, uh, the Carroll Shelbys that would wrench and race at the same time. It's always fun to be able to talk to those folks because they have such a great appreciation about the car and the way that it goes. And you are never going to see them ding up the car. I can guarantee you that. Oh, well, though he does drive it hard. He's he does. actually fast. <laughs> So you, you never know, but never on purpose. A lot of respect for what's going on, what it takes to put one of these cars at any level out on the racetrack. It's so much work. Don McMillan here, as we saw earlier, making the pass over the number 55 of Milton Grant to put that Chevrolet Corvette up into podium position. A good run here for the number 51, especially after having that penalty served in qualifying, moving his way back on here and trying to see what he is able to do as we are starting to see a little bit of lap traffic play in here at this point. There's Adam Andretti coming in behind him as they go. And as we come back on MAV TV, uh, you just noticed something up here in the booth, my friend. It looks like Chris Dyson has put the hammer down. It's a little bit closer between himself and Paul Menard. Yeah, he more than half that gap, so he's getting real close. So it's probably getting about around halfway, a little bit less, but about starting to see some tire deg. So that's probably starting to play into his hands. We'll see what lap traffic will bring to him because they should be getting to that in just a couple laps. Yeah, they certainly should. And some of that lap traffic is going to be those on your screen here at this point. This is Milton Grant in that number 55 uh, Porsche 991.1. And that's actually Tommy Dreesey coming onto the back of him right now. So that is going to be a little bit of a battle. Here we check back on Chris Dyson. That green machine up in front of him, that Ford, certainly getting a lot closer in the windshield. Yeah, when we look at the timing, you saw it looks like Paul had a 39, uh, 139 lap last lap, which is a couple seconds off what he was running, and Dyson just keeps banging out those 37s. That's kind of what I expected to see. Maybe not the fastest lap from Dyson, but able to stay at that lap time for longer. And how hard is that as a driver to be able to regulate yourself? Because, I, I mean, full confession, I come from a world of sim racing is, is my main thing. And so my problem is, is I always want to push 10 tenths. How hard is it to restrain yourself back to that 7 tenths? It's totally a personality thing. I'd say the field is split. Like 80% of the people just want to drive hard all the time. I am actually from the other way because I came from slot cars, which are, you know, little cars <laughs> on the track. And if you overdrive them, you come off. So it's a big mistake. So I'm a habitual underdriver. So I really really like being in the position that Dyson is right now. It's really nice also watching that car just slowly coming to you. It gives you a lot of confidence. So I much prefer to be in that, but that's me. Most drivers just want to go out there and drive 10 tenths. Well, we'll have to see who is going to be able to do that. But before we keep an eye on this battle, we're going to go down to Ben Sissel, who's down in pit lane. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'm here with Aaron Pierce, who I'm used to seeing in a Trans Am car with the Team LSI, Sam Pierce Chevrolet. Kaylee Bryson is just kicking butt right now. It seems like the race is coming to her. But what, as the driver coach, what's she saying on the radio? How's she feeling? Uh, she's really not saying much. I mean, that, that's a good thing. Um, she's pretty much in race mode, just trying to click off laps and keep the tires on the car. And, you know, she's adapted well to this road race stuff, and she's just going to get better. So, uh just keep it going the way we are, and we'll be in a good spot. Nice. And then as a driver yourself, usually the quiet drivers that are focused, those are the ones you don't really want to talk to too much on the radio. Do you ever say anything to her? Uh, really not much. Just give her information if she needs it, and, uh, you know, that's about it. Nice. nice job. Good job out there creating some gaps with Josh Carlson. Gentlemen, back up to you. Well, thank you, Ben. And there, just a little bit more insight on Kaylee Bryson in that O2 machine uh, uh, as she continues to put down a very impressive pace here in the SGT category, looking for her first win on the season. Yeah, let's see what line choice she sees here. So she's going a little about mid-track and then coming back. So I don't know how that car works its tires. Just an always nice to watch what lines they're taking there. Because that 3-4 section, there's so many different options. And they're all pretty much similar lap time. Just how your car works and how it works the tire. Yeah, and it's all about that feel and that rhythm of the car that we talked about. Well, that you don't like as much necessarily, but... 
<laughs> exactly. I, I'm a little bit of a weird one. I like that lack of rhythm, and I like tires coming to me. I like, I like when it gets hard and weird and challenging. All right, there's a little bit of lap traffic causing uh, a little bit of run here for the leader. And look at that, Chris Dyson closing the gap down once again as Paul Menard working his way by some of the lapped cars in the GT category. Look at that, they're on top of each other coming down through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. Now, here comes something difficult for Chris. You really get a lot of aero turbines in these cars. These cars have gained so much downforce over the years that right now he's probably getting some aero understeer, and that's why you're seeing it stretch out just a little bit because he has to drive the car differently in Paul Menard's wake. But in the low speed stuff, I think is where you'll see Chris really, really close up, especially on corner exit. I think I saw a little wiggle out of Paul that time too. Oh, all right, let's take a look here as he comes through Mission Foods, turn 16 and gets the power down. Not seeing too much there at that point. There's Kaylee Bryson, who we were just following. That's a visual representation. They have just about lapped the entire SGT and GT field. But where that arrow weight comes into play down on the S's, it comes into play here as Dyson takes a look down to the inside, poking out of the draft. Yeah, this is what you want, blood in the water. He sees that Paul's suffering a little bit compared to him, and we still got a good bit of way in this race to go. Yeah, we do. We are just over the halfway point here, if my math is correct. And full caveat, never trust a commentator's math. Uh, but there as they go down through this infield section, about two car lengths in between the two. Your MCO lap leader still is Paul Menard. It is singular here at this point as Menard has led all 17 laps of this race. But with Kaylee Bryson in the form of lap traffic in front and a very, very quickly approaching Chris Dyson, that may change soon. You can even see there, you can see Chris offsetting his car just a little bit, trying to get the inside headlight of his portion of his car to the inside of Paul Menard to just get some air on it to keep some downforce. Though a rough place to catch Kaylee. He's going to have to do a big commitment around the outside. That's going to cost him. He has to redo all that work to catch Paul. It's always hard. But how much is Paul going to be thanking his lucky stars here at this point and thanking his own talent? Because he put that green number three right into position to put Dyson into a disadvantage. Exactly. That's well played. Coming from the NASCAR side of things, he's run with a lot of lap traffic, so he knows how to play that game. you got to try to catch people where you want. And he caught him exactly where he wanted at play but once again the draft coming back into play here for Chris Dyson and just a representation that lap was about four or five tenths of a second slower than Chris uh, then uh, Paul Menard in front so he lost that time here at this point but Dyson working his way through the corners right now that arrow wash through turn two may be coming into play through one of those higher speed corners He's going to try to be able to get a little bit of a better run here. Different lines coming down in through turn three. Where will Dyson be able to make the move? Will he be able to make the move? We've got plenty of time left to go here in this race. And we come back to the action live here at this point as Paul Menard continues to try to hold off a charging Chris Dyson. Dyson lost all of his time on this portion of the track last time around. Let's see if he can gain it back up. And that's the hardest thing as a driver. You did all that work. You have to fight and scrap and claw for every inch you can get to that guy and then to miss time traffic and lose a couple seconds. It's a lot of work to get back. So it's a little bit frustrating. So you just have to calm yourself down. Remember, you were able to catch him before. Take care of your tires and let it come to you. Don't over push. Really easy to overdrive in this situation. I was going to say, that's got to be the most common thing in the world is to want to try to react and to go back to that 10 tenths. And especially if you were Dyson in this point, that's the opposite of what you need to do. Yeah, you just need to, you caught him for a reason. So trust yourself. Go back to that old plan and just slowly and methodically start marching your way in. Well, he's going to continue to go here at this point. That gap on the last lap, it looks like things recycled a little bit. But once again, Menard able to pull another four tenths of a second away. So maybe favor coming back to Paul Menard. Yeah, you might be seeing Chris trying a little hard, trying to get that gap back, or maybe Paul being away from the lot of traffic helped his car out a little bit. Yeah, maybe you did that arrow wash that we talked about, swapping back and forth a little bit. That could have been the play that we see. 
Right now, Adam Andretti running in third place. He's about 23 seconds off of your leaders, but about 12-second gap in between himself and Tommy Dreese. So that's going to buy him a little bit of time there at this point to be able to be running in a race of his own. And he'll be relatively comfortable not feeling to push too hard or to hold back too much. As we rejoin you on MAV TV, it still is Paul Menard leading the way. Chris Dyson behind Adam Andretti in third place, and Tommy Dreese in fourth. Kaylee Bryson, the standout here in the GT category, but Andretti just looking for that opportunity like he had last time out in Road Atlanta. Yeah, exactly. You always got to be there and take advantage of other people's mistakes. Back on board with Tommy Dreese, though, as he tries to run down Adam Andretti little hard to do but they're still working on this car let's see how he looks through here oh he's catching lap traffic so he's gonna have to think about that arrow wake maybe offset the car a little bit hard place to catch those gt car soups those gt cars aren't slow in a corner no they're certainly not and that's chris coffee who is not slow in any portion of the racetrack in that maserati but coffee does what we talked about earlier goes onto the traditional racing line, makes Dreesy go the opposite way to get around him. But what Coffee did was be consistent and be smooth about it. Well, and he even did one step beyond that. He also did something to actually help his own race. So people catching you can really slow you down too. So you really want to facilitate the pass. So what you saw him was not only take the normal line, but actually break a little bit you're earlier to let Dreesy through to not hold both of them up. Holding the other car up often costs you time as well, so you facilitating the pass is actually a really important skill when you're in a slower class. Well, there you go. It pays to be both a good passer and a good passee here at a circuit like this. Now coming up against the number 36 of Joshua Carlson. Dreesy taking a, a, a very quick dive down to the inside in an attempt to be able to get his way back forward and move his way along. That gap at the line, by the way, was about 13 seconds. So he's got a lot of ground to try to make up, but he's certainly trying to push on it here at this point. Let's see how this looks. There's one other nice thing in this corner. That little concrete seam really upsets the car, too. Yeah, this track's so technical. So many little details. Curbs, concrete, patches, all sorts of details, and it looks like Chris is closing back up a little bit. That gap is under a second again. Yes, it is. It's the last lap time there, a 38.9 for Paul Menard and a 38.8 for Chris Dyson. So it looks like he's found his mojo once again, and Dyson back on the attack on the back of Paul Menard right as Menard catches traffic again. Yeah, so let's see if which one can play that traffic to advantage. A little hard to time it with these TA cars because they're just so fast in a straight line. And actually traffic is really polite, moved out of their way and didn't interrupt their race. Really heads up move. Yeah, as your Emco lap leader, Paul Menard, 21 of 21 laps completed. Every single one going to the green number three here at this point. But once again, as we say for the second time in uh, so many laps, Chris Dyson starting to close back in here at this point and push his way ahead. Let's see if he's able to get anything to play. As they come out now of uh, turn six and seven into the Bennett Bridge Hall S's, this is the area where we've seen Dyson fall back a little bit, the arrow wash a little bit, lap traffic a little bit, multiple things coming into play. And once again, just by the eye test, it looks like Menard starting to pull away. On top of it, Menard may have accomplished his mission, even if Chris catches him because if I recall don't they get an extra point extra bonus point for leading the most laps and if they do he's already done that and he got the bonus points for pole so even if Paul lost the race he's in a pretty good points position for the season championship by just executing those two things as a driver when you're sitting in the car how much of that championship math is going through your head it really depends on where you're running if you're in contention for it for me it goes through there all the time winning the championship is really about executing on your bad days it's not about catching those wins it's about making those bad days a third place or a sixth place instead of a 20th so stuff like that not taking that risky move managing your advantages we can get them grabbing those extra bonus points help a huge amount so stuff like that plays in your head just a little bit now that he's already clinched that though he's free to not think about it he's got the most laps led got those pull bonus points so now he has a little bit of safety margin to take some risk well and take risk he may be able to but doesn't want to throw it away here at this point he 
doesn't want to have any problems that with that at this point. But uh, as we ride on board with Tommy Dreesey here at this point, Dreesey still sits a fair ways back of Adam Andretti. He'll come across the timing and scoring stripe right now. 16 seconds that gap, so it looks like Dreesey going the wrong way up to Adam. And actually, you can see some of the deck here, not just on board with him, but if I recall qualifying, we were seeing, what, 33, 35 second lap times, and we're seeing 39s and 40s out of the field now. It just shows you how much lap time and how much tire fall off these guys have had to endure. Yeah, it really and truly does as we watch him come back through. I'm keeping an eye on his hands there on that onboard camera. He looks relatively smooth. He doesn't look like he's fighting it all that much. He's not fighting it, but he is getting on the power very measured and very smoothly to help protect that rear and really keep it down. It's just going to take longer and longer to put that power down. That throttle time just takes forever as those tires go off. Certainly does. And this is why you have a driver in the booth. I'm looking at one thing. He's looking at eight different things here at this point. That's the, the what it is. But Kaylee Bryson here, fifth place overall. And she continues to run in the top of that SGT category once again looking for that first win on the year she's been able to grow that gap up to 11 seconds between herself and uh, uh, Joshua Carlson a very very good drive for Kaylee coming from dirt coming from paved ovals making her a mark here in Trans Am presented by Pirelli Kaylee Bryson working her way down through the right-left complex on the back half of this circuit, doing an absolutely fantastic job, a measured approach. And you heard a crew chief say a little bit earlier, kind of a Sunday drive here at this point. Yeah, exactly. She's got a nice, comfortable car. Car's working well. She's comfortable with the track now. She's pulled a decent gap. She's not under much pressure right now, so now's a time where it's just really working on her consistency to develop as she moves to different classes and starts learning this road racing trade. Well, and as you said earlier, also working on developing the car. They've had a couple of chassis swaps in Sebring, trying to get the right feel for this car, trying to get everything together, and so they can keep working on the car while she's doing this. Exactly. It's something that makes the Trans Am series so unique. In many of these classes, you can develop and build your own car a lot of other series you have to buy a spec car and go from there we're here you really can build and develop your own thing so it's a big undertaking for all these teams and for the drivers it makes it a real team sport to develop these cars and get them ready yeah it certainly does and making sure the driver is ready as well and the driver is fully up to the task here as they run and i'll tell you what kaylee bryson certainly up to the task in every way you can imagine it as she works her way down through turns six and seven, bringing that car back around. Such a tricky portion of the track because you've got so much lateral load going through the car. Especially seven, not only all that lateral load, but you have that little strip of concrete through it. And if you have your front tire on that concrete, the car does not want to turn at all. It's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. She's making it look easy, though. Maybe a little bit of that dirt track and background where she's used to dealing with a lot of lack of grip there at that point. Now down through big hop of the curbs there at that point. She's able to get the car steady back up. Down onto the braking here into turn 13 and 14. And 13's really bumpy. And as we come back live on MAV TV, you were just saying that turn 13, an incredibly difficult corner to be able to get those brakes applied for. Well, it's not the brakes right in the center. It's super, super bumpy, unbelievably bumpy. So the car is always fighting you as you, right as you land, right as the car hits maximum load, it starts bouncing and pogoing on you. So really difficult, deceptively difficult corner, even though it's a slow hairpin. Well, we sound like we've got an interview down in pit lane with the one and only Ben Sissel. Well, thank you very much. I have a crazy story. I'm here with Tony Genalozzi, who's talking to Paul Menard with 3GT. But our pit official, Misty Richter, just came and said, tell your driver to look out for an alligator, turn three or four. Not things you normally hear. He's talking to his driver right now. But you don't really hear, look out for an alligator out on the track. Tony, what's your driver saying right now? They're throwing everything at you. Not a lot. He's really busy racing. Uh, he's managed his tires well, and we're waiting for the last few laps to really go here. Nice. And is he just trying to manage that gap with Dyson in the back, or is he uh, is he feeling really good? Yes, absolutely. He's feeling great. Uh, it's obviously a chess match, as it usually is. So we'll see here in the last 10 laps. Any reports of an alligator on the track? Uh, none as of yet. 
All right, well, there you go. There may or may not be an organic on the track called an alligator. Back up to you, gentlemen. All right, we are going to keep our eyes open here for this alligator. We take a look from the live drone shots. I don't see any large lizard there at this point, but uh, race fans, rest assured, if we uh, have to go under yellow flag conditions for a gator, it will be the highlight of my career. I'll tell you what, if I'm Adam Andretti, I'm saying there's an alligator, there's a unicorn, there's all sorts of animals on the track. We need a yellow because I want to go attack. Yeah, well, one driver who doesn't want to see that yellow come out here at this point, that's Chris Coffey, who leads in the GT class, as he has done multiple times this year. Uh, pretty much a almost, uh, not almost, a one minute and 30 second gap there over the number 38 of Colin Cohen. I mean, this is just domination. It is. He's become a really, really good racing driver. Very solid. He really wants some more people to come out here with even more GT cars to add a little more challenge to it because he's ready for some more competition. Uh, Colin's doing a good job with his car, too. They've got these Maseratis running really well. And again, Chris doing work on both of those cars. He preps both his and Colin's car. A lot of work goes into this program and has one of the best-looking wraps out there. And look at that thing go through those S's. He's doing a great job today. Yeah, you're never going to miss that car. That That's one one of those ones that comes by and even if you just see a flash of it you're going to know immediately which car it is it is very very easily distinguishable i can tell you that and not only because it's a maserati and those are a little bit rare to see every now and again it's just that livery itself absolutely spectacular exactly it's so great to see those cars out here too you don't get to see very many of them running around anymore in fact i think they're the only ones in north america running those cars i know he has about all the spares that exist for it in north america so they really put a lot of effort in this program and great to see these things not just sitting in a collection somewhere, but out there being used. And I know it's um, one of Colin's missions, too, is getting these cars out there and use these Ferraris and Maseratis. They're really passionate about their Italian sports cars at Norwood. Well, I, and I've got to agree with exactly what you said there. These are cars. They are not... They are pieces of art, let's be real. But they are art that is meant to be used. And, and seeing them on the track... That just makes you happy. But we've got to focus on what's happening on the track right there. As we take a look a little farther back in the field, we've got a little bit of a battle starting to take place. This was the fight that we saw earlier for the final podium position between McMillan and Grant. But it looks like that Porsche has got a little bit of fight to it. Yeah, and those Porsches are good on their tires. Maybe he was just taking care of his stuff, and now he's back up there to challenge. Yeah, certainly is, and a very wildly different concept of designs. One of the reasons I love GT racing so much, you're dealing with a front-engine rear-wheel drive Corvette and a rear-engine rear-wheel drive Porsche 991. Ultimately, wildly different handling cars in different characteristics, but they're racing on the track, and they're within a second of each other. Exactly, and I can tell you what, that Porsche does have some advantages. While it can wear its tires, when you get your hands straight, it puts the power down better than you can make the Corvette put its power down, because all that rear weight. Just a little tricky mid-corner with that rear engine, but really good putting the power down, and you might be seeing it as the tires go off and as this race goes on. Yeah, just able to get more grip delivered down and really push into the track. That's exactly what it is coming to here at this point. About four and a half tenths of a second, the gap between the two as they work their way around right now. Oh, little bit of a poke and a prod maybe coming down through the S's. But we've got another battle on our hands as there it is. That is Dyson ahead of Paul Menard. Yeah, this is what we were kind of expecting. It looked like his setup was really here to take advantage of that tire wear. And we've reached that point in the race where Chris probably said, okay, it's time to pull the trigger. Paul's suffering a little bit. And I've got the car to do it. I'm going. Hopefully we can see how they got by each other. But this is a little bit what I was expecting when you saw those cars roll out. A little bit of a wide run there in your shot for Chris Coffey as he tried to work his way around some lap traffic. But, yeah, Dyson able to make it run. Now, they're going to come up against Kaylee Bryson here. And normally I would say this could be advantage back to Paul Menard. But this is the last thing he wants to see because that is going to be Bryson giving Dyson the toe down the main straight. Exactly. Right now, if you're Paul Menard, you're probably just hoping for yellow. You're also calling in alligators, lizards, anything you can find, <laughs> a Komodo dragon out there so you can cool those tires off and then go re 
reattack Chris because I think if it stays green, the advantage now goes to Dyson. Well, and there we've got our first change in the Emco lap leaders. You saw it there uh, as we have one lap led in the books for Chris Dyson. The rest belonging to Paul Menard. The question here at this point is, is Dyson going to be able to streak away with it? On the last lap, he was about eight tenths of a second a lap faster than Menard. So this could be code go if you are the number 16 of Chris Dyson. Yeah, and now if you're Paul, you can't hold back either. You can't take care of the tires. You just got to go. You can't let that car get away. So you're going to try for those few desperate laps to hang on, slide the car around, do what you have to do, or hope Chris gets caught in traffic just like that. Oh, and this is that battle we were watching. This is a battle on track in front of them between McMillan and Grant. There comes Menard all over the back of that Jim Weed Ford Mustang as they come down through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. It's not going to be quite enough there for Menard to be able to get that to play as they go working their way on through. Now down through turns 11 and 12, lining up into that tricky braking zone for turn 13. Doesn't look like Menard has got it to play here at this point, but a wider line going to be able to maybe get him an advantage. Let's see if he's able to get anything to go as they come out of Mission Foods, turn 16. There's a little fall over. As we watch him come onto the main straightaway here at this point, Dyson starting to pull away, six tenths of a second, the gap. We're right there. He's still able to hang on. He's really clinging on. You've got to be driving as hard as you can now. You're probably going to start to see that Paul Menard car taking a few wiggles as he tries to keep Dyson within range and keep up the pressure. Yeah, he's going to try to keep him in pressure here at this point. And, and we still have eight laps to go in this race, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that we could see something happen here. Maybe a yellow flag. Maybe a mistake here from Dyson. There are plenty of probabilities to go. Exactly. It could even be as simple as catching lap traffic, as we saw last time. That almost swapped the lead again. So he's just hoping he catch traffic. Chris makes a mistake. You find an alligator on the track. Anything <laughs> you can to close that gap. I don't know if you can tell this, folks, but we're kind of excited about the alligator here. This is one of the more interesting things that I've ever had happen to me in racing. So we're going to keep looking here at this point, though, as Paul Menard closes back in, or at least tries to. But now he's going to get the same treatment that Dyson gave him. Dirty air coming through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. Exactly. That dirty air is even worse once your tires are used up. So it's going to be really tough for Paul to fight through that. Yeah, it certainly is. Getting onto the uh, the binders there is Menard. I noticed that car bounding a little bit more, I think, is the word to use. Yeah, and as the tires wear, actually, tires get stiffer. Oh, oh we have someone smoking. Adam Andretti, maybe? I think it is. Yes, it is. That is Adam Andretti. And smoke coming out the front of that car. He is immediately going to be pulling off into the grass rather quickly. He is definitely... And he is going to be jumping out of that car very, very quickly. Yep, there he goes. And Dreddy hopping on out of the car here at this point as we are going to more than likely have a yellow. And welcome back to MAV TV. We have a yellow flag out on track. Yellow flag out on track with just a handful of laps to go. This yellow flag is brought to you uh, because of Adam Andretti's smoke on the circuit. He is now going to be bringing it out onto the track here at this point. And red flag, red flag being displayed. Red flag being displayed out on the circuit. No, it's yellow. Excuse me. That was our uh, monitors that were being a little bit strange. Trying to figure out exactly what is happening here on the circuit. We've got multiple lights going on, but uh, certainly a, a little bit of a, a situation there as Andretti tries to put out what's ever uh, happened to the car. Yeah, that was a confusing situation with the flags there. I think our flags showed uh, yellow and our flag board showed red. So drivers doing what they're supposed to do and coming to a stop for the red flag. And I could tell you one person who might be happy with this and now that now that we know adam's okay paul menard might be happy to see this because tires will be cooling off yes they will and let's be clear here because uh for fans of uh other forms of motorsport uh, when a red flag is displayed in the trans am presented by pirelli field that means all cars on track must come to an immediate halt that is why you see cars stopped on track a 
black flag displayed means come on into pit lane. So that red flag being displayed means all cars come to a halt, and that is uh, uh, why you are seeing that out on the circuit here at this point. So cars at a halt as safety vehicles make their way out onto the circuit right now. We're hearing that that was displayed because there was a fire within the machine itself, but in that number 17, so they threw the red flag out of precaution to be able to get the safety vehicles to that number 17, 17 as quickly as possible. There we take a live look at the Burton Racing crew as well as Adam's wife down in pit lane. Obviously a heartbreaking situation here for them. Yeah, no one wants to go through that. It shows you the highs and lows of motorsport. Last race, top of the box. This race on fire sitting in the grass, so, you know, we know it can come back to them. They'll have a better day another day, but glad to see Adam out of the car right away. Not only out of the car, but helping with the firefighting effort himself. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's not uncommon to see because we have to remember here that for a lot of these these uh, drivers, they're heavily invested in their machines. It's not like they've got five, six, seven, eight, nine spares holed up in the back. This is a, a bespoke entry here for Adam Andretti. He wants to take care of that thing. And not only that, even if you do have a spare, the crew guys always appreciate you to take care of their stuff. You want to bring them back a car that's straight in shape and ready to go and put the fire out as quick as you can to make sure it just minimizes the damage because going through the car after a fire with all the wiring harnesses and all the other stuff in it really really is a mess but Adam's out okay. It's not smoking anymore, so I think they're going to be in okay shape. Yeah, it looks like it there, and, and there was some definite smoke coming out of it there at that point, so that was a very, very, very rough situation for him. And as we said, we are very, very lucky that we were able to do that, but uh, we are ready to head down to pit lane once more with Ben Sissel. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. I'm here with Tabitha Andretti, and Man, bad luck. We don't know what happened. I was up on the starter tower. He switched a gear, and then all of a sudden smoke, and then I hear fire. Do you, have you heard anything from the driver? We've heard a little bit. So he did. He said there was a puff of smoke inside the car about two laps before this happened, and then all of a sudden he said the motor's laying down on us. We looked. There was a big puff of smoke around the start-finish line, and it just kept smoking. Then he came over and said he's on fire. So obviously we kind of panicked, but we know we have a great group of people here at this track that take care of him, and we've seen him get out of the car, so he's good to go so now we just want to know what happened that's a exactly yeah because you guys are developing this car it is a very new car i'm with claudio burton here behind the car and um the car was running so strong you win last race at road atlanta and i know you're still in the development phase but what are you guys learning here at nola well it was our first time here so we're a lot all day long and every session we got faster um we don't really know what happened to the car right now adam radioed in there was a little bit of smoke so he advised us that something was awry, and um, then then it let go. So we don't really know right now. Driver's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw he's been in contact with the crew, and uh, the corner workers seem to have been able to handle it. So it's yeah, he's fine. Well, that's Claudio Burton, gentlemen. Back up to you in the booth. Well, thank you, Ben, and thank you to that whole Burton Racing team. We're very, very happy that everything is okay with them. As we come back here with live pictures from NOLA Motorsports Park, uh, you can see Adam Andrevity's car uh, holding things out. They're going to take that away, but we are going to take a quick break here at this point. We'll be back when racing action resumes. Okay, so pretend this is your race car. It's on the trailer, and you have an accident. Ouch. At least your truck's insurance will pay for another one. Yeah, not so fast. Standard insurance won't replace your race car, whether it's in the trailer, in the paddock, in the garage, or the repair shop. But at Haggerty, we can protect it for what it's really worth any time it's off the track. No matter what or where you race, offer less than a set of race tires. Haggerty, let's drive together. 
Sonoma Speed Tour returns to Sonoma Raceway April 19th through the 21st. Featuring the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli Western Championship. The Sports Car Vintage Racing Association. Historic Trans Am. The Toyo Tire 2.5 Challenge. PSSA. International GT. And Saturday, you can take part in the Haggerty Cars and Caffeine Car Show. You do not want to miss the Sonoma Speed Tour April 19th through the 21st. For tickets, simply go to speedtour.net. Welcome back, Mav TV viewers. Is there you see the remains of Adam Andretti's number 17 Chevrolet Camaro as uh, smoke and fire was reported from underneath the hood of that number 17 machine, and now it is being towed back down into pit lane. The reason for our most recent yellow flag, the second one of the day. The first was as a result of Amy Ruman and a clutch problem that saw her come to a rest just outside of of the pits looks like here at this point that most of the field has been able to refire and get themselves back together but the biggest problem well that's going to be for chris dyson and paul menard because uh what looked like it was going to be playing into chris dyson's hands now maybe back into the wheelhouse of the number three yeah the last thing you want behind you on a restart in a stock car is a guy who has a bunch of nascar cup experience with cooler tires and this red is even better for him because they got to sit and not just orbit so those tires will be nice and cool he may be able to take the fight to chris we should be in for a show if we go back green yeah as you saw your emco lap leaders there it is menard with 27 laps and uh dyson with only four here at this point but the only lap that matters is that lap at the end and who is going to lead when we get to that point that is the big question we ride on board with Tommy Dreesey. Now, normally I would say this is a great opportunity for Tommy Dreesey to be able to move his way forward. He'll be able to inherit a podium position here without question, but he's got lap cars in between himself and Menard and Dyson, so that's going to make things a little bit more difficult. Especially with our restart rules here in Trans Am, you're not allowed to pass until you reach that start-finish line. You're not even allowed to duck out of line, so when you're stuck behind some of those other classes, that can really mess you up, but they may be doing some reordering, because we had a red flag, so the field might be a little bit out of order now, so we'll see if they're going to rejigger that or not. Well, if they do, that can only be a boon here to Tommy Dreesey. And even though this may not be the best result for him on the day, third place is still valuable points in that championship. And you said it yourself earlier, it, it, championships are made on your worst days. Exactly. And sometimes just being there is enough. Like you, you have to be in contention. You have to be there. You have to finish in order to get those points. Well, it's really sad to see what happened to Adam. It's great, great to have, see he's okay and out of the car. He got to have his win. But this day will really help someone out like Tommy Dreesey, getting those points, being consistent, keeping it on the road. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what needs to happen here if Dreesey is able to capitalize and wants to be able to capitalize. He does have uh, Chris Coffey in front of him that he's going to have to deal with. Uh, as uh, it does look like that that Maserati is going to be the first car up the road if we don't have a reordering of machines, that is. That is the, uh, the question here at this point. Laps continuing to tick away right now because we are running under safety car conditions, so it's not like a dirt race. These laps will count. Looks like I just saw out of the corner of my screen there, that was the 55 of Milton Grant coming down into pit lane in that Porsche 991. It is. I wonder if that's part of a reorder or if he's just checking something because he was in a pretty pitched battle before we had this uh, red flag with um, with the Corvette of McMillan, right? So hopefully he everything will get sorted for them and he'll be out there and be able to battle again. Yeah, and as you can see there on your screen, it looks like we've got some bad news for fans of, uh, I believe, uh, that is a couple of the cars here at this point, is that is, I think, uh, McMillan actually headed down off of the, the road because it looks like he's got some problems here at this point and uh, he is going to be uh, towed out. It looks like that car just never restarted after the race. 
Yeah, these things are not endurance cars. They're not made to stop and restart. It's really stressful on these cars. It's not like a car at Le Mans that's made to be shut down. Once they're hot and they're heat soaked and they're sitting still and they don't get that cooling airflow, they really struggle to restart sometimes. Yeah, and it looks like that's exactly what it is. I can tell you that that uh, number 51 Chevrolet Corvette does look like it has ta been taken down pit lane here at this point. Or not pit lane. It's been taken on onto one of the access roads here at this point. So uh, looks like that car is going to be cleared. Uh, the question's going to be is when the lights go out on our safety car here at this point. As uh, I have just been given word that we are coming back to green this time by. All right, here we go. This is where it's going to be really important to get those tires nice and cleaned off. You're probably going to be see some swerving. Try to get all that junk that you picked up from when you stopped offline off so you can get ready and go do battle. Should be a good little show here. Yeah, it certainly should be. We're going to have, uh, I believe, five laps to decide this. It looks like it's going to be a five-lap shootout as we will restart here on lap 33 uh, if everything is to be believed, as indeed I just saw the lights officially go off on the Janetta safety car. Thanks again to Janetta for providing that for us uh, uh, for our uh, Speed Sewer weekends over the course of the year. An absolutely stellar pace car and pretty one of a kind, I've got to say. But here right now is Chris Dyson leads the field around. Now, this is going to be the first time we've seen Dyson take the restart. It's been Paul Menard pacing the field here at this point, but Dyson has always looked good off of those restart conditions. He really has. We know his car is set up for straight line traction. You can see how it reacts and how much it pitches up. But Paul's got those nice, cool tires now, just like Chris. Really helps the tire wear. Let's see if he has any tire left to give Chris a fight. All right, let's see indeed a little bit of action in front of Tommy Dreesey. As you said, though, not allowed to make that pass until they come across the start-finish stripe. Hold up in front from Chris Dyson. He's slowing the field down until he sees the green flag. As here they go on to the main straightaway, getting ready to take the green. There it goes. We are back racing once more, and it looks like here that immediately popping out of line is going to be Tommy Dracy. He's going to be able to pass Kaylee Bryce and Chris Coffey immediately insert himself back up into the battle for the top spot in TA. They run one, two, three. And you got to see Chris Dyson going ahead and protecting that line, which will give Paul a better exit. So we should be all over him heading into three, which is actually a really good passing zone. Yeah, it very well is. And now Menard going to be trying to look a little bit of a wider line coming down into the corner. Looks down to the inside, gets about a half nose in there, but Dyson covers it off well. He's going to be able to keep it about two tenths of a second, the gap in between the two. A little bit of alternate lines there being taken between Dyson and Menard as they try to get themselves back. And now they push themselves ahead. Here they come through six and seven. We ride on board with Tommy Dreesey in third. He has the best seat in the house right now. As you saw Paul Menard exiting those corners, he was putting a lot of counter steering in. He is driving the wheels off that thing right now, trying to get Chris while he's close. Yeah, he is really trying to push here at this point. He doesn't want to let Dyson skip off into the distance. Excuse me, it's now three and a half laps to go pretty much as they cross over. Remember when I said earlier, never trust a commentator's math. Uh, here is now Menard closing in on the back of Dyson. The gap only about two car lengths. Will he have a risky run down into turn 13? He thought about it, but he's going to stay in line here as they come up through the back half of the circuit. And down the straightaway, we've noticed Paul's been really good. That car seems to suck up in the draft a little bit better than Chris's did when he was behind him. But you can also get that because his nose is lower. That air, that nose picking up in the front, and Dyson, it's giving him that better tire wear. It also hurts your straight line speed a little bit. So this might help Paul get a little bit closer down the straightaway. Well, we'll have to see here as they cross over the stripe. The gap was five tenths of a second. Greasy falling off big time. He is about 2.8 seconds behind. As there we take a look at your Emco lap leaders, Chris Dyson, seven laps, Paul Menard, 27. But as we said, it's nice to lead 27 laps. It gets you bonus point, but you get the full points if you lead the last one. Let's see. Let's really watch those front tires of Paul. Paul's getting there. Let's see if he has a wiggle. Actually, really good exit. He is there. Yeah, he is there. You saw that. Look, you said turn three, maybe a little bit of an overtaking opportunity. Well, Paul may have heard you. Oh, a little bit of counter steer, though, coming out of turn five. That could slow him down a little bit. Later on the brakes, though, coming into turn six, that's a little bit surprising to me. 
Yeah, it was also, you might be two-footing. You can use both pedals at the same time to balance the car, so you might just be seeing a different driving style. Unfortunately, I don't have a foot cam on the two, so don't quite know. A little bit of wheels off for Paul. He's trying really hard. Yeah, it is very, very clear that Paul wants this win. Let's see how he's able to keep up through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's here at this point. He's going to keep close behind, call the gap about four car lengths. I really amazed here at the end of those S's. I would have thought the arrow wake would have been the worst, but he actually closes up coming well, down through 11 and 12. If you notice, he always has the headlight of his area, headlight area of his car to the inside of the Dyson car, and that helps minimize the arrow wake. It's still there, but it makes it a lot better. And you can see he got really close to the bumper there. Not quite a good exit, but he'll probably suck up in the toe down this front straightaway. And we see he's really good through one and two, so we might see some pressure into turn three once we get there. All right, let's keep our eye on this here at this point. Kaylee Bryson continues to lead in SGT and Chris Kofi, Coffee in PNGT, but this is the battle to watch right now. It is Chris Dyson and Paul Menard. Dyson in that white and pink machine. Menard in the black and green machine. Let's see if he's got anything coming down into turn three. Not quite as close as he was on the last lap, but a wide exit off at the corner there for Chris Dyson. That must have been a little bit inviting for Paul Paul Menard as they come down into turn four. It certainly was, but Dyson shuts the door. It's going to be really close. This is a hard position that Dyson's in, protecting with just a couple laps to go. Tires are done. You're done. I don't care if his tires are better. This is the hardest part of the race, being under this much pressure with this little to go. Yeah, he is pushing here at this point. Both drivers are pushing. We saw Paul Menard get two wheels off into the dirt there on the exit of turn seven last time. Almost does it this time. Maybe just a little bit of dirt kicked up. Let's see how he does through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. He's going to be pushing here at this point. This is closer than he was on the last lap, doing exactly what you were talking about earlier, just that headlight to the inside. Are we going to see a move down into 13 no but he's going to keep the pressure on and he made made dyson defend a little bit which will suck him all the way to that bumper now he really has to focus on trying to get a run out of that last corner uh, don't look at dyson just try to get your run you want to not look at your competitor just drive your line and see if you can put that power down all right, here he goes. That's the closest he's been. White flag in the air. One lap to go from NOLA Motorsports Park. The gap, four tenths of a second. Here comes Paul Menard as they push their way down. I don't think he's quite close enough to have the run into turn one. No, he's not, but we've seen him be strong into three. Can he get the move done there? Yeah, I think it's going to be three or 13 where you're going to see this happen if he can get it done. All right, let's see here at this point through the fast sweeper of turn two, down into turn three. Menard stays behind. He's close, though, almost giving him the bumper there at that point as they come down through turn three. The long left-hander now into turn four. Dyson closing the door as much as possible. He knew that Menard was close there on the last time of asking. They get the power down through five and six here at this point, starting to push down here as they go. Only about a car length the gap. This is going to be very, very tight as they come out of turn seven. Yep, it's done. No, no one's holding anything back now. Time to just hold on and drive, drive it as hard as you can. Let's see if he can stay close enough through the S's to send one last lap pass. He lost time. He lost time there through six and seven. That gap is now about five car lengths as they come down through the Bennett Bridge Hall lesses. I don't think he's going to be able to close this unless he finds an absolute turbo of a run here at this point. Diving down, getting ready to dive down into turn 13. Dyson goes defensive. That's not going to be quite enough. Enough. Menard starts to close up. We've seen him be good through the last couple of corners on this circuit before, but here he comes down through turn 15, getting ready to take Mission Foods turn 16. Has Dyson done enough? It looks like he has. He puts the power down. Checkered flag is in the air, and for the first time this season, it's Chris Dyson on the top step of the podium. What a great race we got at the end there. Great battle between two different setup philosophies, and it came down to a straight-up fight right at a little shootout at the end of the race. Great race. Absolutely fantastic, and I love what I saw there between the two. You saw the thumbs up going in between the two. Great sportsmanship, and look at this. The battle for the lead of the GT categories in different GT categories. Kaylee Bryson in SGT. Chris Coffey in GT. Coming to the line here at this point. Coffey for going for three on the trot. Bryson going for her first of the season and it looks like it's going to be a picture perfect story for both of them it's Bryson it's coffee
That definitely has to be your brightest finish of the day. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. That bright yellow and the pink off the hood there at that point, you really can't uh, can't miss those cars. Great job by both of them to bring home the class wins today. Really seller drives by both. Very, very much so. And seller drive here from Tommy Dreesey. Not taking off more than he can chew. Definitely just keeping things together. And he's going to be walking away with a podium when everything's said and done. Exactly. You have to be happy with that. Crew's going to be happy with that. They're going to take the lessons here and move on, learn, learn from what they learned, and get ready for the next track where they'll hopefully be able to challenge both Chris and Paul Menard. Yeah, and just keep building that notebook. Keep putting those things together to keep going along. But there, as we take a final look at your MCO lap leaders, Paul Menard led 27 laps. Chris Dyson was your uh, leader of 10 laps and your victor here today from NOLA Motorsports Park. Paul Menard second, Tommy Dreesey third. Kaylee Bryson was able to take that victory in the SGT category, and Chris Coffey once again taking victory in GT in his Maserati. Fantastic driving all the way around for each and every one of these drivers as we watch them come back in right now. Tommy Treacy still be a little bit aggressive there coming over the curves. He took a, a pretty big uh, hop, skip, and a jump coming over, but uh, looks like uh, Chris Dyson here taking his victory lap quite well. If you look up aggression in the thesaurus, you'll see Tommy Dreesey listed right next to it as a synonym for aggression. That dude is <laughs> aggressive. Great racing driver. Oh, he certainly is. And right now he is waiting for his first victory of the season. It's been three races. It's been three winners in the TA class presented by Pirelli. You really can't ask for a better run of championship than that. Exactly. You, have, you don't see that anywhere. It's great to have different people on the podium, different cars, different teams, new cars, Really so good start to the season. Yeah, it's an absolutely fantastic start to the season. Exactly what we want to see here at this point. As Dreesey will be able to go down into pit lane and down into Jim Weed victory lane and victory circle. He'll be able to be able to go down and get those podium celebrations. Also will Kaylee Bryson, also will Chris Coffey. Going to be very, very happy drivers, I think, down in Jim Weed's winner's circle. Always nice to drive the Jim Weed car into the Jim Weed winner's circle, too. So probably a little extra special for Chris Dyson. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly is and especially after two heartbreaking rounds I mean a DNF in Sebring and then a uh, 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 a mistake in Road Atlanta that arguably cost him victory to be able to come back here and get uh, back into his winning ways is certainly a good way to bring his way forward it's gonna raise him up in the championship a little bit and he's gonna be feeling pretty good about that it's also got one of my favorite helmet designs I have to say I, I love the simplicity of that yeah, pretty classic. That the whole team's always had nice classic designs. Even all the drivers have had through there. Like your as here he comes on out. Chris Dyson, your victor here from NOLA Motorsports Park, getting a hug down in Jim Weed Victory Lane from everybody around him. He is absolutely fantastically happy, I would have to imagine. We'll get an interview with him here in just a few moments' time. As in fact, that time is going to be now as we go down to Ben Sissel. Well, thank you so much. I'm here at Jim Weed Winter Circle as we see Paul Menard come in. Congratulate, Chris. Hold on, Paul. Stay here. Because I've, I've been watching you two, and you seem like you... I didn't win. Yeah, I know. But you guys really enjoy racing with each other, and that was by a car length. So you know how I like the awkwardness. Let's, let's talk to both of you. So, man, you're chasing him for a little bit more than half of the race, and then it flip-flopped. What a race. Yeah, I mean, uh, unbelievable, uh, great race the whole way. I mean, Paul and I have run together in the past, but never for that long, and I think it was just uh, phenomenal racing. Uh, I was able to get him in traffic there, and uh, I think it was pretty evenly matched the whole way. Uh, it's a lot about track position here. But I'm so pumped up to have the Jim Weed car back in victory lane. So happy for the guys. We've worked hard for this. It's great to be back on the top step. So proud of everybody. And, and Paul, oh, I got to say hi to the kids. Hi, guys. I love it. And then, Paul, I know you wanted to win this race, but that had to be a really fun second place. It was fun, you know. We we had good speed all weekend, and um, you know we've done three I've done three races with uh, G GT3 racing with Paul and Tony and and all the boys, and we've been fast every weekend. Um, we knew our Achilles heel is just kind of longevity, just keeping the tires on the car, and I, I felt like we made some gains from Sebring to here. 
Uh, we didn't get we didn't uh, have it play out at Atlanta, but uh, I feel like we made gains. Um, that caution helped us just cool the tires down so I could go after them again. But yeah, like like uh, like Chris said, we were evenly matched, and it was uh, whoever was out front was going to stay there until traffic came. And by about a car length, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, I was better than him through the S's. He was better than me on, on launch off uh, onto the main straight. Um, my brakes were fading, so he's a little bit better than me in the braking zones, and I'd catch him through some of the slow rollers. So uh, we, we each had our strengths and disadvantages, and it was just kind of equalized. So i got to put you on the spot. Will we see the Master Force Tools Ford Mustang at Lime Rock next? We will. We will. Um, I've never seen that. Most of these tracks I've never been to. Uh, Lime Rock, Mid Ohio, Watkins Glen with the boot. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be learning. I'm going to be burning up the uh, i racing simulator here in the next couple weeks. But yeah, we'll be at Lime Rock and excited for it. Nice, I love it. Well, Paul Menard second place in three GT. But ladies and gentlemen, if you were paying attention, I think we called it at the fan walk and said this is going to be Kaylee Bryson's first win, and here we are, your first win, and wow, that was phenomenal. Yeah, that was so much fun. You know, I kept waiting and waiting. I'm like, when's the check already going to come? I was really wanting that win. But, uh, yeah, the guys gave me a great car. You know, this LSI Corvette was on rails tonight. And excited to go get many more in the future. Nice. Well, congratulations, LSI, Sam Pierce Chevrolet, Kaylee Bryson from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. But then let's talk to the Perella Motorsports Holdings owner tony perella and tony i know you've got somebody that you really want to thank i need to recognize this guy 30 plus years of running trans am he brought it it was dead he brought it back from the dead and has put his heart and soul into this race series if it wasn't for john claggett there would be no trans am and I, it's important this weekend he's moving from doing this every weekend to an advisor role but it would be wrong if we didn't acknowledge him on this broadcast to say thank you. So, I appreciate the opportunity he gave me. Thank you. I love it. John, thank you so much. Huge mentor to me. And if you don't mind, let's go talk to um, Chris Coffey with uh, the GT winner over here with Norwood Auto Italia. I think it was a 1-2, right, with the Norwood Auto Italia. So Chris Coffey running for the championship. I believe Colin running for the Pro-Am championship. This has got to feel pretty good. Yeah, it was awesome. This track is awesome. It's uh, really good opportunities for actually racing, good passing zones, all that kind of stuff. Um, me and Colin are both running uh, full seasons. We're doing, uh, he's doing the pick six, and I'm doing the national championship. And so this is a great points weekend. Nice. And then at Michelin Raceway Road, Atlanta, Colin, you had a big off. And, you know, I know it was just a couple weeks till we were here. Seems like your crew really worked their butts off to get you back out here. Crew, crew. Chris worked his butt off to get me back here. Took him basically three days to put it back together again. And what a great job. It was a fun race, fun weekend, and I learned a lot. Nice. I love it. Well, Colin Cohen, thank you so much. And, gentlemen, I'm going to send it back up to you in the booth. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Love being able to talk to everybody as they get themselves ready for what will be a fantastic podium there at that point. Uh, we get ready to be able to take a look here, though, at the GT and SGT results here as they go. This is uh, your highlights coming on in here at this point. Good battles farther back in the field as Chris Coffey had to be able to try to make his way by the 36 here at this point. Side-by-side -side action as we saw a good battle there between uh, that was uh, McMillan and uh, uh, the 55, but it was Kaylee Bryson and Chris Coffey that absolutely dominated the field here at this point. That battle between the 55, though, the Porsche and the Chevrolet trying to duke themselves out. McMillan and Grant going back and forth and back and forth. Off of the restart, they were able to get their way ahead, and we got a near photo finish between our two GT and SGT victors. They are picture perfect as it is. It doesn't get much better than that for those two winners. No, they had a great day, and then here's our provisional classification for right now how we finished. See Chris Tyson taking the win home over Paul Menard there, and a great fight at the end. The end of that race was fantastic. 
Yeah, it really and truly was Tommy Teresi in third, and then the rest of that SGT and GT field. You can see there Bryson Coffey, Grant Cohen, Andretti Carlson, McMillan all having some rough runs out there today, as did Amy Ruman and Richard Forsyth, uh, both of whom had uh, some particularly rough runs there at that point. But uh, an absolutely fantastic race. But let's go ahead and take a look back at the T. A race recap here at this point because it was a great battle from start to finish between Chris Dyson and Paul Menard. Amy Ruman had some early troubles that saw her go off early and it was clutch problems that we later found out. Off of the restart though, Chris Dyson was in the hunt looking this way and that way, but Paul Menard was able to pace the field and keep his way ahead. Despite some looks from Dyson, Menard kept his cool and kept everything together. That was until Adam Andretti had an unexplained issue that set fire to the car and brought him off down through turns six and seven. Off of the restart, it was Chris Dyson who was able to take control of the race and take the lead away from Paul Menard. Menard tried to fight the best he could, but he just wasn't quite able to seal the deal. It was Chris Dyson taking victory. So we take another live look there at Jim Weed Winner's Circle. Absolutely fantastic. And we are now ready to go down there with Ben Sissel. All right, Nola, let's get loud. Come on now. The Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli. As I shouted, John Claggett's here. Come on, Nola, keep it going, keep it going. That was quite a show in all the classes, and you just saw some history today here at NOLA Motorsports Park with the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli. We are going to start in the GT class. Two drivers from just right over the border in Texas, Norwood Auto Italia, the two Maserati. So in second place, let's hear it, the number 38. Colin Cohen, ladies and gentlemen, get loud. And in first place, his teammate, let's hear it, Chris Coffey. Coming from the Lone Star State. And we've got some beautiful music behind us with our SVRA Group 6, Group 8, Group 10. Colin Cohen, you know, um, we were talking about a little bit, had a bad off in Atlanta. I didn't expect to see you here, and your crew worked uh, overnights and got you back. Yeah, it was hard work, and it's uh, always great when that pays off with the uh, ability to finish a race and have the fun that we have this weekend. So my thanks to Chris and to the NOLA team for making this possible, and to Jason Hart for his always clear illumination of what you shouldn't do <laughs> as much as what you should do. <laughs> So uh, thanks very much. Nice. Colin Cohen, ladies and gentlemen, and these Maseratis. Any Maserati fans out there? And then Coffee, man, nice job again. Back up on the podium here with us in Trans Am. That's got to feel good. Oh, yeah. It's always great to be standing up here at the top step. Uh, I just want to thank Colin because without here, I couldn't be here. So I absolutely had to make sure his car was ready from Road Atlanta. So... Uh, it was a lot of work. Only had three days to get it done, uh, but we did get it done. We got here. I want to thank uh, Alex and Xavier, my crew, and my wife, Morgan, and my son, Sam. Nice. I love it. Come on now. Get it out, New Orleans. Colin Cohen, Chris Coffey, NOLA Motorsports Park always provides some fantastic racing, some great weather. Hold on now. we got to do the hat dance, right, Michelle? Chris, you got you good? Okay. All right, now, NOLA, come on now. Let's pretend we're at one of these NOLA music festivals and get super loud here. Colin Cohen, Chris Coffey. Oh, there we go. Colin's got it. All right, come on now. Chris, Chris Coffey, Colin Cohen, Norwood Auto Italian Maseratis from the Dallas, Texas area. Nice job, gentlemen. And be nice. Oh, he's saying be nice. Let's see what happens. Watch out. They're talking about it. He's like, yeah, let's, let's just drink it. There we go. Nice. <laughs> See, that's the way you do it. When you're teammates, you don't really go for the eyes like that. Nice job, Colin Cohen, Chris Coffey. Hopefully we will see you two at Lime Rock Park for the Lime Rock Speed Tour Memorial Day Classic. Super GT, SGT. This was a crazy one, and like I said, some history made here. 
doing really well until that red flag, and this sometimes happens with race cars. I don't think he could get it restarted, but in third place, let's hear it. Joshua Carlson, ladies and gentlemen, SGT, doing really well in points this season. First place, Masters SGT. Second place, SGT. Let's hear it. Milton Grant from Memphis, Tennessee. Now, New Orleans, I need a warm welcome because her first win in the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli, SGT, Kaylee Bryson. How about that? A little witness to history. Josh doing really well out there and then you know just that uh, the the you, you i'm sure you shut off your car during the red flag and it just couldn't fire up what happened yeah after the first yellow car started to misfire for us the race so just had to short shift it but then when that red flag came out shut off the car and it just didn't want to start back up but um i'm so happy to be on the podium and i want to thank my parents my team uh, all my sponsors and siva dirks ltd nine round all test ecc motorsports for all the support uh, this podium would have been possible without them and uh, congrats to koe on her first win i bet that feels pretty good and uh thank you milton for letting me park under your tent and keep my car cool all weekend and uh yeah have fun this weekend nice i love it joshua carlson talking to his friends here Milton on the podium with us in Atlanta again here at NOLA. That's got to feel really good. Yeah, it does. Uh, of course, Porsches are very reliable. And, of course, as always, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for this beautiful day and this great event that we've had. And uh, another thing I'd like to say is uh, I want to thank John Claggett. He said this is the last time he was going to hand me a trophy. And uh, <laughs> I think we all ought to applaud what he's done to make this series what it is. You know. Woo! Woo! And uh, other than that, I just want to thank, you know, uh, my Mike Hoover, my crew chief. I can't say it enough. I, I hadn't said it enough, I should say, but he does a great job, reliable car, and that keeps me at the end and helps me get here. So thank you all. Nice. And, and, man, for a while you had a great race with McMillan. Kaylee Bryson, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, first time on the top step. Take the mic. This has got to feel good. Yeah, this is my first time on the podium. I'm glad to get first today for my team. You know, they've worked so hard, and, you know, there's a whole army that goes into this and making this possible, and I'm so grateful for them. The car was on rails all weekend, and I'm super happy to come out here and get first and thankful that everybody drives clean, and it was a re really fun time out there. Thank you, guys. Nice. I love it. What do you think about that? The LSI Sam Pierre Chevrolet Corvette. Noel, are you happy to be here witnessing some history? Come on now. I love it. I like this crowd, Nola. Keep it up. All right, get it loud. Come on now. Josh Carlson, Milton Grant, Kaylee Bryson, Super GT. There we go. That's the way you do it. Man, this is a good crowd. All right, Kaylee, you old enough for one of those? All right, we checked, yeah. Let's see what happens here. Oh, Milton's just going right for the staff. I love it. Come on, Noah, let's get loud. Josh Carlson, Milton Grant, Kaylee Bryson. Awesome. Aaron Pierce, Sam Pierce team, congratulations. Nice job. I know that's a lot of hard work. Congratulations to you guys. All right, T.A., the bread and butter of Trans Am, 900-ish horsepower behemoth go-karts without any driver assist this is a really tough racing and we had a great race today in third place the number eight let's hear it showtime motorsports lucas oil let's hear it for tommy treacy who's talking to paul menard not to talk out of school but i heard a rumor under that red flag Tommy Dreesey was going to try the, the undercut by coming into pit lane, changing tires, and then going back out, but they missed the exit. Is that true? Uh, no, I didn't miss the exit. They just called me in. I was already, I was just there, but it was an iffy thing. These guys were running 37s. Uh, I was, you know, I could pace Andretti. And uh, no, these guys were the class of the field today. So, and then I, I don't think they would have like rearranged the whole thing being right behind them. I had probably seven cars to pass. So we did the right thing. We're here. Thank goodness. Nice. I love it. On the podium, Tommy Dreesey. All right. This by a car length. 
I think, and unbelievable. He is our MCO lap leader. But in second place, that beautiful 3GT Master Force Tools Ford Mustang, ladies and gentlemen, the legend, Paul Menard. And then our reigning champion, our champion, the one to beat in Trans Am in this beautiful Jim Weed Ford Mustang here at Jim Weed Winter Circle. Let's hear it, Chris Dyson. You got your phone? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before we, before we even get going, Tommy Dreesy has this thing, if you follow him on social media, that he takes a Tommy Dreesy selfie. So he likes to get in there. So let's hear it for the Tommy Dreesy selfie. You need to check him out on social media. Kid friendly. Kid friendly, he says. I love it. I love it. Yeah, come on, John Claggett, get in there. John Claggett's last selfie. I love it. There we go. See, New Orleans, you're seeing all kinds of history here. All right, Dreesy, this has got to feel good. I haven't, you know, we haven't spent much time on the podium this season, but it starts today, doesn't it? It sure does. Uh, I just got to thank the crew, uh, the guys and girls on the crew. They worked so hard. Um, I gave them a little more work than they really uh, wanted to do yesterday uh, or a day before yesterday. Uh, maybe it was yesterday. Yeah. Anyway, I don't. I, it's it's good that drivers don't have a good memory uh, when you hit something. So, um, but I just want to thank everybody, uh, Lucas and Mission Foods, Trans Am. Franklin Road. Hey, Ken Twaits, I don't know where you are, team principal, but uh, thanks for running the stuff for me so I can just be a driver. But uh, the crew, Jagger, Elon, Lacey, I love you. Coming home soon. Dyson, he's been waiting for <laughs> his first two races, you know, so uh, congratulations. And uh, Menard, man, he's he's coming. And uh, the Genelosi family, 3GT, everybody on the Jim Wee team, wow. Nice. I love you. Yeah, I got them all. I think that's good. Speaking of, I heard that the most loved person in the Trans Am paddock, Paul Genelosi, is here. Where is he? First, Paul Genelosi. Come on now. We just want to say hi. Everybody loves Paul Genelosi. I got to say, Mav TV. And uh, coincidentally, me and Paul Genelosi both got speeding tickets this weekend. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Well, Paul Menard, take the mic. Tell us about your race. Yeah, fun race, fun weekend. Um, you know, just a pleasure working with, with Tony and Paul and all these guys. You know, we've they built a really fast Ford Mustang. It's been fast every race we've been to. Uh, we kind of knew our Achilles heel was uh, tire longevity, just getting to the end of the race. And we're, we've been making gains on it. We're going to keep working on that. Um, Chris is just, just too fast on the old tires before that caution. And uh, uh, we, I felt like I was better than him in some sections. He was better than me in others. And it's a, it a hell of a race. It's a lot of fun. We race clean. Uh, side by side, and um, uh, we'll continue that throughout the throughout the year. We're gonna we're gonna battle uh, till the end of the year together, and, and keep it clean, keep it safe, and be smart, but have a lot of fun and uh, be competitive. Nice, I love it. I love it, Paul Menard. Now, Chris Dyson, you got second place a couple weeks ago in Atlanta by about the same gap that you won here. This has got to feel pretty sweet. Yeah, it's more fun this way. I'll tell you that, Ben. <laughs> Uh, honestly, just a really, really terrific weekend for the whole Jim Weed team. Uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be back here standing on top of the podium and down here in NOLA. Uh, great race with Paul. I mean, the whole way through. And we knew that coming in. I think we both knew that coming in. Uh, we had big speed all weekend. And it just came down to being in the right place at the right time and having a car that can manage our tires, like Paul said. Uh, we were just phenomenal on the long runs. And... I think this is how it's going to be all the rest of the year. And, and you know, you look at the battle we had at, uh, at Atlanta with, with uh, Andretti and then, and then Paul here. You know, Tommy's right up there, too. It, it's, it's a fight every weekend. That's what makes these wins so meaningful, so special. Um, especially special for me this weekend because my wife Joy is here with me this weekend. And uh, just so happy to have her support and all the guys. This one's for you. We were down here working hard all winter. And uh, I think we've got a great car to take everywhere. And I think... Uh, you know, we've got nothing to do but win now because this guy's in the lead and he, we got to go chase him. Nice. I love it. All right, come on, New Orleans. Let's get loud. Tommy Dreesy, Paul Menard, Chris Dyson. Hold those trophies up, gentlemen. I love it. Man, New Orleans, I like this crowd. Keep it up back there. All right, hold on. Mr. Claggett, come up here. 
Let's get one picture with El Presidente right up front and center, John Claggett. Let's hear it one more time for John Claggett, the president of this whole thing. Come on now, hold those trophies up. John Claggett, Tommy Dreese, Paul Menard, Chris Dyson. This is some legends of motorsports right here. I love it. John Claggett, we are going to really miss you, man. Uh oh, watch out, John. Watch out, John. They're all of age. Oh, oh, right on the El Presidente. <laughs> All right, New Orleans, how about that? The Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli. Uh, yeah, I'm going to throw it back up to the booth as he gives out one for the homies. Lisa isn't tomorrow when I'm getting... And thank you so much, Ben Sissel, for joining us and getting the podium together. It doesn't get a whole lot better than that. We've got more racing action for you on the day as they get ready to go. But we've got highlights coming up in a few minutes here at this point. Stick with us through the weekend, though, because we've got plenty more action coming on up. Said. One of the ways you overtake here at Sebring is really good in the braking zone, like this one right here. And look at that! So both go around. There's the green. We are back and at it. Watch this! Oh, look out! Miller, look out!
Welcome back to NOLA Motorsports Park as we are kicking off the first race of the year for the Formula Regional Americas Championship. Good afternoon. My name's John Fippen. Seated alongside of me, the Jensen Motorsports driver making his debut here this weekend, Parker Wallen. Parker, welcome to NOLA, and uh, you've got to be pretty pleased with uh, the job you did this morning. Yeah, I'm very happy with how I did. Uh, could have gone a little bit better for me, but uh, I think for my first race weekend ever, it's uh, the best I could do. Yeah, indeed. There's a good look at our pole center, the 27 of Patrick Woods Toth. He is the reigning F4 champion, moving, uh, taking advantage of the scholarship to move up to the Formula Regional. We just saw the 55 of Nico Ambiato. There's Ryan Sheehan, another returning driver, the vice champion of the FR Series a year ago for Crosslink Kiwi. Alongside him, his teammate, the 31 of Titus Sherlock. Titus also had a good run last season, finishing second. He's the vice champion of FR, or F4, excuse me. And then we have the number 11 car of Cole Kleck. Cole changing teams over to the DD Autosport team. He finished 10th at the championship. He had a podium a year ago. As you can hear these engines coming to life as we're just about ready to send them out. There they go as the brand new Janetta safety car. Heads out onto the track. We'll introduce the starting grid for you. Let's go back to front. Starting alone in row number eight is car 14. Alex Benevitz out of Naples, Florida for Crosslink Kiwi. On the outside of row number seven is the 07 of Anthony Otiello out of Cranston, Rhode Island. He drives for Momentum Motorsports. Great to have Phil Picard and Momentum back in our paddock. Next to him, the 17 of Justin Garrett out of Miami, Florida for the Speed Factory. In row number six, car 77 is James Lawley out of Halifax up in Canada. He's uh, in the cart barn uh, Kart Bond Racing Team for the Atlantic Racing Team. Next to him in row six is the 24th, Kevin Jansen, the veteran in the field. Kevin jokes that he's older than the parents of most of our drivers. He's from Deerfield Beach, Florida, and he drives for Crosslink Kiwi. Up in uh, row number five on the outside, a driver who raced with us on a part-time basis back in 2018 is back in the field. Great to have Rico Schleiman from Oak Park, California for Crosslink Kiwi. Next to him, the only female in the field, car number six, Nick, uh, Nicole Verda out of Courtney, Canada. She's off with Crosslink Kiwi as well. She'll be in the commentary booth with me later on. In row number four on the outside, another returning driver, the 73 of Landon Matriano Lim from Shreveport, Louisiana. He could call this his home race for Crosslink Kiwi. Jet Bowling starts next to him in the 02 from Dallas, Texas for Crosslink Kiwi. My co-commentator for the first race will start in the sixth position outside of row three, the 22 of Hayden Bowlesby from just up the road in Folsom, Louisiana for IGY6 Motorsports. Next to him, the number 11 of Cole Kleck out of San Antonio, Texas for the new DD Auto Sport team. Uh, we saw uh, in the uh, pre-race the car of Titus Sherlock, the number 31 out of Prosper, Texas. He drives for Crosslink Kiwi. As I mentioned, Titus, the vice champion of the F4 championship a year ago. Next to him is the vice champion of the FR series a year ago, Ryan Sheehan. He was in the hunt for the championship right up to the last race weekend from Horseshoe Bay, Texas. That's uh, near Austin. He also drives for Crosslink Kiwi. Starting in the front row on the outside, car number 55, Nico Ambiato from Davenport, Florida. Nico drives for the new Velox USA team and your pole sitter and the reigning F4 US champion Patrick Woods Toth from Salazar, Quebec up in Canada. The number 27 drives for Crosslink Kiwi and he took the pole position by just about half a second with a lap of 133.648. Of course, both of our classes here run with a Formula One style standing start. Start boxes are laid out here on the front straightaway here at NOLA. And these drivers will come to a stop in their uh, aligned grid positions. And then we have a five light gantry, just like they use in Formula One. Those five lights, will, once the field is set, will be illuminated at one second intervals. And then uh, after a random amount of time expires, those five lights go out and that's the signal to get away. Parker, welcome to the commentary booth. Thank um, you. I, I complimented you on your race. You got it got uh, tapped into a spin and, and uh, involved in an incident that brought out a, uh, a safety car. But uh, on the recovery, you went from 12th to 7th by the end of the race. Great recovery drive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, pretty tough. But um, for my first race ever, I am very happy with it. Um, going off the start, you know, everyone gets lined up. you got to stay that six feet away so just in case you don't get that penalty yep. of a uh, jump start, which I saw some drivers did. Yep. 
Yeah, there was one, there was one driver that was penalized from uh, this morning's race for uh, uh, getting an unfair advantage, basically, but it was deemed that there was no uh, competitive advantage uh, made, so he was only penalized five grid positions as opposed to more than that. But uh, he'll recover from that, no worries at all. That's true, yes. And uh, you'll see the drivers coming up to grid now, and everyone's going to be pushing hard with the uh, little bit colder tires with only an outlap, but uh, everyone has those fresh softs on. So you'll see a lot of action into turn one, uh, turn two, three, four. Uh, going on, I'm guessing, the first five laps, there's going to be a lot to watch. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, just, it was the same with your race this morning. These these cars, of course, with just a tad more horsepower under the driver's right foot, so they've got to be really cautious about wheel spin coming off the line. Uh, with the uh, the F4 car, you could pretty much, you know, mat the throttle and, and, and dump the clutch. These That's guys right. have to be a little more judicious or they'll get, uh, get a lot of wheel spin. And there they go. We are away. And it looks like Woods Toth is going to get a good start. And slotting in right behind him is Nico Ambiato, but look at Ryan Sheehan in the 66. He's uh, juking back and forth, trying to make a move, and steaming up the inside is Cole Kleck. And he's going to try to take over third, Sheehan being just a little more cautious, and I think that's a good thing to do here in the early running. But it is our pole sitter, Patrick Woods-Toth, out in front with Nico Ambiato running in second, heading down toward turn number three, sort of back-to-back -back horseshoes or keyhole sort of turns. But uh, it's nice because if you get on the outside of one turn, that puts you on the inside of this one, which is turn number four. And that leads the drivers down toward turn five. This next section is really a bit tricky. they got to be careful here. If uh, someone dies on the inside, they might get tapped, go wide, and that might end their race. Turn six has really been the Achilles heel for a lot of these drivers, and that's where they are right now. It's easy to get a little wide and off into that gravel trap, and that is something you don't want to do. There are stewards around the track monitoring track limits, and they'll keep a close eye to make sure these drivers keep it on the the black part and not to get off two, uh, all four wheels off onto those uh, curbings, the red and white curbing. You can certainly put uh, two wheels up there, but you can't get all four off or there'll be a penalty assessed. Looks like our... First place, first, second, and third place battle is a good one as they're working their way through turn 14 now for the first time. And it is the 11 at the front. Cole Kleck has been able to take over the lead. That puts Patrick Woods Toth back into second spot. And then right behind him, Ryan Sheehan. Kleck is diving over to the inside trying to break the draft just a little bit, but it's still early days. We've got 28 minutes yet to go. Nico Ambiato looking to try to retake that second spot. And then behind him, the 31 car of Titus Sherlock. There's the six of Nicole Haverda. And the 0-2 is off the pace. Into the pits already. Jet Bowling. Oh, oh he's got a, he's got oh, a, a that's punctured a, tire. That's a puncture. Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether he got tapped by somebody or maybe ran off course. But that, uh, and we got another one. The 73 has got a problem with the left front tire. So That's a full course caution. Yeah, landed Matriano Lim with a problem on the front of that car. So I'm guessing those two probably tapped left front to right rear, I'm guessing. Uh, we didn't see that incident, but uh, that flattened both those tires. And let's see, they have not dispatched the safety car just yet. So if there isn't any rubber debris on the, uh, on the course, they might let them run. And we are back racing now. So that's good to see. And out in front with a pretty comfortable lead is Cole Kleck in that number 11. He's built up a big margin here, so Cole getting away in the DD Autosport number 11. It's very important in the early stages of the race to build as the biggest gap you can uh, during the end of the stages of the race when your tires start to fall off. Very important to uh, build that gap. We've got a car in the gravel. I'm st I can't tell, tell for sure I didn't see the number on the car. 77. Thank you so much. That's James Lawley in the Atlantic Racing Team number 77. He is stuck in the gravel trap, and that could indeed bring out a yellow flag, and it has done so. The safety car pulls out of the pit lane and picks up the field. So our first safety car period of this young race comes after the 77 car of James Lawley stuck in the, in the uh, gravel trap. For the whole grid, safety car always a good, uh, good little pre-race or, sorry, mid-race. Go ahead. Safety car, always a good mid-race uh, thing to settle down. Uh, cars can cool down. Cars can, um, you know, regain their uh, their spots. Uh, always 
easy to pull away once on the safety car restart, as we've seen in uh, other races. Let's take a moment here. We'll thank some of the sponsors that make the racing possible here for us on MAV-TV. Uh, so uh, let's take a break, and we'll be back with you with the restart. Okay, so pretend this is your race car. It's on the trailer, and you have an accident. Any tips? Ouch. At least your truck's insurance will pay for another one. Yeah, not so fast. Standard insurance won't replace your race car, whether it's in the trailer, in the paddock, in the garage, or the repair shop. But at Haggerty, we can protect it for what it's really worth any time it's off the track. No matter what or where you race, offer less than a set of race tires. Haggerty, let's drive together. The Sonoma Speed Tour returns to Sonoma Raceway April 19th through the 21st. Featuring the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli Western Championship. The Sports Car Vintage Racing Association. Historic Trans Am. The Toyo Tire 25 Challenge. PSSA. International GT. And Saturday, you can take part in the Haggerty Cars and Caffeine Car Show. You do not want to miss the Sonoma Speed Tour April 19th through the 21st. For tickets, simply go to speedtour.net. And welcome back to NOLA Motorsports Park as we have a car stuck in the gravel trap. The number 77 of James Lawley from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Put the Atlantic Racing Team number 77 in the gravel. You can see the corner workers, the safety workers on the scene, and they'll get that car winched out. He'll probably be able to continue under his own power, but sadly he will go a lap down with that. These gravel traps do their job. If you get off, they're there to uh, deaccelerate the car so you don't run into anything that doesn't give. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Let's do a quick rundown of the order because there's been some shuffling from how we qualified. Cole Kleck is your leader. Patrick Woodstoth, the pole sitter, running in second. Nico Ambiato, who started second, back to third. Titus Sherlock in fourth. Ryan Sheehan shuffled back to fifth. Then we've got Hayden Bowlesby in sixth. Nicola Verda in the number six car is seventh. Rico Schliemann having a good run. Uh, he's picked up several spots. He started 10th, currently running eighth. Alex Benevitz started at the back, and he's already up to ninth. So watch for that number 14. Kevin Jansen, uh, one of two drivers vying for the Masters Cup here. Kevin, uh, that's for drivers over the age of 35, by the way. Kevin is currently in 10th in the final points peg position. Justin Garrett in the 17 is 11th. Anthony Autilio in the number 07, making his debut. He's the other Masters driver, running 12th. Landon Matriano Lim with the flat tire uh, is not on the lead lap unless he's been able to catch up. Yeah, here he comes. So we may be able to get Landon at the tail end of the lead lap before we get the restart. Same with Jet Bowling. They both had flat tires. And uh, James Lawley is the car who brought out this full course yellow with his trip into the gravel trap. Getting a good look at our leader Cole Kleck who started all the way back in fifth position and he has just really barged his way forward. I Barged is really too strong a word. He's certainly done it cleanly but uh, that's a great start for uh, Cole Kleck, the, the Texan. As Landon Matreon Olim does come by, he is on the lead lap, and uh, he's going to hustle to catch up. So he should be at the back of the queue by the time we get the restart. We have so far not seen uh, Jet Bowling come back out on track, so he may have retired. Depends on how much damage, if any, was done to the rear suspension of that car, but uh, the uh, tire was completely gone, so it wasn't just a carcass. It was uh, completely out of the way. I can see the safety car beginning to accelerate away from the field, so I think we're pretty close to a restart. The safety uh, workers getting their cars back into position. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the uh, 77 car after being extracted from the gravel trap, making his way back to try to catch up if we get the restart this time by still haven't heard from race control if we're going to go restart this time by and if that's the case or they may go around one more time to make sure the safety teams has enough time to get back into their position it looks like they have lights are still on on the safety car usually they would be out by now so i think we're probably going to go around one more time and that's going to be good news for jet bowling that'll let him catch up And hopefully he'll still be able to stay on the lead lap. And there he comes, flashing by the line. And he's still being scored a lap down. So it looks like he had lost a lap. Didn't get out of the pit lane quite fast enough. 
So we'll go around one more time behind the safety car. Parker, most of your racing up to now has been karting. I know you karted in your native Minnesota, but also in California and Texas. Uh, how have you found the transition from uh, a go-kart to this kind of car? That's true. Yeah, I did race out in uh, Texas and California, but um, this, this kind of racing is so much better. So much better. Uh, the cars are a lot faster. The community is amazing. Yeah. I've had so many people willing to help and uh, support me through moving up from karting. Yeah. But also, there comes a factor. It's a lot more competitive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people can capitalize on your mistakes uh, so much more in this league compared to karting. Um, with karting, it's all about you know who who can send it in the corner the best, who right. can uh, who can drive the fastest. Now it's all about strategy and um, how consistent you can be. Uh, which I think is amazing. It's uh, so much fun. Yeah, and the the other thing, everybody's in equal equipment. In in go karting, of course, uh, there are folks who can throw a lot of money at it and uh, and get the uh, unfair advantage, for want of a better term. But here, everybody's in the same equipment, and it's really up to the driver and the team to maximize what that uh, equipment has to offer. That's true. That's true. And we'll uh, we'll see the whole field here. And just uh, just a reminder, everyone's on exact equal terms yep equal terms it's the equal cars there is no uh, uh no ability of, of anybody to to modify the car you can't throw money at it and get you know trick parts to make the car go faster the engines are all sealed it's all to, it's all uh, done to make it really a showcase for the driver and the team and uh, that's what we love to see in these entry level uh, series it really gives you a chance to hone your racecraft close quarters racing uh, throughout much of the field we've seen so far this uh this uh, series and right. uh, this is the start of uh, for for the uh, FR championship. We started in uh, 2018, so this is the start of our seventh year. The beautiful new Janetta safety car, James Rogerson at the helm. He's been our safety car driver for many years. James, a pretty good racer in his own right, down in Texas, does a lot of vintage racing as uh, well as SCCA racing. He's been at the runoffs many times. In fact, uh, he, his son, and his grandson all competed in B-Spec at the runoffs two years ago. So that was, a, that was a nice thing that you don't often see. We are going back to green. The safety car has pulled into the pit lane. Cole Kleck brings the field around. He's permitted to accelerate any time past just about here. And we're just waiting for him to drop the hammer, he does. The green flag is already in the hand of the starter. Kleck is gonna weave a little bit to see if he can break the draft. Patrick Woods-Toth and Nico Ambiato stay right in his wheel tracks, getting the advantage. Woods-Toth looks like he's got a run. He tries to pop to the inside, thinks better of it. Titus Sherlock right behind him, then Ryan Sheehan. Cole Kleck on colder tires. After a couple laps behind the safety car, you got to build the heat back up. Do you find, Parker, that they, they reheat pretty quickly, or do you, do you really need half a lap or so to get them back up to temperature? It takes half a lap, even more than half a lap. Uh, it's crazy how much the tires can cool down, even by slowing down. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Oh, we have another spinner. The 73 is going around. Landon Matriano Lem. Landon's having a terrible day. He got uh, got tagged and had a, a flat tire, and now he has spun it, and it looks like he is stuck. I believe that's him uh, right there at the exit of turn two, just at the entrance to uh, turn three. In fact, I think there may be two cars involved. I think that's Landon up there just at the turn-in point for turn number three. That is two cars out, I believe. We will deploy the safety car here. Yeah, I'm guessing that's the case. Uh, so far, that decision has not been made. We'll wait to see if our race director feels that's necessary. I think he's going to give those drivers a chance to go under their own power, but sadly, that's not the case as the safety car has been dispatched for the second time in this race. It's interesting. Uh, usually for our first race of the season, the F4 drivers, being younger and uh, maybe not as experienced, usually... Uh, have a little more trouble getting up to speed, getting uh, getting accustomed to it. These drivers, in theory at least, are more experienced and have, uh, have done a, a lot of racing, and so you sort of expect that they are a little better at minding their P's and Q's, but I think uh, the enthusiasm of the moment has caught some of these guys out. That's true, that's true. With the first race of the season, everyone's very antsy to, uh, of course, win and of course. Uh, go yeah. fast. Yeah, so. yeah. That might change things on you know how aggressive people are into the turns. Yep. Um, 
and everything. It is a timed race. We don't count laps. We only count time. And uh, we are 13 minutes into this one with about 16 minutes remaining. We have a 40-minute window to get 30 minutes of racing in, basically. So uh, if we don't have another yellow, I think we'll probably get uh, the full 30 minutes in. But it's possible to have that foreshortened if we can't get the race done in 30 minutes. So everybody's going to slow down one more time. We know it's Landon. We, we saw his car. The, and the other car involved, I can't tell you right at the moment. There's Landon's car, the 73, out of the Crosslink Kiwi stable. I'm sure Landon was hoping to do well here because uh, he's a local driver from Shreveport, just graduated from LSU. And uh, Landon was the winner of the Omologato Perfectly Timed Pass Award at the uh, awards banquet at the end of last season. He... Uh, made up the most positions from his qualifying position to his uh, race finishing position over the course of the season, made up 64 spots over the course of the year. And that award was given to him, and he had no idea that it was coming. Uh, we, we make those announcements at the awards banquet, and he was uh, gobsmacked, to say the best. To say the best. But nonetheless, uh, so Landon not having the start to his Formula Regional career that he had hoped for. But he's a resilient kid. He'll bounce back, no question about it. I shouldn't say kid. He's 22 years old. He's, he's, he's a senior citizen compared to a lot of these drivers. <laughs> Jet Bowling, by the way, did get back on the lead lap. So this is a blessing for him because he was well behind at the restart. So this will give him a chance to uh, pack up. So we've got all 15 cars on the lead lap now. We're going to go around at least one more time. In fact, we're, uh, the uh, race director, Scott Goodyear, has declared a red flag. Basically, what that means is the safety car will come into the pit lane, the field will follow them, and uh, the clock stops under a red flag. That's the reason for doing it, basically, so that we don't uh, eat up all the time behind the safety car. And especially if the recovery is going to take a little extra time. The other car involved is the 24 of Kevin Jansen. Kevin has raced with us for several years. In fact, this is his fourth year of competition. He finished 14th in the championship a year ago. He had 10 top 10s, although he uh, currently lives in Deerfield Beach, Florida. He was born in Canada and was a member of the Labatt Blue uh, amateur hockey team. They were U.S. national champs from 2019 through 2022. He's also a tennis and backcountry skiing enthusiast. Interestingly, uh, Anthony Otilio, who's the uh, other driver vying for the Masters Cup this year, also is an avid athlete. He's a competitive cyclist as well as a skier. He's raced in SCCA competition in Formula B, Formula 1000, which is a, a light, very nimble single-seater race car. These cars are a bit heavier because of the FIA requirement that they, they meet a minimum safety requirement. So there are those that have come to this series or the F4 series uh, from other forms of open wheel racing. I think, wow, these cars are really heavy. Well, the reason is they have to be safe. And uh, the FIA is very stringent about uh, the crush, crash stru crush structures. I can say it. Uh, uh, front and rear as well as the side impact structures. And all that adds mass to the car. So they're not as light as they could be. But uh, nonetheless, they're fun. I was talking to K uh, Hayden Bowlesby. He started with us in the uh, the F4 car, and he said, uh, when you jump into this FR car, it's like uh, uh, the, the hyperspace shot you see in the Star Wars movies. It is just so much faster. Everything comes at you so much faster because uh, these cars have twice the horsepower, a whole lot more downforce, uh, a little wider tire. It's just uh, it's an F4 car on steroids. So have a good season, and uh, you'll be in one of these cars next year. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really a goal, uh, moving up the ranks, Formula 4, Formula 3, or in this case, Formula Regionals. Yep. And then Which is a Formula 3 car. It's it called is. Formula Regional just because that's how the, the FIA structures it. That's true. And then Formula 2, and yep. then, you know, every driver dreams of driving in Formula 1. The top step of the ladder. That's where everybody hopes to get to. It's uh, not easy to do, but, uh, you know, with Andretti trying to get a, a slot, 
in the uh, in the Formula One World Championship. He's got some politics to work his way through. I'm a big follower of Formula One, and uh, I think Michael Andretti deserves a slot in that championship. And he's made it clear that he wants to get American drivers involved. In fact, uh, they've already opened their new uh, facility in England at Silverstone, and uh, he's uh, made an announcement just this week that he's going to field an F3 and an F2 team uh, because he wants that that ladder series. He wants to be able to bring drivers over from the U.S. and uh, get them into into the the uh, the running for a seat. We haven't had an American in uh, in Formula One for quite some time, and uh, it would be great to see, especially since we now have three Formula One races in this country now. <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that again, shall That's we? True. Yep. Yep. Absolutely right. During these red flag periods, uh, the crews are not permitted to work on the car. They can provide uh, what is called in the in the uh, specification driver comfort. They can uh, put an umbrella over the driver, offer him water, him or her, uh, uh, just to be comfortable. But uh, there is no work permitted on the cars. They can't even take tire pressures under these red flag situations. So they have to uh, stand aside, basically keep their driver cool, and wait for the recovery work to conclude. I'll say in these uh, this heat, it is very important to uh, have the umbrella and have the water. Otherwise, you'll overheat. With all the fire protectant you have on, you'll see drivers opening their masks. They want air on yep. their face. They want uh, they want the cool air. They want to cool down so they can focus up on the driving and not stress out about overheating. Yeah, exactly right. Kevin Jansen coming in behind uh, the one of the safety vehicles and. The other car, uh, unfortunately, on a tilt bed, not able to be towed in. But it looks like the incident is clear. We'll see if there's any track cleanup going on. I don't see anybody down in that section of the racetrack. Scott Goodyear right here in front of us uh, inspecting the recovery work to be sure the track is in good shape before he makes the decision to send him out for the restart. This will be a single file restart. The safety car will bring the field around. The The clock will start. The safety car will bring the field around for... A single file restart, and hopefully we'll get the rest of this 14, rest uh, about half of this race still to go. We had two early, uh, early uh, safety car periods in the F4 race, and this one is the same thing. So, okay, guys, everybody, calm down. Let's get through. Let's get to the end here. This is a shot of Anthony Otelio in the the zero seven car. Let's hear the team members uh, talking to their drivers. See if there's anything they need. As far as another a sip of water, do you have it? Do you have a drink bottle in the car? Uh, I just when they hand me water, I'll take it. Of got course, it, got but, it. But uh, yeah, yeah. There's not a button on the steering wheel that you can push and uh, get no, yourself a drink. I wish not in these <laughs> Formula Four cars. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They don't uh, don't quite have that uh, level of sophistication because that adds weight and complexity to the car, and they try to keep that from. Uh, being a problem again these are these are designed as a ladder series they're designed for youngsters uh in this case as young as 16 years of age the minimum age for the fr series uh, it's 15 for the uh the fia f4 series the f4 us championship and then it's 14 for the series that you're competing in uh in the uh jsf4 championship which is making its debut here this weekend we're all looking forward to our next race meeting up at uh road america one of the heroic racetracks in this country. And uh, we'll uh, kick off the season for the uh, F4 U.S. Championship with the new JSF4 chassis. We unveiled that car at the, the, that race up at Road America a year ago, uh, the first time anybody had seen it outside of the Liger factory. And uh, it's fitting that we start the, uh, start the race series a year after that unveiling, and that's the plan as it stands right now. These drivers will be going to seven different venues. Uh, we're going to, to uh, Mid Ohio, which is my home track. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, Indianapolis track. Motor Speedway. Uh, first time for these cars at, at uh, Indianapolis uh, on the road course, of course, not on the oval. Uh, the uh, FR cars raced at Indianapolis uh, several years ago. Uh, we're also uh, going up to uh, Canadian Tire Motorsports Park, the track formerly known as Mosport, and. Uh, the FR, uh, F4 cars, once again, have raced there uh, previously, but the FR cars have not. So a couple uh, brand-new venues for this class of cars, and we're looking forward to adding them to our regular stable 
New Jersey Motorsports Park, of course. Uh, and, of course, we round out the season at uh, Circuit of the Americas, uh, hoping to get back to the uh, to the opportunity to race alongside Formula One. We have done that on three occasions where we were the one of the support races for the Formula One race at Austin. And uh, that is just Unbelievable, <laughs> I must tell crazy, you. Yes. Yeah, it's unbelievable, and so we're looking forward to uh, getting back to that opportunity. Uh, that's a negotiation between uh, the, the folks that run this series as well as uh, the folks at Formula One to make that uh, kind of thing happen. But we're uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that we can get back to that with at least one of these classes, perhaps both. So just to recap, Cole Kleck is your leader. Patrick Woods-Toth, the reigning F4 champion, in second. Nico Ambiato in third. Titus Sherlock in fourth. Ryan Sheehan, the vice champion of this uh, championship a year ago, is fifth. Hayden Bowlesby hanging right in there in sixth. Nicola Verda in seventh. Alex Benevitz in eighth. Justin Garrett in ninth. Rico Schleiman in tenth in the final points paying position. Anthony Ottilio is in the 11th spot. Kevin Jansen will be at the back. Landon Matriona Lim will be at the back. James Lawley and Jet Bowling round out the field. So we're showing, as, as of this moment, so we've got four cars a lap down, and it looks like two of those may not be able to continue. The safety vehicles seem to be heading back to their staging area, which would indicate that the cleanup has just about concluded. As the flatbed is coming counter race, and I don't know if he's got yet another damaged car aboard. Looks like he does. And it looks yes. like, yeah, there's another another car involved in that schlamazel. And they're going to pull off so that we can get back underway. That's uh, Matriano Lim's car, so he will not be able to rejoin. We saw uh, Landon pounding on the steering wheel after he got together with another car and knocked himself out. So, Yeah, he was not happy, which I 100% <laughs> understand. Yeah, especially of... when it's not your fault. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, you can uh, you know, attest to that, as that's what happened to you. You got tapped in the rear and, yeah. and with, spun. But the amount of time and effort these drivers put into the races, it uh, all feelings are on the table. Yeah, 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 exactly right. And especially the first race of the weekend, you don't quite know what to expect, and everybody's kind of feeling each other out. That's but, true. Uh, you know, it's a learning experience. You got two more races this weekend, and you know, in this in this case, we got 18 races throughout the course of the year. So there's plenty of time to recover. If you have a, a first weekend that doesn't go the way you want, it's not a problem. You've still got a chance. And the Janetta safety car rolls away with the field in tow, and we are one lap away from a restart here. The clock now begins to run. Like I say, we're just past half distance with about 14 minutes remaining. I'm guessing it'll be about 10 minutes when we get back to the green flag. It takes about four minutes or so to get around the track behind the safety car. And you'll see uh, cars weaving across the track, trying to warm their tires as best as they can, uh, get them up to the optimum temps yeah, before going green. They also pick up a little, you pick up a little debris when you're running around behind the safety car, so everybody wants to get the tires cleaned off and warmed up. And it looks like the 0-2 of Jet Bowling will be the last car running. And he is shown a lap down, as is Benevitz, Lawley, and, and uh, Bowling. When they come by the line after the restart, they may get on the tail end of the lead lap, but we'll sort that. But there's your leader, Cole Kleck, in the number 11. With the new DD Autosport team. He had a podium a year ago, uh, finished third at uh, Circuit of the Americas at the final race. He raced with us uh, for two seasons in F4 as well. He finished 16th in 2022 and 28th in the championship last year in a partial season. In fact, he started the championship last year in the F4 series and then uh, changed teams and moved up to the FR series for the second half of the season in preparation for a full season in, in FR this year. And he's uh, put it to good use after qualifying inside of row three. He finds himself at the top with an aggressive first stint. So we'll see if he can make it happen. But that driver behind him, the 27 of Patrick Woods-Toth, 
a very measured driver. I mean, he won the championship last year, and he only won only won four races, uh, but he was on the podium ten others. So, fourteen races out of the eighteen, he was either first, second, or third, and uh, that kind of consistency wins championships. And uh, you know, Patrick was is not the kind of driver that uh, throws caution to the wind and you know win at any cost. He knows, uh, hey, if if I've got a second place card uh, today, that's what we'll take. You know, and uh, that's uh, exactly the kind of maturity that we. Uh, look for uh, you know Patrick is a bit older he's 20 uh, than some of the, some of the drivers but like I say he came into this championship a year ago into the F4 championship as the winner of the Radford Racing School scholarship uh, he was the protege of Ron Fellows uh, up in uh, Canada he's a native of Quebec and uh, had great success he was a you know Canadian national champion Carter and came into uh, the series last year for the first time not really expecting to do anything. He thought, yeah, I'll race go-karts for another year. But uh, he won the Radford Scholarship and took the opportunity to race in our class. And lo and behold, he is now a champion. So he's going to try to make it a back-to-back deal here this this season. But I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't do anything strange here. He'll do his best as we are back underway. Good battle for fourth place. This car is going too wide as the 31 of Titus Sherlock trying to hold off Ryan Sheehan. They are teammates. And right behind them, we can see the six car of Nicola Verda as she's working her way. Justin Garrett, Rico Schleeman also in the battle as they work their way into turn number three. See Titus Sherlock doing battle just behind him is Ryan Sheehan in the 66. And then the 22 car of Hayden Bowlesby. Hayden was in the commentary booth with me for the F4 car. Now they're coming down into turn number five and then through that very tricky turn six and seven into the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. Starting at turn eight as Titus getting a little bit wide, dropping a wheel off, kicking up a little dust. Again, that turn six is a tricky one, and that's exactly where he went a little bit wide. Have you found turn six to be troublesome? I know Scott Goodyear, the race director, has, you know, harped on all the drivers about uh, staying out of the gravel trap at turn six. Yeah, he has, and turn six is a very hard one. For me, I yeah. think the hardest on the track. Yeah, yeah. The throttle control with the different cars you have to take, and it really depends on the track. Sure. How good the track is yep. in that corner. Yep. Uh, which can change. Uh, with weather and the amount of uh, grip on the track. Yeah, and if, you know, if, if everybody drops a wheel off, it brings debris up on the track, and you've got no grip at all. So. That's true, that's true, which I found a lot during my last race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, here we go. With a little under 10 minutes remaining, no change at the front. Cole Kleck sets the fast lap of the race, a 135.470. The pole position was a 133.6. So considering that this was... The first lap after the restart, that's a pretty uh, pretty stout pace. Patrick Woods Toth, just about three quarters of a second slower on that last lap. And there's a good look at Titus Sherlock in the 31 machine, currently running fourth for Crosslink Kiwi. And then the 22 of Hayden Bowlesby. Hayden, the local driver from Folsom, Louisiana, told me that uh, they're going to get a second FR car. That's going to be a four-car team here before the season gets too much uh, older, and that's great news for that. I can remember when Hayden first started out. I mean, he's raced with us since 2019. When they first started out, it was just he and his dad. And, uh, you know, they've gradually uh, grown that team. And uh, Clark Bowlesby, his father, is the uh, team principal. And so they're very involved in Veterans Affairs, and uh, Save 22 is their uh, charitable organization that they spend a lot of time with so tip of the hat to Hayden and all the hard work he's done and uh, he was looking forward to a good race here he said uh, tire conservation there's a new compound on the Michelin uh, Michelin the Huncook tires this year and uh, it's a little more uh, soft wears a little bit more and so uh, you know his plan all through uh, practice and qualify, or qualifying, obviously they start with new tires and qualifying. His plan was to uh, conserve the tire so he's got something to run with when they get into race mode. And it uh, looks like he is going to do just that. He is right on the rear wing of Ryan Sheehan. So we'll see if Bowlesby's strategy is going to play pay benefits here in this final eight minutes or so. Kleck resets the fast lap of the race, a 35-2 now. 
But Patrick Woods-Toth has just about matched that, a 35-3 for the reigning F4 champion. And so we keep an eye on the Louisiana native, Hayden Bowlesby. As Cole Kleck is trying to check out, he's about a second in front of the rest of the field. And then uh, Nico Ampliato is another second and a half back. Titus Sherlock, another two seconds behind him. And then this three-car battle between Sherlock, Ryan Sheehan, and Hayden Bowlesby is the closest battle on the racetrack. It's less than a second between Sherlock and Sheehan and uh, about four-tenths of a second back to Hayden. You can see Hayden taking a little wider line through the S's, see if he could find a way around Ryan Sheehan. The car stepping out on him just a little bit. Down into turn 13, that's another good passing opportunity at the tail end of the Bennett Bridge Hall S's. Right off the S's, a big braking zone, easy to uh, dive up the inside or if anything, go on the outside for those slow sets of corners before the back straight. Yeah, because you know 14 is a, is a left-hander, obviously, so if you, if you can stick around the outside at 13, you've got the inside line going into 14. It's true. So that's the kind of strategy that every driver tries to play and learning racecraft is what it's all about i mean it's it's one thing to go fast when you're on the track by yourself but it's quite different to go uh, go fast when you've got other competitors all around you that's why drivers have to study their notes and uh practice because you can you can take the right line around the track and that'll give you a, that'll give you a good time but yeah. uh battling with other drivers that's where the true skill comes in exactly right have you spent any time uh, 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 studying data and that sort of thing i mean that's a new a new skill that you have to learn when you get into this class of racing that's true yeah we uh we take the data from the cars and we go over it and i uh take notes on that and it's it's very important to uh learn from your mistakes first and uh and see how you can improve yeah find and, the problem and compare yourself to your teammates for instance that's true see, yeah. see how that goes so Kind of settled in here as we keep an eye on this three-car battle. The leaders have begun to get away just a little bit more as now in front of uh, Titus Sherlock is almost five seconds to the leader, Cole Click with over a second lead. As we dip back just a little deeper, this is the 17 of Justin Garrett and diving to the inside in recovery mode is the 0-2 of Jet Bowling as Bowling is trying to work his way back forward. He is right behind Garrett now, so that will move him up a spot into 10th. Again, points are only scored for your finishing position. There are no bonus points for leading the most laps or fast lap of the race. It's strictly finishing position. So Jet Bowling is trying to get himself into the top 10. See the number two here, trying to use the draft, go around the outside here. A great not. spot for overtaking as he just does not get it done. Oh, he yeah, yeah, yeah he did. <laughs> oh, he does. He, he does. He Around. does the uh, the over under, if you will. And it looks like the 17 of Garrett maybe left the braking a little bit too late, and that allowed Jet to get down to the inside of him. So he moves up another spot. Back to the front we go as Cole Cleck, as you can see all by himself with about four minutes to go. This is his race to lose for sure. As uh, he's maintained a pretty consistent one second, just a little more. Then uh, Nico Ambiato dropping back behind the second place runner, Patrick Woods-Toth. He's about two and a half seconds behind Patrick. And then Titus Sherlock, another three seconds behind him. But Nico Ambiato, who we're riding with right now in the 55 car. Nico out of Santiago, Chile for the new Velox USA team. He raced with us in a partial season a year ago, finishing 37th in the championship. He has multiple karting titles in his native South America. As we turn our attention back to the front, good battle at the front. Nico Ambiato at third is kind of in, a, in the rocking chair, we call it. He's got room in front and behind. He just needs to hit his marks and get this car to the finish as we're down to about three minutes remaining doesn't look like he's got the pace to run down those guys in front of him. Although his best lap is only about half a second off of Patrick Woodstoff. As we look at the fast laps of the race, Cole Click has the fastest, Woodstock second, Ambiato third, pretty much the way they're running on the track. So Nico's doing a good job. He is on the box as it runs right now. 
He started in second, gave up a spot to uh, Cole Kleck, as we mentioned. Cole got around both himself and our pole sitter. Speaking of which, there is Patrick Woodstock in the number 27 car. It's interesting, in, in years past, we've had some drivers who have had no trouble making the transition from the F4 car to the FR car, but we had one champion, uh, Josh Carr is his name, and he was uh, you know, all conquering in the F4 car, but just never got to grips with the FR car. He just wasn't as successful in the FR car, and it requires a very different driving style. Uh, because of the turbocharged motor, there's some lag to contend with, and uh, you know it's got a lot more downforce, so it requires a little different hand as the white flag is in the hand of the starter. And we are headed for our final lap here as the leader is coming onto the front straightaway. And under the starter stand, let's see if Patrick Woods Toth has kept anything in reserve as they head down into turn number one for the final time. The Cube 3 turn one. Cole Kleck keeping it up. You can see the bumps uh, as the suspension working the overtime coming through turn one and two. Down into the left-hander at turn number three and then back to turn four, an equally equal radius right-hander. And then into the fun part, turn number five. Is that car handling the bumps pretty well? Patrick Woods Toth right there behind him. So Cole Clegg heading for that tricky turn six. Drops a couple wheels off to the outside, but he's okay. Into turn seven. And now into the Bennett Bridge Hall S's on the final lap. Cole's trying his best here to keep the gap at the maximum, but also uh, save his tires the most for the next race. Yeah, if absolutely. Decides not to uh, put a new set on. Cole working his way through the last of the S's, coming down into turn 13 for the final time. Keeps it nice and clean. Oh, he's got two more turns to go, and he's going to notch his first win of the season. Like I say, his, his best finish was a podium at Circuit of the Americas, and he's gone to the top step. The checkered flag is in the hand of the starter, and Cole Kleck weaving back and forth to celebrate the victory as he'll take the win in round number one of the 2024 Formula Regional Americas Championship. Patrick Woods Toth comes home in a well-deserved second spot, starting from the pole. Nico Ambiato takes third, and we got a side-by-side -side finish for fourth and fifth. It looks like Titus Sherlock was just able to hold off his teammate Ryan Sheehan as they came across the line. Just behind them, Hayden Bowlesby in a well-judged sixth-place finish. There's the six of Nicole Averda, the British Columbian for Crosslink Kiwi as she'll take home a points finish in seventh. Rico Schleyman in the uh, number 25 across the line, just in front. Actually, it was Justin Garrett just in front of Schleyman. He made that pass on the last lap. Then Schleyman, Anthony Autilio rounding out the points paying positions. So well done to Cole Kleck to take the win in the first round. I'm going to uh, say my goodbyes and head down to the podium to uh, interview the top three finishers. Parker, thanks so much for being with us. Great job no in the problem. commentary booth. Thank Good you. luck in uh, race number two this Thank afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. We'll uh, look to see you on the podium, let's hope. Hopefully. All we'll right. see. Great. Have a good one, my friend. Thanks for your expert commentary. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to step aside for those of you watching on the stream. I'm going to step aside to get down to the podium. And uh, we will be back with you a little later this afternoon for the final race of the weekend. That'll be race number two for the Ligier JSF4 Series. And that's coming up at 5.05 this afternoon. My compatriot, DJ Clark, picking up the microphone. And he'll take you to uh, the end of the broadcast. And I'll head down to the podium. DJ, thanks so much. My absolute pleasure. It's going to be a great time to be able to finish everything out here at this point. We just saw a little bit of an affected race, but a good one nonetheless. Cole Kleck able to take that victory up at the top for DD Autosports International Mechanical. Patrick Woods Toth and Nicholas Aviato able to take second and third. Good runs up and down through the field for everybody to be able to do it as we take a look at this gorgeous NOLA Motorsports Park from top to bottom here. 
A very tricky race, particularly in these open wheel machines. Uh, there is a little bit of downforce that's generated in them, and so it comes across a little bit back and forth as they run. And so having to deal with all of that here at this point. But folks, stick with us here on Speed Tour as we will be back with uh, one more SVRA race for the day. But until then, we're going to take a quick little break. Hungry for SVRA action? Well, the best way to enjoy classic auto racing is with a delicious classic from Mission Foods. Green flag your race-watching snacks with Mission's mouth-watering race day recipes. Try some of our tasty tacos, piled high nachos, fresh chips with guac, and more. So gear up your ride and fuel up those stomachs with delicious Mission Foods. Now that's too fast, too tasty.
Hello and welcome back to the 2024 NOLA Speed Tour here at NOLA Motorsports Park. DJ Clark once back in the booth again alongside Ben Sissel. And we are ready for the final race of the day for SVRA. Groups 1, 2, 3, 4, and SV as we get ready to go. Can't read my own writing there. Not surprising. I have some pretty bad chicken scratch, but uh, always fun to be able to see these cars take to the track. Narrow wheels, cigar cars as they were known, Ben. It always makes for a great spectacle. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. That is Patrick Flynn there in that Group 2 Formula Ford Van Diemen. We only have two Group 2 cars here. This is the other Group 2 car. I am looking at my phone at a grid sheet, so you have to Forgive me, but that's Michael Rue. That's a Lola Group 2. But now these are the Formula Vs, most from the Dallas area. That's the 23 of Elliot Barron. He is actually the person that kind of puts all of this together. For some reason, he's not waving at us, though, Tony. Get us to wave at us. Wait, Tony, you might have to go back there. Elliot has got to wave. Let's see if the 103 will wave at us. Oh, we got a thumbs up out of him. I'll take that. Nice. I'll take John Williamson up. gives us a thumbs up. So, Elliot, look at that. Oh, there's a thumbs up. There we go. Everybody else is happy to be on the grid, but Elliot Barron, I guess. I mean, maybe he's just a driver in the zone. You know, you got to get set. You got to get ready to go. He's got a he's got a race to run. He's got a race to win here. Yeah. A lot of times when you work the grid, you have they get so relaxed that you do have to wake them up sometimes because they just get in there, get in their zone, and they'll <laughs> fall asleep or just kind of doze off. And you never know to, like, tap their shoulder because they also might be praying for their race, you know. But there's a, <laughs> we've got three Spridgets from Sevar, which is the uh, Texas local club that are set up exactly the same. That's Rob actually there, Rob Elson, our chief of tech. But these are the Spridgets, two of the three Spridgets that are here that are set up exactly the same. I like this because it's kind of like a race within a race. We do have one that is wearing a hard top and two that I believe are the uh, Roadsters. But uh, all the same engine, transmission, rear end components. And I think they're the same weights, these spridges here. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. Um, there, there, look at that. Two, Two thumbs, thumbs up. up. There you go, all Tony. Right. We might need to send you back there with uh, Elliot Barron. But so group one is basically really small bore production cars like these spridges. Group two is the Formula Fords. FV is obviously Formula V. Group three, I'm not seeing any group three cars out there at the moment. I don't think we had any group three entries this weekend. Watch us have one or two and drive me crazy See, here at this yeah. point. <laughs> There's Sevar, the uh, Corinthian Vintage Auto Racing out of Texas, the local club that they race with. And I like the just power 70s, early 70s paint schemes on these cars. And, Ben, I've been corrected. We've got one. There it is. Three right there. entries. Barrett Camper there at that point. He's going to bring that Gia. car forward. Yeah. So we've got the one group three entry. So I told you I was going to be corrected, yeah. and there I was. He went out yesterday and made it about to where our splitter is, about 500 feet out of the grid, and his throttle cable broke. So at least it's an easy fix. Yeah. So we'll see what he does there. Well, that's the benefit of these older cars is you're not having to deal with electronics. You're not having to yeah. hook it up to a computer or anything. If something breaks, you can very easily go in and fix it. Yeah, and if your throttle cable breaks, you can go to the local bicycle shop and get a brake cable to fix that. Now, there's the Formula Vs, and hopefully, okay, here we go. So we'll go through the grid here. Uh, we were waiting for them to come through race monitor so that we could read you the grid. So the number 29 in first place in the group two is Patrick Flynn in that Van Diemen. John Little in second place in that orange and blue. That's not right. Austin Healy Sprite. He should be the other Formula Ford. Jackson Williams is in a Group 1 FP. Barrett Camper starting fourth. Roger E. Williams in fifth. Devin Boucher is in sixth, in number 60 in sixth place. Bobby Boucher's brother from Louisiana. Hunter Barron is in the number 70. Elliot O. Barron in the number 8. And I've heard word that uh, actually he's on a new engine. So look out for him to move up. David McMasters. What a great name. And starting ninth, Ronald is in 10th place. I'm not going to attempt his last name. Well, Elliot I think it's Donald. Got the first name right. Oh, Donald. It's Donald. Sorry. <laughs> Donald Rajasingham. 
I hope that was somewhat correct, is 10th. Elliot J. Barron is 11th, but who cares? He didn't give us a thumbs up on grid. <laughs> Number in 12th is John Williamson. 13th is Jason White. Daniel Person is 14th. Robert Phillips in 15th. This is going to be a great race. I love when these FV cars are out there. Scott Ilyev is 16th. Mark Lobel, 17th. Ken Milvid, 18th. Laura Romney, 19th. It's good to see Laura back out there. Amelia Phillips from New Orleans, ladies and gentlemen, in 20th. And then Michael Rue in 21st. Look at that beautiful Gia. I oh. love Carmen Gia's. Oh, they're absolutely fantastic. This whole field is fantastic. It's got that sort of throwback feel. I was rocking around the paddock earlier today, and, you know, I felt like I was I should be down on the grid with Colin Chapman and, and you know, the Cooper and the Brabham's and all of those of looking at these classic Formula Vs and, and going, this is the rear engine revolution. This is what yeah. it is. So I'm hearing word that uh, QXINN is saying that his dad is about to race, Daniel Person. So he drives a 68 lengths. That's very good. Boy from New York has joined us. Somebody's like, there's your dad. So good luck, dad. So this is all awesome. We've got a lot of people. This is a self-imposed split start. So we're going to start with the group 1-3 race, and then we're going to go back to the Formula V race. So uh, the Formula Vs are going to kind of self-impose a split start, which we like to see. And we are about to see some good racing here. Yeah, we are indeed. Put some time up on the clock here at this point is our fabulous Janetta safety car pulls off down into pit lane and cars work their way through Mission Foods turn 16 as all eyes start to turn towards the flag stand here at this point Patrick Flynn having control of the field in that Van Diemen is there they come and there they go because the green flag is in the air we are racing once more from Nola uh, Motorsport Park and that's uh, Patrick Flynn absolutely leading the way in that Van Diemen. It's going to be a big, big lead for him. A little bit of jumbling around there as they get their way ahead. A couple of the Spridgets starting to get into a little bit of a battle right now. The Carmen Ghia also inserting itself into the equation as they dive down into Cube 3, Turn 1. And normal for the Group 1 and 3 cars to stay together like this. And the Group 2 cars, the Formula Ford should pull way off. And uh, look at this side-by-side. -side. These Bridgets are coming through here at NOLA Motorsports Park. And I did just get reports from race control that the number 13 left a pretty big puddle of oil at a uh, grid. So they're keeping an eye on that. Ooh, I will say I thought I saw a little bit of something on the track because that's the 72 there getting a little bit action-y. That's uh, Roger Williams right now trying to push his way ahead. He was side-by-side -side with the orange and blue machine of John Little as they tried to fight. And look at all of those Formula Vs. Two wide, three wide almost coming back through turns three and four. Yeah, I just heard that Robert Phillips, they're going to put a meatball flag on him. There's too much smoke. You can see there about mid-pack. All the smoke coming out of these air-cooled Volkswagen Beetle engines, and uh, you know when you're when you're racing these engines, uh, and they kind of build them right to that edge sometimes. That uh, you know you sometimes get a little bit of smoke or oil on the headers that's causing the smoke. But this is the race to watch. Like I said, these three Spridgets here are set up nearly identical. So this is a racer class within a class here in our Group One at SVRA at the Nola Speed Tour. Yep, they're working ahead right there at that. See point. a little wave there. Oh, Pat, he's he's uh, waving them by there because this is two. This is, I believe, father son passing. Right? Is that EO? Who's in Petunia? Oh, that's Devin Boucher right behind Elliot there in Petunia. Yep, working his way on through. Oh, almost three wide coming down through the Bennett Bridge Hall asses as they try to work their way on through. Getting by right now. That Carmen Ghia machine having to thread the needle, and that's opening some great opportunities farther back in the field. You have to be really careful when you run these mixed groups like this, and those Formula Vs are so small. Uh, even compared to the Spridgets, which are very small cars, uh, the Spridges just aren't used to seeing them in their mirrors, and you, they can be overlooked. They're basically blind out there, so the Formula Vs have to be really careful when they're making these passes. 
and make sure that the car that they are passing can actually see them or they just have to make a safer pass. Right. And, and one of the things that you can do about that, we talked about this during the TA and, and GT race, is just be predictable. If you know those cars are coming up on you, be as predictable as possible. But look at this. More two, three wide coming down the main straightaway into cube three, turn one. Moving around the outside. We've got a nice little battle on our hands here at this point. I think that's Elliot Barron and Devin Boucher, Elliot O'Baron and Hunter Barron, everybody mixing it up. Yeah, so that's, uh, these are all in the same, Elliot O'Baron in the 69, his brother Hunter, that's their dad right there in front, and then really good friend of one of the mechanics is up there in one of the oldest cars, and I believe the SCCA uh, national champion car, Petunia, up there in the lead. Leading here at this point, some more smoke coming off the back of another one of those machines, not the one that was uh, given the meatball flag a little bit earlier. Patrick Flynn, by the way, setting the uh, pace here early on, about four seconds faster than anybody else in the field in that Van Diemen. Again, that's one of the only uh, two PCF entries in the field. But this little battle here, the 70 and the 69, starting to get a little bit interesting. It's Hunter Bear, brothers. Yep, leading the way. Uh, I think this might come up at Thanksgiving dinner if this ends badly. <laughs> it usually doesn't end badly with the Barons and, and any of these Formula Vs because you do have to draft and you do have to get behind. So it's basically who's in third place and at about this point in the track might be the winner of the race if they can stay in these long trains like this. Well, and that's always the key when you're talking about these sort of you know, cigar cars, for, for lack of a better term, and the way that they look, it is all about that draft. There's no real aerodynamic uh, effect on these machines. And so really and truly, it's all about that draft and that ability to slipstream past one another. We have some comments worried about me. I have not had my ice cream today. So thanks, boy from New York, for asking oh, no. about that. That's always one of my favorite cars out there, that 103 John Williamson, that's the green and white. That's the Caldwell D13. Beautiful cars. But you see there, Petunia taking the lead. And that's Elliot O behind Elliot. The dad, and dad's waving, saying, go left. See him? See him waving there in the number 23? It looks like maybe something might be happening with Elliot, or maybe he wants to get behind in the draft. I think he may just want to get behind in the draft, as it does look like the 103 there of Williamson was just passed. Coming on the main straightaway there. That's the number 15 that was able to get that move done. That's, That's Daniel Person, yeah, person yeah, who's watching. Me. His uh, QXN is out there saying, go, Dad. Well, That's there you go. Go, Dad, go. I love how you can see. You can see the torsion bars of the Volkswagen Beetle there in the yep. front suspension and the rear suspension. Then it has the air-cooled Volkswagen Beetle engine. But then other than that, basically to the wheelbase and to the width of the car, anybody could design a Formula V car. And there are tons of different iterations of it. The reason you see that little cage there behind the transmission is because early days of this, you could get up and bump them out of gear. And they'd get up and, <laughs> and just just tap the guy out of gear and be able to make the pass. So everybody had to then uh, put that little cage back there to keep people from bumping them out of gear. I always think that's a pretty funny little tidbit into the Formula V racing. Well, uh, it just goes to show any sort of race car drivers, you find a competitive advantage, they're going to explore it. That's the 401 of Ken Milvid right there running around. Uh, one in, of the older cars in the group, I believe. Yeah, one of the there's also higher up cars in the group. It kind of has a look of an almost a 50s roadster in the way that it's designed. Or when they made those bomb, you know, the, the gas tank cars that they'd run at Bonneville where they oh, just take an old yeah. fuel tank from an airplane. It looks like that. Yeah, it does a little bit. Uh, it, it has that look to it. Uh, uh, certainly, I'd love to go see these cars run out of Bonneville, just have a good time and tear up the salt and see what they are able to do. But that's going to be Milford working his way through the Bennett Bridge Hall S's here at this point. Got to be careful with these cars. You don't want to take too much of the curb. As you said, not a real great suspension in them. So you can't really attack the curbs like you would in a, in a modern open-wheel car. Yeah, that torsion suspension is basically World War II technology. But that's what made the Beetle such a great car. It was so simple and so great that they made all these platforms. And then basically, uh, this for a while in SCCA, this Formula V was the largest class in any racetracks over the weekend. Sometimes they'd have field of 70 or 80 cars because people could race these cars, have so much fun. I don't, if there's 20 of these cars on the track, I don't think there's a more fun class of racing. And uh, so you get so much bang for your buck with these cars. And then if your engine blows, you go to the junkyard and there's 300 
Volkswagen Beetle engines there ready for you to take, which sadly isn't the case today. Yeah, it's not anymore, but these are still classic cars to be able to watch. That's the 459 working their way down the main straightaway here at this point. That's Mark Lobel just kind of motoring along here in a field unto himself. He's on a bit of a Sunday drive. The toe of the uh, front wheels there seems a little bit askew. You can see that torsion suspension working. But I love just the different iterations, and everybody kind of came up with their own. Uh, and there's the shadow facts or foxes uh, that were really had a lot of great engineering in them and iconic, and then somebody else came up with it. So it was like all kinds of different ways to rebuild the mousetrap. Exactly, and uh, Lobel here just did uh, driver school with ECR, uh, or at ECR with uh, SVRA, so happy to see him being able to put those skills to use here, and that's one of the things that SVRA does offer, those driver schools across the country to really help refine your skills and bring the, the love of wrenching that is required on a lot of these older vehicles going coinciding with uh, the ability to go out and drive them and have a good time. Now there is our leader. So now this is a Formula Ford. You can see the difference between a Formula V and a Formula Ford. This would, in that kind of open wheel ladder system, this would be about two steps above a Formula V. Uh, these Formula Fords kind of more, a little bit more spec racer, two liter, I think 1600 to two liter engines. But uh, another great class in vintage racing and racing back in the SCCA days, a very competitive class. And so many Formula One and IndyCar drivers came from this including uh, Scott Goodyear was a Formula Four champion and moved up to IndyCar. Yeah, I mean, you talk about uh, uh, the legacy of, of not only an IndyCar, but also really cool. Dragging that nose. Yeah, Patrick is really pushing here at this point. But not only an IndyCar, but an open wheel racing across the world. I mean, just the number of drivers that came in through Formula Four. Does it look like somebody taking a little bit of a slow, taking the shortcut well, it there? Looks like they were going into pit lane. I don't know. Yeah. If they took a different route. Oh, 459 took a shortcut, he's saying, in race control. But there is our leader, Patrick Flynn. And that beautiful, I like the blue, but with the white wheels. Oh, it's, I, I mean, it, it's a throwback to what is America's racing colors, the white and the blue, kind of an invert of what we traditionally think of as the classic American racing colors. But that obviously coming into play before sponsorship was a thing in automotive racing, that every country had their own colors to race in. Obviously, uh, red for uh, red for uh, Italy. Italy. And, yeah, I had to think of it there for and a second. The, the silver arrows of Germany and the British, British racing, racing green. green. Belgium was yellow, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I know America was white and blue and just a whole combination of colors. I, I spent a long couple of hours at one point down a, a wiki rabbit hole looking at all of them and figuring them out, and it was pretty fun. Yeah, we got into Grand Prix racing so late, America did, that we had to be the two-color combinations because yep. they basically ran out of colors. Yeah. That's the 504, second place, I believe. That's Michael Rue. You see that big snorkel up there. Just like Formula V's, the Formula Ford chassis and bodybuilders all had different kind of concepts. And uh, there were some that, you know, sold thousands of different bodies. And then there were some that sold dozens or maybe even just one. Well, and that air intake design is one that we would see then replicated a lot through the 1970s and a lot of formula racing, as uh, you see in the, the McLarens and indeed the, the Hezkits of the day. And then I believe those massive overhead air scoops were outlawed in 1976, if I remember my timing correctly, that that was when the FAA sort of cracked down on those uh, and uh, uh, changed them. And then we see the the more traditional roll hoops that we would think of today. So we've got a lot of people watching their dad racing in this one. So that's really cool to see. Always good to have a little bit of family support. I mean, that's the thing about motor racing. It's such a family thing to be able to take into consideration. So many of these drivers, they get into automotive enthusiasm because of their their mothers or their fathers their love of it i know for me you know my mom took me to the brickyard when i was about four years old to go see richard petty run come out of retirement to go do that and you know likewise my dad watching formula one with him in the mornings it, it, it's such a family thing and to this day i pick up the phone i call either of them and first five minutes we're talking about racing 
That is the Carmen Ghia there, I believe 53. Mm -hmm. Barrett Camper, beautiful car. This car actually raced in the La Carrera Panamericana, that basically the road race through Mexico. And he's out here running with us. You can see on the rear he's got the Panamericana uh, livery still on it, the badge that says this car actually ran in that, which is so cool. I've always – it's not that I dislike the Beatles, but – I've always really kind of favored the Carmen Ghias. I just like the look of that car. Well, it has that very rounded edge to them that, that is a little bit more elongated. I think the Beatles tend to be a little bit more squished. Yeah. And, and the Carmen Ghia is a little bit more long. And I, I agree with you, Ben. It just has, I think, prettier lines on it. We're at NOLA Motorsports Park. Here is the race, though, for Formula yeah. V. So by my eye, it looks like EO Baron and is about to be overtaken by Hunter Baron. And then there's Devin right behind him there in Petunia. You can see how much uh, lower Devin sits there as he ducks out. Coming into Cube 3 Architecture Turn 1. So like I said, the person in third place usually has the advantage going into one. But I didn't see if the drag race from third would have gotten him into first over the start finish line so we're going to try to look at this because white flag next time by on our leader but this is the race to watch right here so that's devin boucher bobby boucher's brother right here from the state of louisiana the water boy out there showing us how to drive petunia yeah and doing a great job with it and again that lower slung car there i i, I feel like just by the looks of it it should give him a little bit of an advantage it just a lower center of gravity should handle through the corners slightly better oh some smoke coming out the back there of one of the machines but that 70 car who's in the 70 that car is rotating like i've never seen that's hunter baron so hunter baron has that white car rotating there through that tight section which could really help him here if he can get ahead of Devin, but then don't count out EO because uh, you were saying EO's in a new. Chelsea's saying he's got a new engine in the car. Nice. There you go. It was, by the way, Hunter that I think that smoke was coming out from the back of there. So maybe just as you were talking about a little bit of oil on the headers or, or something sometimes like that. Sometimes when they shift, just think yeah. with me with, with an MG, sometimes when you shift or downshift from like third to second, you'll get that puff of smoke like they just got there. That's just just kind of normal on these old tired engines like that that yeah, certainly is the car's pitched forward going down into turn 15 here at the moment let's keep our eye on eo right now but is brian their head. who needs to buy a vowel in our comment section is saying maybe too much oil overflow can get on exhaust and right hander so thank you brian for that yeah. I love this kind of information because we can't be experts on all these different uh, a century of motorsports. But, you know, if this is your thing, a lot of times people will give us some great information. But here they are, man. Look at this coming down the, the main straight. Who's going to pass that start finish line? We might have a photo finish if this goes to it. Well, I have good news for Devin here at this point. Devin Boucher, he was ahead as they crossed the line, and he was the one leading going down into turn 15 and into that complex, so maybe that's a little bit to take in mind. But there you see Patrick Flynn, your leader in that Van Diemen. The winner. White oh, no. flag. Wait, white did flag. he take the checker flag? No, or it's the white just flag? white. Okay, it's good. just white. So there's our leader. Yeah, sorry about that. But he's got the race tied up. We want to go back to that Formula V race there with the uh, the two brothers and basically best friend and see who's going to win this thing because they all pack up the car. They put six of these cars in one short trailer, and we'll see how he goes there. Yeah, we'll have to see. No concerns, though, for Patrick Flynn up at the front of the field by a whopping 39 seconds. There it oh, is. Oh, and he's going to so come what, off the back of it. What's going to happen, though, is if he passes these three cars, this is their last lap, like, you know, he's going to pass them and take the checker because had he not passed them, they would have basically gotten another lap. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I've got to be thinking here, if you're sitting back, if you are uh, either of the Barons, you probably don't want to get passed, but he is he going to get yep. passed. So, so that they're means, coming to the checker. Yeah, this is going to be a race to the line for uh, Boucher, Baron, and Baron. And that's going to be kind of confusing because they that means they never saw the white flag. Right. Right. So this they're not going to know they're coming to the checker here because I don't think they have radio. So let's see. That's Devin in the front and then Hunter right behind him. And then EO Baron 
back in that black 69. So there is the leader. He's going to take the win. But the, the race here is the Formula V's right behind him, right there. Those three cars right through there. We're going to see who's going to take them as they cross the, the start-finish line. Coming down through Mission Foods, turn 16 here at this point. Patrick Flynn dominates the field. Who's going to be able to take the rest of it, though, here at I this point? I think Hunter might duck out. Is he going to get it? Hunter's in the white one. Let's see. Oh, oh, I think Devin's got it. Let's see. That's going to be close. And as we look, it's Devin. Devin Boucher able to take that victory. 72. The, let's see who's going to win this Bridget race. That's Roger e. Williams, I believe, in the 72. Yeah, the green MG midget here at this point. He is going to be able to hold off uh, the rest of the You're going to get canceled. You can't say that word here. I, they're Spridgets now. Are they Spridgets now? But look, it's still really oh, close. No, it is. It's got a nice little battle. Roger Williams in the lead with John Little right behind him. And like I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is a group one. They're CVAR cars that race with us here in SVRA. But I spoke to them at the driver's meeting. These cars are set up very similar, all the same components. So look at how close this racing is. Yeah, very, very close here as they come down into the really the final good overtaking opportunity. Doesn't quite look like... That's John Little behind him in that orange and blue machine. It doesn't look like he's got the run over Williams. Williams is going to have to try to hold him out here, but oh, here comes Little. Yeah, let's see. This could be a drag race. Who would have thought that little 1275cc uh, engines would be in a drag race here as they come around Mission Foods, but here it is coming to the end. It's coming to the line. Oh, that's a great run for Little coming off of the corner, but it looks like his momentum slowed just a little bit. Let's see. It is going to be a straight oh, drag man. race. Oh, Photo finish. Here they come, and it nice. is. Nice. Oh, that was cool. Williams by a whisker. That was a cool race, guys. Nice job. So that's our group one winners right there that we saw. We saw the Formula V. We saw the group two. So nice job from our camera crew. Look at that. They're waving to everybody. What a great race in Group 1. Group 1 never disappoints. You see that? NOLA Speed Tour here. That was a lot of fun to watch. No, that was absolutely fantastic. Exactly the kind of thing you want. A little bit of puffs of smoke here and there. Just to remind us, by the way, that we are racing some classic cars. It wouldn't be a classic car race without a few puffs of smoke along the way. But great racing action here. And we're not done for the day. We still have one more race yet to run. I believe is that's the JSF4 race going to be coming at you here pretty soon. But we continue to watch the victory laps. Working their way around here at this point. Roger E. Williams taking a very well-earned victory, having to hold off John Little at the end. Jackson Williams was waiting to pick up the pieces, but not quite close enough to necessarily influence the back of the fight. All right, folks, and as we said, stick with us here as we will be coming back very, very shortly with JSF4 Racing, and that will end out for today. But we're going to go to a quick break. Stay with us for JSF4. Yes. Fun. the WeatherTech's here. WeatherTech is the ultimate protection for your vehicle. Laser measured floor liners, no drill mud flaps, cargo liner, bump step, seat protector, and cup phone. What about my car? WeatherTech. That bush is really coming along. Hi, Carla. What are you up to? Oh, I just spent the whole morning having a little battery powered fun. I can see that. This thing is powerful. Hey, honey, I was just gushing about our new favorite toy. Let me tell you, the battery life on this thing, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Sometimes we need a little extra push to get there. Sometimes, hey, I let it do all the work for me. And it has so many different settings. All right, Joel, ready to go again? <laughs> you should join us sometime. <laughs>
Welcome to round number two of the Liget JSF4 series, the brand new series that's making its debut here at beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana Motorsports Park. I'm John Phippen, spokesman for the series. I'm joined by Nicola Verda, who has uh, had a great run in her first race in the FR series with a seventh place finish. Congratulations. Oh, sorry, Nicole, I didn't turn your microphone on. Now we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. We're getting good pictures here of the uh, number 44 of Pablo Benitez Jr., one of the drivers for Scuderia Buell, as the safety car leads the field away. And let's introduce this 14-car starting grid to you. They are gridded based on their best lap time turned in race number one and we'll go from back to front starting alone assuming he'll make the run starting alone in row number seven is the 72 of jacob lauder from uh, edmund oklahoma for igy6 next to him the number 28 of drew such from st charles illinois for such racing in uh, car number one is jake pollock from san antonio texas for jensen in row five on the outside, car 49, Harbor Doss from Solon, Ohio for Berg DMG Racing. Harbor was involved in an incident. I hope they were able to get the car repaired. Next to him in, the, in that fifth row is the number 95 of Brad Modgeman, the Australian from Caulfield, South Australia for Crosslink Kiwi. Outside of row four, car 44, Pablo Benitez from Port Orange, Florida for Scuderia Buell. Next to him, the number two of Parker Wallen. He was my co-commentator for the last race from Medina, Minnesota. Medina, excuse me, Minnesota for Jensen. In row three on the outside, car 83, Christopher Parrish had a good finish from Terrell, Texas for Save 22 sponsored IGY6 Motorsports. Next to him, the 24 of Daniel Quimby from Sydney, Australia, who finished the race without a front wing as Daniel races for the Atlantic Racing Team. Now for the front two rows on the outside, the podium finisher in the first race number six Maite Caceres from Miami Florida although she makes her home in Punta del Este Uruguay for international motorsports next to her is the number 45 of Bacon Zelenka from Lyons Illinois with the Crosslink Kiwi team and now for your front row the number 29 of Keikai Hawaneo from Plant City Florida Keikai driving for Crosslink Kiwi this year and your pole sitter and the winner of the first round from the pole the number 25 of Teddy Musella from Orlando Florida for Scuderia Buell so we had uh, kind of an eventful first race for the F4 drivers. They had a couple uh, incidents and uh, had a red flag in the middle. Pretty much the same thing we had in the Formula Regional race. So, uh, Nicole, are you uh, happy with your performance in that first race? Yeah, I think I did pretty good. Avoided a lot of uh, issues that happened on track. Yep. Um, honestly, just trying to keep moving forward. It's the first race of the weekend as well as the year exactly. so it's a long season to go you bet we've got a whole lot of races coming up especially in the fr series as we're going to indianapolis and we're going to uh most sport canadian time motorsports park so uh some new venues added seven venues in all for the fr series so it uh, should be great fun yeah i can't wait yeah exactly right so but we've got a weekend to get through we've got two more races for your class tomorrow but let's turn our attention to this brand new lige jsf4 series this is the first step on the pmh ladder uh, this series uses the first generation f4 car that we've run since 2016 and uh, we'll be introducing the brand new jsf 422 at our next round of racing at road america we introduced that car a year ago at road america and it's fitting that the very first race will be uh, up there in just about a month's time in mid-May. But let's turn our attention now to the starting grid for round number two of the Lige JSF4 series as we await the countdown to begin. The field is set. You can hear the revs come up. We've got five lights lit, and we are away. And the full field gets away safely. That's great. They're making the run down toward turn number one. And it is our pole sitter at the front. Teddy Musella in that number 25, but it looks like the 29 getting a good run on him. Keikai Hawaniu sweeps around the outside. There's Maite Casaras in the sixth, in third. Bacon Zelenka right behind her in fourth as they make it through turn two and head down toward turn three for the first time. Good clean start. That's what we like to see. And Teddy Musella looking a little impatient. He's going to try to get back around Keikai. Keikai will now have the inside line as they head down toward turn number four, and he'll make that stick. But Teddy Musella right behind him. And then just behind Musella, Bacon Zelenka. As they work their way through turn five into turn six. It's been a tricky turn all weekend long. A number of drivers have 
overcooked it there at turn six. A couple guys getting stuck in the gravel trap. So Teddy Musella, kind of an unusual situation. He led the first race from lights to flag, basically. Had some pressure at the beginning, but he was able to stretch it away. But right now, Keikai Hawaneo able to take advantage of a great start, and he is out in front right at the moment. But behind them, Maite Kasaras in the third spot. She's coming under serious pressure from Bacon Zelenka, who tries to go around the outside of Maite's car. But she falls back in single file as we've got a full course yellow already. And that's clearly somebody is off up at the top end of the racetrack. It's out of our view from our commentary position. But the new Janetta safety car with James Rogerson at the wheel is at the ready. And they'll pick up the field as they come around. So somebody off, I'm guessing, up around turn number six. We'll see if we can find out the story here. As the field coming on to the front straightaway, and they'll stack up behind the safety car. Keikai Hawaneo, your leader. Teddy Busella in second. Maite Casaras in third. Those two finished on the podium in race number one. Bacon Zelenka also on the podium in the first race. Parker Wallen having a good start. Parker shared the commentary booth with me for the FR race just concluded. Brad Majman, the one of the two Australians in the field in sixth spot. And uh, the 40, 44, Pablo Benitez, Jacob Lauter, Drew Such, and Christopher Parrish, your top 10. While we're under this full course yellow, let's take a quick break and thank the folks that make the broadcast possible here on Speed Tour TV. Okay, so pretend this is your race car. It's on the trailer and you have an accident. Ouch. At least your truck's insurance will pay for another one? Yeah, not so fast. Standard insurance won't replace your race car, whether it's in the trailer, in the paddock, in the garage, or the repair shop. But at Haggerty, we can protect it for what it's really worth any time it's off the track. No matter what or where you race, offer less than a set of race tires. Haggerty, let's drive together. The Sonoma Speed Tour returns to Sonoma Raceway April 19th through the 21st. Featuring the Trans Am Series presented by Pirelli Western Championship. The Sports Car Vintage Racing Association. Historic Trans Am. The Toyo Tire 2.5 Challenge. PSSA. International GT. And Saturday, you can take part in the Haggerty Cars and Caffeine Car Show. You do not want to miss the Sonoma Speed Tour April 19th through the 21st. For tickets, simply go to speedtour.net. And we're back with the first full course yellow of this uh, session of racing. Round number two for the brand new Lige JS F4 series. As we've got uh, a couple cars off, it looks like Daniel Quimby and Jake Pollock are the two cars involved. Harbor Doss for Burke DMG was not able to take the start, I believe. But uh, Quimby and Pollock are off. We're trying to uh, uh, determine where the incident took place, but uh, nonetheless, the field stacked up behind the safety car with uh, no change in the order from what we gave you just before the break. Nicole, let's talk a little bit about your journey here. Uh, you were a go-karter, of course, as everybody was. Tell us about how you came to, to move up into the Formula Regional Americas Championship. Yeah, so usually most drivers actually start in Formula 4. Um, I got a few opportunities in Formula 4. I did a few tests with W Series when they were in, as well as some other. Yeah. But I talked with my parents and a lot of sponsors, and they just wanted me to do, you know, they thought it would be a good idea to do Formula 3 right away. So I did a whole season of testing because jumping out of go-karts to Formula 3. That's a big leap. You know, it's a, it's a big leap. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. It took a while to get into it. Um, but last year, I won the Formula Pro USA Winter Series Championship, Indeed. as well as the Main Series Championship, which was really cool and really good. Uh, and then came here at the end of the year to do, I did VIR in New Jersey, yep. which yep. just to see where I'm at, kind of. Yep. And sure. this year, I'm doing the full series. So that, That's awesome. I also did some racing. Um, for two, two seasons in India, there was a series um, that did it for five weeks at the end of the year in November to December. Wow. And so it was a whole championship with nice. guys like Porsche uh, drivers that were like in the mall and stuff. So they were actually good seat time, you know. Yeah. Honestly, I'm just chasing seat time here and there, right? Sure, sure, yeah. What were you driving at the Indy at the, in um, the It was a Wolf GBO8. Okay, I got So gotcha. we had a whole Indian, cr uh, Italian crew working on the cars. Yeah. And then, yeah, it was actually a really good series. Awesome. 
Awesome. Yeah. That's great to hear. Maite Casaras had a, a podium in her first start here this this weekend. So that's a great start. We want we want to see more females on the podium. Definitely. So uh, let's get you up there to uh, for the two races tomorrow. But uh, Maite had a great run, uh, the Uruguayan. And we get a good shot of her as she uh, toodles around behind the safety car. As we get the uh, track workers doing their job to uh, collect the cars of Daniel Quimby and Jake Pollock. We can see they're working at the exit of turn two. And they've got one of the cars on the hook. Uh, and it is coming in behind on a flat tow. So it looks like at least one of the cars not able to come in under its own power. Again, after uh, the first round of racing this morning, Teddy Musella, the points leader. In fact, he swept the first round of racing, turning, uh, he started from the pole and set the fast lap on the way to his first win. Maite Casaras finishing in second. Bacon Zelenka finished in third. And those three are running second, third, and fourth in the race right now. But Keikai Hawaneo uh, did not have a great run. He uh, was knocked out in an incident uh, early in the race and did not score points. So he's trying to make up for that right now. Keikai's had a pretty good run himself as he has uh, done some racing uh, in the uh, Yak Academy Winter Series. He only missed the podium once uh, and uh, he uh, had two podiums a year ago uh, in the uh, Formula Regional, or excuse me, the F4 US Championship. He had podiums at VIR and uh, nine top tens. So KKI was a pretty consistent points finisher in yesterday, in last uh, last year's race. And like I say, finishing eighth, finishing in the top 10 in the championship. So taking the step over to the Ligier JSF4 series, give him a chance to, like I say, seat time is all important and it's a chance to hone his race craft and see if he could do just a little bit better. And it looks like we're gonna go to the restart as the course workers here do a great job. They've got the track cleared and we have 10 cars surviving on the lead lap. As the safety car pulls away from the field, turning it over to Keikai Hawaneo, and he'll bring the field around for a single file, rolling start. These Ligier JSF4, this series, should we say, was the brainchild of uh, Tony Perella, the uh, major domo at uh, Perella Motorsports Holding, as a chance to allow this first generation F4 car to continue to, to have some service life after the introduction of the new G Ligier JSF 422, which we'll see in at Road America at our ne next racing round. The green flag is in the air, the field begins to accelerate, and the battle is on for second as Mighty Casaras gets a great run, and she's pulled up side by side with this morning's winner, Teddy Musella. And there goes Bacon Zelenka making it three wide, four wide, as the two of Parker Wallen jumps out there as well. As they come into turn number one, Maite is going to sweep into second spot as she gets around Teddy Musella, shuffles him back to third. But Keikai Hawaneo continues to lead. But this great battle for second, Maite Casaras in that position. Maite racing for International Motorsport. And it looks like Teddy Musella is right in behind her. Teddy, the youngest driver in the field, 14 years of age, wouldn't be able to run in the uh, FIA F4 series because minimum age is 15 for that championship. So the youngest driver in the field has already got a win under his belt, but Keikai is looking like he's going to try to uh, get away. In fact, he's built up a pretty healthy lead. You can see from this beautiful uh, drone shot that he's opened up about a 10 car length lead. But Maite Casaras has got her hands full in second spot with this morning's winner, Teddy Musella right behind her. Bacon Zelenka in that green liveried machine right behind him. Brad Majman, Pablo Benitez, and Brad and uh, Parker Wallen duking it out behind her. In fact, behind Bacon looks like it might be Pablo Benitez up into the fifth spot behind Bacon Zelenka. It is indeed. We see a brake lock up there, a car coming into turn 13, one of the good passing opportunities on this racetrack down through 14 and then into the Mission Foods turn 16. The most important point on the racetrack because it leads onto the longest straightaway. That's a racing axiom. And that's the most important corner in any, is there any place on this racetrack that really gave you trouble, Nicole, getting to grips with it? Uh, I gotta say the S's for sure. Yeah. As well as like the back part too. So like turn five, six and seven. So yep. just leading up to the S's. But I mean, there's always room to improve. Right? So. Sure. Oh, 
someone just went off like crazy. Uh, yeah, Holy we got a big, a big cloud of dust, and that was right at, it looked like at turn two. We'll see if anybody's, yeah, the, the driver that was off has been able to continue. We'll get the ID on that in just a second. But Pablo Benitez up into fifth spot, as we mentioned, right behind Bacon Zelenka, right behind Pablo, Brad Moshman, the one of two Australians in the field. Daniel Quimby, unfortunately, already out of the running in the number 24 car as he is not able to take the restart. Christopher Parrish being shown a lap down in the 83 car. There's a good shot of Christopher as he was late out of the pits, perhaps involved in that incident that brought out the full course yellow. But we've been clean and green here for the last couple of laps. You can see Keikai disappearing into the distance, but Maite Casaras also now putting a little bit of gap between herself as we've got a new third place runner as uh, Pablo Benitez, the son of the team principal in the Scuderia Buell team. Pablo Jr. Looks like he's uh, going to be very racy here as well. The two red cars from two different teams, Maite with International Motorsport, Pablo Benitez from Scuderia Buell, Megan Zelenka with uh, Nicole's team, Crosslink Kiwi. Crosslink Kiwi, of course, uh, the dominant force in the team championship. 13 drivers here this weekend between the two championships. Uh, we should give uh, Tina and Gary a, a little bonus for uh, uh, propping up the entry list. It's great to have Crosslink Kiwi such a dominant force, and you you picked a uh, you picked a good horse to get it done. Yeah, of course. I love Tina and Gary. They're amazing. Yeah, they're great people. Brad Moshman in the 95 car, one of your teammates in his first start in this championship here this weekend. He finished in the points in fifth in race number one this morning. Getting a good look at the youngster. Brad out of Caulfield South in his native Australia. He was the uh, KA2 2023 Australian Championship third place finisher, and he won the Super Nats in Micro Swift back in 2019. He must have been about 12 back <laughs> then, if not, if not younger than that, perhaps. So now we're having a look at this battle between Pablo Benitez and B Bacon Zelenka. That's the battle for fourth spot. Actually, no, I'm sorry. That's Teddy, Teddy Masella, this morning's winner just in front. Pablo is just behind Bacon as I got the order wrong. Oh, looks like Bacon got a little squirrely as he made it into turn 13, but is able to gather it back up. Now they're making their way around the final sequence of turns. Plenty of time left. We've still got 16 minutes left in this race. The uh, constant has been Keikai Hawaneo as he has continued to click off fast laps. A 143.5 is within a couple seconds of lap record pace. Bryson Morris holds the race lap record set here back in uh, 2022. A 141.2. And Keikai has a 143.5. And now Maite Casaras, the second place runner, the Uruguayan, has just clicked off the fastest lap of the race. So she goes purple with a 143.366. Here's the 25 of Teddy Busella, third place. Bacon Zelenka making a move, tries to go around the outside as they're working their way through turn three. Now they head up towards turn number four. And Bacon just wasn't able to stick it there. That that sequence between three and four is a great one. If you can get outside at turn three, that puts you on the inside for turn four. It's a great passing opportunity. Yeah, it definitely is. That's what happened to me in um, my race, uh, passed on the inside of turn four. There you go. Making it through turn six. That's been the bugbear for a lot of drivers here in lots of different classes racing here in the Speed Tour this weekend. And uh, Scott Goodyear, our race director, has made it real clear to uh, the drivers in both of these classes to, uh, you know, keep it out of the gravel trap at turn six. It's a turn that, again, uh, you know, I, I think it was uh, Terry Irwood who did the track talk. He calls it a sucker turn. It's one of those turns where you can uh, get a little overconfident and uh, carry a little too much speed in there. And then you track out wide. And once you drop a wheel in that gravel trap, you're going for a ride. We understand the 44 car showing a little damage. In fact, you can see the side pod and the radiator completely loose on that 44 car of Pablo Benitez. So Benitez not having the luck that he would have hoped for. 
because that's going to act as a sail to slow that car down, plus the fact you'll have to guard against overheating because with that radiator out there, it's not going to be delivering the cooling power to that mountain-tuned Honda power plant. So Bacon Zelenka still hanging on to that spot. In fact, he has gotten around Teddy Musella. So Bacon Zelenka now moving up into the third spot. Musella drops back to fourth. As we see the 44 car of Pablo Benitez with that damage to the side pod. Might have been some contact, side to side contact with another car. And kicked that side pod loose and damaged the mountings for the radiator. So how uh, Neo with about a 1.2 second lead the last time by. As we stay with the 44 Pablo Benitez from Scuderia Buell. You can see that radiator sticking out there. Well, that's going to be troublesome for sure. Because if that breaks loose, it's going to dump some coolant on the racetrack. And he will go for a ride he did not intend if he gets uh, coolant under the, the uh, rear tires of that car. Looking at the 29 of Keikai Hawaneo. Getting some redemption after being knocked out in this morning's race. And he is out in front and drawing away. Keikai's had a good run after starting this race in the second position. Took over the lead on the first lap and has not looked back as he comes on to the front straightaway to complete race lap number eight this time by. Again, we go by time rather than distance. So with the, uh, the clock counting down to about 12 and a half minutes left, everybody minding their P's and Q's. That's what we like to see. Good, clean racing, close racing. We're certainly all in favor of that. But one of the things you have to learn coming out of go-karting is what Scott Goodyear calls situational awareness, being aware of where you are in the racetrack. Because it's not as easy to feel where you're uh, where your competitors are in a go-kart they're right there you can you know bump elbows almost in these cars you've got a little more uh, real estate you have to contend with yeah definitely as well as you're so strapped in that you, like in go-karting you used to look behind you with your head sure. you turn your head to see who's behind you but here you're looking in the mirrors you're also relying a lot on your engineers that are telling you like who is where and like how much time and like spotting for and you yeah yes. and all that yeah a good look at, Kay, at uh, Maite Casaras, our second place runner, as she has opened up a little gap over Bacon Zelenka. So it looks like, as you can see, the top three just about equally spaced from this beautiful drone shot. Now Neo holding the fast lap of the race. He's into the 42s now as the fuel burns off the car. And they get a little bit quicker, a 42.8 for Kekai. Maite's quickest lap is a 43 flat. Bacon Zelenka's fastest lap was his last, and that was a 43.2. There's the 25 of Teddy Musella currently running in fourth spot just behind this green liveried machine of Bacon Zelenka. Musella, who led from the pole in the race earlier today, looked like he might be able to make it two in a row as he started from the pole in this one as well, but just has not had anything for the two cars in front of him. So obviously tire strategy is a factor too. And, and uh, and Nicole, especially with the FR cars, you can easily burn the rear tires off because you've got a lot of horsepower under your right foot. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, you can just feel it wearing off at, by the end of the race. We were pretty, we didn't really see it too much because we had so many red flags. Yeah. As well as the yellow safety cars and stuff, so we didn't see as much. But definitely you can... I don't want to. I don't want to give away any strategy. But are you uh, going to take on a new set for race two tomorrow morning? We'll see. We'll see. Huh? We'll see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a it's a closely guarded secret for, uh, for a lot. <laughs> I, of I'm not even sure. Yeah, <laughs> Haven't exactly. talked about tomorrow. Yeah, We're that, in the present yeah. right now. Well, once you look at the data, you might but they, they might make a different judgment. Yeah, for yeah, sure. for sure. It will be cold tomorrow morning. So. Yeah, yeah. Definitely cooler than it is this morning. There's the 95 of Brad Majman, one of your teammates on the from the Crosslink Kiwi stable. Brad currently holding on to fifth spot. He finished in fifth in this morning's race as well. Brad really in his first experience in a full-size race car. With his uh, all of his karting experience in his native Australia, as well as making his way to the U.S. for the Super Nats on multiple occasions. But he is a little deeper in the field than he would like to be, for sure. But... It's a learning experience. After this first day of racing, they'll be 
some opportunity to debrief. That's another thing that you don't do in go-karting that you do in these kind of cars. You've got data traces to look at. And so you and your team can uh, do some research. And with a, a team as big and as, uh, as well-funded as Crosslink Kiwi, you've got a lot of different drivers to compare your, uh, your data traces with. And you learn some things, I assume. Oh, yeah, for sure. I used to be on a team that was pretty small compared to, like, Kiwi. And Crosslink, like... It's helped so much having like the fastest guys on your team, right? So you can see their data, their video. It is so open and it's definitely like cool to talk as well to all the drivers. Sure, yeah, an opportunity for you to learn some things. As you've got some, some folks on your team that have won championships or finished in yeah. the top three of championships, Ryan Sheehan immediately comes to mind. So uh, the 83, uh, Christopher Parrish, currently running in the eighth spot for the IGY 16, his teammate Hayden Bowlesby was my co-commentator for the first race of the weekend. Christopher had a pretty good run in uh, the first race, finished in fourth spot. He's a little deeper in the pack this time, running eighth as they're trying to find the, uh, the, the secret to getting that car a little bit quicker as he is well off the back of Jacob Lauder uh, running in seventh. Lauder about eight seconds behind Drew Such, who's about 12 seconds behind Brad Modgeman, who's about eight seconds behind Teddy Masella. So the top four really are the cream of the crop in this race, at least, with uh, Alan Eo, the leader, Maite Casaras in second, who just set fast lap of the race, Bacon Zelenka and Teddy Musella. They've, they've uh, really put some distance on the rest of the field. Brad Modgeman in the 95, not able to match their pace. As you can see, the field pretty well strung out here. And that's kind of unusual. Normally in, in these F4 races, we see them much, much closer. But again, the, the warm conditions here and the tire wear on this uh, second session on this set of tires for most of the drivers, definitely a factor in keeping the race close. There's the 72 of Jacob Lauter. We talked about Jacob briefly. He's from Edmond, Oklahoma, 20 years old. And he's the teammate of Christopher Parrish on the IGY 16. The local team based in Folsom, Louisiana. Back to the 72 of Jacob Lauter running by himself pretty much in seventh spot. As the leaders flashing by our vantage point here, completing race lap number 11. There goes Lauter across the stripe to compete, complete that 11th lap, but he's 39 seconds behind the race leader. So Jacob's going to do a little soul searching, I'm sure, and see if he can find a little more pace for the finale tomorrow. As there are three races each weekend for both the classes for the Formula Regional Americas. We only did one FR race today. We'll do the final two tomorrow. These drivers have had this now their second of the three races of the weekend. So they've only got one more to go. So I, I would guess, based on how the field is stretching out, it's differences in tire strategy and tire preservation that's, uh, that's making this field a little less compact than it was in the first race this morning. Yeah, definitely. What goals do you have, uh, Nicole? I mean, uh, everybody wants to be in Formula One or in IndyCar or whatever. Uh, do you have a, a little broader spectrum? Are you looking at sports cars? Where would you like to go if, if your dream could come true? Well, I'm so open to, like, any opportunities that come around, right? If it's GT cars, of course. Um, currently, right now, I'm just staying in open wheels because of my age. Sure. Just trying to, you know, use it. Um, I can always go to sports cars in the future. Sure. Um, definitely Formula One would yeah, be yeah. amazing. Wouldn't that be sweet? Uh, just trying to figure out some stuff, you know. Definitely sponsors are one big thing. Yep, yep. Um, just, yeah, just honestly just working towards those goals. Exactly. And you've already raced internationally in India, obviously. So you're you're uh, setting the uh, setting the the groundwork to make that uh, that dream possibly come true. So uh, keep our fingers crossed and we yeah. can make that happen. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of which, there's Maite Casaras, the Uruguayan. And she is not letting Kekai Hawaniyo get away. She's only a second and two tenths behind him, and we're down to about five minutes to go. And on the last lap, she was about two tenths quicker than Kekai, so let's keep an eye on Maite to see if she's got a charge here, but she's on her way to perhaps her second, second place finish in a row here, but if Kekai has even a little bit of a stumble, she's going to be right there. They've opened up a gap of almost three seconds back to Bacon Zelenka. Bacon's not even in the same camera shot. There's Bacon's car in the uh, number 45. That bright green livery is 
easily easy to pick out in this field. He's the only one with that livery. I don't know how well you've gotten to know Bacon, but he is uh, he's quite the character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of he's course. got a really dry yeah. sense of humor and yeah. uh, he's he's a he's a fun guy. I really yeah. enjoy spending some time with him. Yeah, yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. It's cool to have such good teammates, right? And he's probably the only person you know that has a pet pig. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the only person. Definitely for me, he's the only one I know. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's look at this battle for second here, or for the for the lead here. Maite has set the fast lap of the race, and I think she's got uh, she's got a chance here. Uh, Maite, of course, did you know the great thing with the F1 Academy last year. So racing on an inter international scale in an F4 car, uh, you know, the W Series went belly up. And so the Formula One Academy, a great opportunity for female drivers to get themselves into the international eye. And Maite had that experience a year ago. And that racecraft is, is uh, definitely put her in good stead. She is in the, in the hunt for the lead here. Is Kekai may have uh, been a little over exuberant at the beginning of the race, built up a big lead, and now those tires are starting to feel a little hurt. And Maite maybe did a little better job of managing them. And she's going to make this a battle right down to the wire with three minutes remaining. Coming into the S's now. A little slower for the first two, and then it gets faster and faster as you go a little deeper into the race. Especially in the FR car, I'm sure that's a, a real balancing act because you're not you're not able to go flat through there for sure. Oh no! Maite use it up all the racetrack right out to the edge of the curb, straightening it out as much as possible as they come into the final turn on the racetrack. Just a couple laps to go. I would guess we'll see the white flag not this time, but next time by. As it looks like we've got about two and a half minutes left, she has got a shot at the victory here. Kekai is going to be checking his mirrors as they come down toward turn one. Watch that helmet. There he goes. He's looking. Don't block. You can't move in response as Maite is going to try to go around the outside. That'll set her up for a run to turn two. She gets a little squirrely. She's pulled the trigger here. Maite into the lead. Well done, young lady. Heading down toward turn three. Kekai is not going to give it up easily. He's going to try to stay on the outside here at turn three, which will give him a shot for the inside line at turn four. Maite having to be just a tad defensive. That gives Kekai a good run. Here they go into four. But Maite doing a great job, well judged for the Uruguayan young lady. And she makes her way into turn five. Three in turn number six. As we're gonna get a retake, uh, a replay of this pass. As Kekai kind of threw a block, but he was sportsmanship, uh, good, shows good sportsmanship. And Maite just said, thank you very much. I'll take that line that you've offered me. And now that she's gotten by him, I think Kekai is going to have his hands full because he sort of faded into that situation. The tires, I'm guessing, going away on that car. Maite had a little more under her as they come into this final lap. Looking at the starter stand, we expect we'll see the white flag this time by. We haven't heard seen that signal just yet but they are making their way onto the final turn and there is the white flag one lap to go and off the course went Maite Casaras I believe did she spin off at turn 15 she just went straight yeah there she is. oh my goodness counting her chickens Whoa. before they hatched perhaps Whoa. as Maite oh what a disappointment I think she's still going to stay in second spot no, or no, Masella got by her. Oh, what a heartbreak for Maite. Looked to be on her way, perhaps, to a victory. She just had to keep it together for one more lap. But unfortunately, down there at turn 15 and 16, a little too much pace, and the car got away from her. But she's been able to get back on track. She'll still salvage a podium finish out of this. But, oh, just got to show you, you've got to complete all the laps. Yeah, you, you can make a mistake. You, you can make a mistake on the last lap, and it and cost you the race. So Kekai has some breathing room now. Let's go a little deeper in the field. The battle now between Brad Moshman and Bacon Zelenka. Another situation. Bacon was right up there in the thick of it, and he's dropped back a spot with Brad Moshman taking over that fourth place just a lap ago. Now Bacon's going to try to get it back as they go to the inside there at turn four. So Bacon now on the run down to turn five. Brad Moshman going to try to square him up. And just behind them is Drew Such. 
but Bacon Zelenka looking to get himself back into a podium position perhaps. I think a podium's pretty much out of the question, but a fourth place finish very much in his offering. There's Jacob Lauter just behind him, Christopher Parrish behind Bacon, Drew Such and Jacob Lauter with Christopher Parrish at the tail end of that. But the checkered flag is in the air for Keikai Hawaneo. Started outside of row one, took the lead early, and has not been challenged until the next to the last lap when he had to give up that lead to Maite Kazaras, and then she made a mistake on the final turn, and Keikai Hawaneo takes his first win of the season. Across the line in second, Teddy Busella for his second podium of the day. And here comes Maite Kazaras, salvaged a third place finish. She'll learn from that. That's a mistake she won't make again. That's how you learn. You you know, uh, any race car is driving it on the limit, and the only way to find that limit is to exceed it. And uh, she found the limit a little bit too late, unfortunately, but a great job nonetheless. Congratulations to her for notching a podium. Bacon Zelenka holds off the challenge for Brad Modgman and finishes in fourth spot. Modgman comes across the line in fifth. Drew Such has not yet crossed the stripe, so we'll withhold judgment to make sure that he's able to hold on for that sixth place finish. There's a good look at Maite Casaras. I'll be interested to talk to her on the podium and see what she has to say about that little miscue. There's Drew Such across the line. He does indeed finish in the sixth spot. Jacob Lauter finishes in seventh, waiting on Christopher Parrish to make his way to the line. We'll get all the points payers across the stripe before we head down to the podium. As we follow Maite Casaras around on her cool down lap. I'm going to make my way down to the podium. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us in the commentary booth. You do a great job. If you decide to give up racing, you'll do a great job in the commentary booth. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being with us. I'm going to turn it over to uh, DJ or, or Ben or both uh, as I make my way down to the podium to uh, interview our winner. So race number two of the weekend for the first weekend of the Ligier JSF4 series is in the books. I'll talk to you at the podium. Well, we join back in the action as John makes his way down to podium ceremonies. DJ Clark and Ben Sissel back up here in the booth. And Ben, we were just talking. I mean, that was an absolutely fantastic end of the race. Yeah, here come the results with our new Liget JSF4. Take it away. Kike Haruno, uh, Harunio able to take that win there over Teddy Masella. Then Mate Karaksis uh, in P3. Bacon Zelenka in P4. Brad Mamjan in P5. As we continue to look down through that order, that IGY6 Motorsport team, Jacob Lauder and Christopher Parrish in 7th and 8th. Pablo Benedis in 9th. Parker Wallen in P10, multiple laps down there at that point. Drew Such, by the way, in six plates for Such Racing. A great day uh, for Crosslink Kiwi Motorsports, taking three of the top five positions. IGY Motors, IGY6 Motorsports in there as well. It's plenty of good racing action. We obviously saw that a uh, little bit of a mistake there from Mate that uh, sent her off. As you heard John preview and say, going to be interested to talk to her on the podium. I wonder if that was just... A little bit of a lapse in error, a little bit of a lapse in judgment, or if something happened there at that point. But uh, clearly, some great talent coming through up that's, here. That's what the series is about. The yep. Liget JSF4 is a driver development ladder series. So I'm sure uh, she is going to remember that for the rest of her life. And yeah. We'll talk about that. And when she does driver instruction and when she's racing, she's going to remember that and learn from that. And that's what this is all about. Yeah, exactly. This is a series that is meant to promote those kind of mistakes so that you can learn from them, so that you're able to build your way up and be a better driver. And indeed, the chassis here, less downforce, less aerodynamics to make it harder to drive and to, frankly, punish little mistakes like that so that you have to learn from them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's my whole life is... Uh Anything I ever learned was from basically a life lesson or a mistake. You know, yeah. you don't learn from the good things. So that was awesome. And what a great race. Great day. Great start to this new Liget JSF4. Thank you to NOLA Motorsports Park and the NOLA Speed Tour. We had a lot of great fans out here. 
great weather, as you can see from these drone shots, looking over basically the bayou and, uh, you know, in the Mississippi River in New Orleans. But what a fun day. But we are back tomorrow. We are indeed back tomorrow as we are getting ready to throw down to John on the podium. Thanks, Ben. We've got the winner here, Keikai Hawaneo. Keikai, it looked like the tires were going away a little bit at the end, and Maite got you, but then she made a mistake in the final turn. Yeah, she got up to me, but uh, we're going to make some setup changes because a little off, but uh, we'll come back tomorrow and hopefully get the win. Say, uh, certainly a better result than you had in the first race this morning. you got to be pleased with it. Yeah, first race was <laughs> not to our liking, but uh, we got it done here in the second one. Congratulations, your first win in the season. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Kai Hawaneo, your winner, ladies and gentlemen. Let's head up back up to the booths to wrap it up. All right. Well, there is your interview with the winner here at this point, and that will indeed conclude all of our coverage here today. But make sure to join us tomorrow. We'll be back with more racing action from SVRA, from FR, and from Trans Am. Hungry for SVRA action? Well, the best way to enjoy classic auto racing is with a delicious classic from Mission Foods. Green flag your race-watching snacks with Mission's mouth-watering race day recipes. Try some of our tasty tacos, piled high nachos, fresh chips with guac, and more. So gear up your ride and fuel up those stomachs with delicious Mission Foods. Now that's too fast, too tasty.